Hello and welcome to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Jeff Dean, the head
Nice. I love, I love the first person that clapped. Where are you? High five. A round of applause for this man up here. Started the clap for the presenter. I like it. Hey, everybody. Welcome to day three of Google I.O. Yeah? We feeling it? Everyone properly caffeinated today? No. OK, good. Good to know where we're starting off as a team here, all together. So I got to tell you, uh, they came, when we uh, actually got this talk agreed upon, they came to me. And they said, all right, you know, we love the title of your talk, GCP on a shoestring budget. We love the narrative that you're trying to bring, helping developers save on money. When do you want to give the talk? And I had one answer. I said, day three, 8.30 in the morning. No other possible opportunity there. And you want to know why? Because the people who are willing to go through two days of standing in the sun and wake up at 6 a.m. to stand in the security line to get in the seats by 8.30, they care about saving money on Google Cloud Platform, right? Yeah, exactly. So thank you for being here. Now, when we get a chance to talk to a lot of developers around the world, I find that there's generally two buckets of people or two buckets of companies that uh, companies fall into when you're talking about saving costs. The first one is your large companies with established code bases. They may have uh, expected workloads that come through Google Cloud, but the predominant conversations we have are, hey, you know, if you make this change and this change, you can save a lot of money. And their response is always along the lines of, well, how much would that cost to implement? We've got this legacy code base. You know, Bill over here really is attached to that API. We really don't want to get rid of that. Basically, any conversations we have with these individuals, they always have an opportunity cost trade-off that they have to make in their head before they're willing to actually make the changes to save the money. Right? On the other side, though, are the hustlers. The rise and grind, right? The startups, the people live in customer to customer every single day, trying to get those costs as low as possible because they know that that's the key to keeping their business afloat right now. And those are the people, hopefully, that wake up so early after two days of sunscreen and dehydration to come to this sort of talk. And that's who we're talking about today, all right? Now, Google Cloud Platform is huge. We have a ton of different products. And quite frankly, the 40 minutes that they've given me here, we don't have enough time to go through all of them. So today, we're going to focus on three main things. Number one, we're going to lay some foundation on uh, the network and show you how to save a little bit of cost there, just to kind of ease everyone into what we're talking about. Then we're going to talk about some ways to save costs on compute. And then we're going to go through a couple scenarios that hopefully some of you fall into and you'll have a little bit better time attaching to your business model. But the most important thing you need to know is that nothing I'm talking about today is secret. Like, none of this requires a handshake or the right Google badge to get this information about how to optimize this stuff. Every piece of data you're seeing today is available for you to go get right now, either using the Google Cloud Platform pricing calculator or looking at the pricing pages for the individual products. Like, this is it. Like, again, it's not an Illuminati style thing here. Like, you can go run the same analysis on everything you're doing on your own. So let's get started. Um, serving data. This is, this is where we're going to start today. Let's figure out what does it cost to serve one terabyte of data from Google Cloud Storage to your users, right? Just bare, bare minimum discussion here, right? Let's just talk about serving data. Now, when you think about this, you have two components involved. First off is storage, where you're storing your data. And second off is your network costs for actually transferring the data. Now, the costs for these are uh, dependent upon usage. So for example, uh, Google Cloud Storage, what you pay is a function of where you're hosting your data alongside of how much you're hosting it. So for example, if you're actually hosting your data in US Central 1 region, you're paying about 2 cents per gig to actually store your data. However, if you move to US East, that changes. And if you're using a multi-region bucket, then that changes as well. On the networking side, it's a tiered cost structure. So if you're under 1 terabyte, you pay a different price than if you're in the next tier of 1 terabyte to 10 terabytes and 10 terabytes up. And then this also changes per region as well. So for example, if you're transferring uh, data from the Iowa location, which is US Central 1, and you're in the first tier of under one terabyte, you're paying about 12 cents a gig. Okay? Now with this in mind, though, we have to point out something. And again, this is not secret. This is widely known, is that there's a whole tier of usage on Google Cloud that's absolutely free, that you get every single month, that you can just use this stuff. No one cares about it. You're not going to get charged for it. right? And this is, uh, it, it ranges from all, mostly all of our products. But most specifically for our case right now, we're worried about what is the free tier for network and storage. On the storage side, we actually get five gigabytes of storage for free each month, each region. So if you've got five gigs in US East and five gigs in US West, each one of those is free. right? 
On the network side, we get about one gigabyte of egress, which is outbound data traffic from uh, Amer North American locations to other, other destinations. And by the way, there's, you will see many uh, caveats of little stars during this, and you'll also see a lot of little labels that says the price of today. Right? This is the cloud. Prices change. <laughs> and uh, if you discover this video in the future, you will undoubtedly find that there's a discrepancy in the prices. So please make sure you check out the documentation for the latest. So this is our free tier. Let's talk about egress cost then. So one terabyte of data that we want to send. So what would this cost us? So to store it, we get about one terabyte of data storing in US Central Run. Uh, that's uh, 1024 gigs minus our five gig free tier at two cents per gig, about 20 bucks a month, just to store the data at rest. Not too bad. On the network side, though, things get a little bit trickier. So we've got our one terabyte of data minus the gig in the free tier at 12 cents per gig, about $122 a month for a total about of $143. So storing the data, transferring a terabyte of data, about $143, which isn't too bad, I don't think. But the truth is that most of you actually don't send your users directly to your cloud storage bucket. Chances are you have some proxy, some front end that they're hitting first, if you're a website or something else, that this data is being routed through. So let's take a look at what that costs. Basically the same. So as long as you're transferring information in the same region between a cloud storage bucket and a proxy or a compute engine instance, uh, it's free. You don't have to worry about that as long as it's in the same region. And then your egress rates are still the same if they're coming from Compute Engine or from cloud storage. So basically, if you're transferring all your data through a proxy, you're paying the same exact price as you would if it was going from cloud storage directly. The only difference is that you're now actually paying for the Compute Engine instance running there, or the, uh, compute function, uh, the Cloud Functions instance or the App Engine instance. So basically, as long as you're using a proxy, the basic serving costs don't change. But uh, let's look at this from a different way. When we serve data to people, especially through cloud storage, one of the things we care about is locality and latency. So we want to get our data as close to our users as possible. But we also want to do it as cheaply as possible. right? So let's take a look at that scenario. So let's say uh, we're serving our data here. We've got it in uh, US West 1. And we want to serve it to a user in US East 1. So we're going across the continental US. right? Uh, price here is still the same, $143. Doesn't matter where the user is coming from. We still have the same cost at rest and the same egress costs. But we want to get that data closer to the user. So what if we actually cloned that data in US East 1 and got it closer to the user? Well, of course, at this point, our egress is still 12 cents. No change there. In cloud storage itself, we're now duplicating the data between two buckets. So of course, we're paying that extra two cents a gig to copy it into this other location. So we're doubling our cost for storage. And we also have this extra one cent per gig transfer cost between them, because we're moving our data between regions. So now we actually have a cost that's incurred with that. So to actually clone this data between regions, we're actually looking at $173. Not ideal, but it gets our data a little bit closer. But truth is, we might be thinking about this the wrong way. So we do have these things in Google Cloud Storage. We have regional buckets and multi-regional buckets. And what multi-regional buckets do is effectively duplicate your data between regions in an area so that you don't have to do this cloning by yourself. The trick, though, is that multi-regional buckets cost a little bit more. So let's take a look at that. So if we want to go from cloud storage right to our users, our egress rate from a cloud storage multi-regional bucket, by the way, there's going to be lots of weird acronyms and terminology in this talk. <laughs> it's labeled intermediate, so hopefully we're all moving together. Uh, 12 cents per gig egress. However, we're paying 2.6 cents per gig to store in a multi-regional bucket, which puts us at about $26 a month for that storage instead of what we were paying for the single region. We're at about 149 there, so not too much cost change. But the difference here is that when a user in US East 1 actually asks for this asset, Google handles the duplication of getting that data closer to the user on your behalf, and you don't have to clone it yourself. So we basically just saved an extra $30 by using a multi-regional bucket per month instead of actually cloning it ourselves. OK, sounds good. So we've actually reduced our cost inside the regional US. But what if we want to go international? So we want to serve this data to someone in Europe, right? Well, let's take a look at cloning there as well. So again, we have uh, our clone data in a US multi-region and an EU multi-region. So obviously, we're duplicating our costs. We have the same amount of cost egress for uh, US, uh, the EU multi-region, which is selected for these numbers. However, now because we're transferring data between multi-regions in different areas, we're actually at 12 cents per gig transfer. So we actually get a little bit pricier there. 286 is the result of this. So if you're trying to get your data to users in a different area using the multi-region, it's actually really expensive. But let's rethink this here. So the goal, again, we're shoestring, right? We want to make this as cheap as possible. We want to get a data from the cheapest bucket we can store in to the farthest away user as fast as possible, as cheap as possible. We already have this. It's called the CDN, right? We've all been working with these. 
So let's figure out what the cost is of that. So we've got our standard regional cloud storage in, US West, in EU West at about two cents a gig. Now, for CDNs, there's two costs you need to be aware of. We have a fill cost and an egress cost. To fill data into the cache, you're looking at about four cents per gig to get it into the CDN. And that's worldwide. Doesn't matter where you're going. So if you have data here and someone in Nairobi asks for your asset, it's four cents per gig to cache it. It's to, to the closest point of presence that Google has there. Now, egress from the CDN is only eight cents per gig. So when you combine these two together, four cents and eight cents, you actually end up at about 12 cents per gig, which is your standard outbound egress rate. However, this is assuming a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you're actually pushing a terabyte of fill and serving that same terabyte, you're going to end up at about $143 to get that asset as close to every user in the world without you lifting a finger except making sure your cache headers are turned on properly. But in reality, this isn't how things work out, right? Typically, the amount of cache fill versus cache serve are quite different. So if you're actually in an 80-20 split here, where 20% of your data is filled into the cache, and 80% uh, is actually served out, you actually only end up closer to about $91. So as long as that ratio is on the serving side instead of the filling side, you're going to have a lot cheaper representation and setup. You're going to get closer to that shoestring value you want. So in general here, if we're looking to serve a terabyte of data, the cheapest thing we can do to get it to users across the world as fast as possible is simply to set your caching headers. Any other tricks or any other smartness that you're trying to do is going to blow that up. Right? It's going to make things more expensive. So find the cheapest bucket that's as close to you as you can tolerate, put your data in that, and then turn on the CDN and let Google's point of presence network handle the rest of it. All right, let's talk about compute. So uh, Google Cloud Platform has a lot of compute offerings, but today we're only going to talk about three of them. Uh, first off is Google Compute Engine, which is our standard VMs that run in the cloud. Second is, of course, is Google Cloud Functions, which are our invocation-based compute resources. And third, of course, is Google App Engine, which is both managed and invocation-based. And for the sake of this talk, I'm going to ignore things like Google, Google Kubernetes Engine and uh, GAE Flex, because these actually tend to price themselves closer to what uh, GCE is. But uh, for the sake of this 40-minute talk, we don't have to go into all the nuances. It's a little bit weird. So I'm just going to ignore those. We're going to focus on these three offerings for right now. So by cost, of course, GCE is variable on config. Depending on what configuration you're using is how much you're going to pay. Right? The beefier the machine that you're using and the configuration, the more you're going to have to pay there. Cloud Functions, though, is a little bit different. Uh, Cloud Functions is about 40 cents per million calls that you make to it. And then there's also an additional cost you have to be concerned with is what we call gigabyte second and gigahertz second. And if you check out the documentation, there's a little bit, break a little bit better breakdown here. Um, I'm not going to get a chance to go through it today. And of course, App Engine is going to be 0.5 uh, cents to 30 cents per instance hour, depending on your config. So this is the default cost that you have here. Now, on the other side, we have our free tiers, though, right? Now, here's, the, here's where things get really cool. In Compute Engine, if you're using an F1 micro configuration, it's free the whole month. No cost to you. Free, in free instance sitting in the cloud, doing your bidding as much as you'd like it, all free. On GCF, you got about 2 million invocations a month, or 400,000 gigabyte seconds and 200,000 gigahertz seconds. Right? And on App Engines, you have 28 instance hours a day for an F1 instance, and about nine, hour, nine instance hours a day for a B1 instance. Right? And I know, there's not, I know there's, more than 20, uh, there's less than 28 hours in a day, so that gives you a little bit of wiggle room in case your extra instance spins up in an F1. So but basically here, when you look at GCE F1 Micro and GAE, uh, F1, you kind of get free compute as long as you're under a certain strata of usage, right? With this in mind, let's take a look at an always-on cost. So let's say you want to run a box 24-7 for an entire month. What does that cost you? So uh, you know, months have different days, and we always have leap year and stuff like that. So I'm just going to assume 730 hours of consistent runtime. What we end up with, if we're using an F1 micro, it's free the whole month. Don't have to pay a thing. However, when you bump up to an N1 standard one because you want a little bit more performance, you start paying $24 a month and $194 a month for an eight core machine. Right? This is all on the, the cloud pricing page. You can see all of this. And by the way, this is after a 30% sustained usage discount, which I'll get to in a second. Cloud functions, though, we can't really compare apples to apples. Because it's an invocation-based system, we can't just say consistently running. So what I've done here is I'm making the assumption that you're getting one invocation to your cloud functions service every second for the entire month. So you've got about 2.6 million invocations a month that's going on there. That lets us kind of simulate what an always-on cost would be. For this, it's about $3.51. 
to basically have a GCF function running every second for an entire month. On App Engine, you end up, of course, in the F1 config. It's free. You don't have to change anything there. However, if that second uh, F1 instance actually spins up, you get a little spike in your workload, or you know, all of a sudden you, you're the top of hacker news for some reason, uh, you're going to pay $36 for that second instance to come on board. Uh, of course, when you move up to an F2 or an F4, which again are beefier machines, you get the $73 and the $146. So basically, across the board here, you can see that uh, in GCE and GAE, as you get a stronger machine, of course, the costs go up, while GCF is still pretty instance-based. Now, uh, here's the interesting thing. So those, those are our basic costs. So obviously, Compute Engine is the most versatile thing we have, right? It can run whatever code you want, whatever instance you want, your images and all this other stuff. But the problem is it's also the most expensive for what you're using. So it would be really cool if we could figure out how to make that as cost effective as our other services uh, without having some of the same limitations, right? So for example, if we just wanted to run our code on GCF, we have a problem is that each function invocation has a nine minute timeout, right? So you can't actually get anything for more than nine minutes. On the other side, on App Engine, you have a 60 second timeout on requests, but if you push that off to a task later, you end up with the same nine minute timeout. So our goal here is to figure out how to make GCE as cheap as our other alternatives. And the good news is we can do this. First off, let's take a look at the GCE discounts. Now, these are the things that you really don't have to lift any fingers to do to actually turn this stuff on. So first off is sustained use. So what we'll do on Google Cloud Platform is analyze your usage. And if you have a sustained usage, so you're always on for a certain amount of time, we'll give you a default discount for just running your instance with consistency across the entire month. If you're willing to make a phone call to our sales team and can actually commit to usage, specific usage, and say, I'm going to run you know, at least you know, 2,000 hours this month or 730 hours this month. You know, it doesn't matter what configuration you're using and you don't have any pre-definition of specific uh, upfront fees or whatever, uh, you can actually get up to a 56% discount by just making a phone call to talk to sales. So if you're a startup and you're starting to see a little bit more usage and you need that dedicated resource and you know you're going to at least have one or two instances running at a dedicated fashion, making that phone call and getting that 56% savings is actually pretty huge. And of course, right-sizing. So what will happen is Google Cloud Platform will actually analyze the usage of your GC instances and look at how you're using them and actually tell you whether or not you're over-provisioned or under-provisioned. And you'll see a little icon appear on the home page that will say, hey, if you click here, we'll reconfigure this for you and save you money every month. Likewise, it'll say, hey, you're using this pretty hard. If you click here, we'll beef up your machine so that your users get lower latency. Right? So it's a fun little button that you can just click. The deployment happens behind the scenes. You don't have to do anything. So this is, this is kind of automatic stuff. However, something that's a little bit uh, more drastic in terms of saving that does require a little bit of work on your part is something called preemptive. Now, what preemptive VMs are means that the scheduler is allowed to kill your instance when we need the resources in Google Cloud. Now, that may sound really scary, but here's the fun part. It'll actually alert your instance before, it about to, before it's about to get killed. So it'll send you a message, and your instance will say, hey, I'm about to terminate you. You've got roughly about 30 seconds to back up any data to some persistent resource. And then once it kills your instance, it'll start your instance back up later, and then you can then go fetch that data and continue working on. Right? So if you allow us to kill your instance when we need the time, we actually give you a substantial discount. If you're running an N1 standard that's preemptive, instead of paying the $24 a month, you get a 3x discount down to about $7 a month. For the same instance, and all you do is have to write the code so that you can lay over those sorts of uh, terminations after time. And the cool thing is that you can actually put a load balancer in front of that. So if you need scalable compute and you need the ability to allow these things to die, right? but because you've got so much load coming in, you know, one of them going down means another one might have to spin up, putting a load balancer in front of your preemptive instances, since load balancing is free, again, means you're only paying about $7 a month per instance that you're actually running. Of course, we can get this a little bit cheaper, in fact, if we actually use a micro instance there instead. We can actually get it down to $2.96 per month using an F1 micro. But because of the fact that we have our load balancer and because of the fact that we've re-engineered our code to make sure that it can be uh, fault tolerant when it's killed, we actually have a massively scalable compute resource that can handle itself getting kicked over. So if you've got large amounts of workloads or individual things, you're processing lots of individual files where you know, something can pick up processing 50% where something else left off, this is an extremely cheap solution for you, probably as cheap as I was actually able to find in my research. 
So in general, if you want to reduce your compute costs, you've got a couple things you need to do. First off is distribute workloads that are based on um, invocations to either App Engine or Cloud Functions. Those are going to be the cheapest situations where you can put your code and have them run. If you need something long running, then leave it back on Compute Engine. But otherwise, try to push as much as you can to those resources. That's going to be the cheapest you can get. Likewise, make sure that you're making that phone call to sales. <laughs> Let them know that you're willing to commit to a, a sustained use and get that discount, because that's going to be huge for the work jobs that you actually need running consistently on Compute Engine. And likewise, if you have scalable needs, a load balancer plus a micro uh, preemptive instance is pretty much the highest flexibility, lowest cost scenario you can be in. You know, having a, a bunch of little spiders doing your work for you at scale is just as effective as having one behemoth doing it uh, for a higher price, right? All right, so uh, those are our basics here. So we've kind of laid the groundwork for how we're going to evaluate these things and look at the big picture between network and compute. Now let's talk about some scenarios. Um, personal privacy matters online, right? We all kind of care about that, especially when we're logging into public Wi-Fi and whatnot. Um, but sometimes I don't like paying a subscription to some other service to, you know, to handle a VPN service. So how cheap can we build our own personal VPN service on Google Cloud? Now, to be clear here, uh, I know that personal security online is a very uh, hectic area right now, and there's lots of back and forth. So to be very clear, I'm not going to talk today about why you need a VPN. Um, I'm not going to debate the different software and libraries you can use or having your own VPN ver versus being part of a cluster. I'm basically not going to talk about anything that PR or legal would raise an eyebrow about. Okay? But I am going to talk about how you could run your own VPN on Google Cloud for as cheap as possible. All right? Uh, so with this, we have two components, compute and network. Pretty easy. How a VPN generally works is you have your client that connects to some uh, compute engine instance that's running your VPN. There's a socket connection between the two. They're exchanging encrypted data. And then the uh, compute engine instance or the proxy will actually go out into the fantastic internet and do all your fetching for you, return that data back to your computer. And this is a high-level approximation. If there's any security engineers in the room, I, I apologize for generalizing that to a point that I can fit on the slide. So let's look at the free tier here. How cheap could we make this? Uh, well, if we use our instance as an F1 micro, then we know we can get that for free. Uh, and as long as our usage is about less than one gig, we know that we can basically get that for free as well, right? So if we're using an F1 micro and our usage is less than one gig, we can get a VPN that we can use whenever we want for free every single month using Google Cloud Platform. And, if you, go, and you only start to pay when you go over that free gig. So if you're just using this to log on to uh, Wi-Fi hotspots when you're traveling around the world, you basically get this entire thing for free. No big deal. But here's one of the problems is, is that if you're using a preemptive version of that, you have a problem that you need to know where to connect to. And every time you reboot that VM, you have a new IP. Good news is, on Google Cloud Platform, you can actually reserve a static IP address. And as long as it's assigned and being used, it's free for you. So you can go in, create your instance, let it run, get a static reserved IP address that you can use from your personal devices that stick around waiting for you, and you don't pay anything. Right? So again, we can run a personal VPN with a static IP for nothing each, each month. And again, if you eclipse the one gig free tier, that's when you actually start paying. But let's talk about two specific scenarios here. What if you want better bandwidth? So what if you're traveling and you actually want this VPN because you need to stream some video from some different location, right? Um, well, the important thing you need to understand is that the throughput for a GCE instance changes based upon the core count. It's actually capped at the core count. So the more cores you have, you can see here that, uh, that on, the, uh, on the side there, we're at our 64 and 32 cores. The more cores you have, the higher your TCP throughput. And this is where a lot of people get caught up when they're trying to increase their bandwidth for their VPNs, right? Because you'll notice that the, if moving up from the F1 micro, the next available option is the F1 small, which you would want to use because that's going to be one of the cheapest. However, you notice because the number of core count is the same, we actually don't get any better bandwidth by moving to there, even though it's only $14 a month. Moving on to the next one, the, the actual uh, first stage you get where you actually get some bandwidth increase is actually the N1 standard. So unfortunately, if you're moving up and trying to get better bandwidth to even get it there, you have to start paying $24 a month for your VPN instance. Unless, of course, it's preemptive, in which case you get it down to $7 a month. But then you have to deal with what happens when you're in the middle of a session and your, uh, your VPN decides to die. Yeah. 
Uh, so let's talk about something I deal with a lot, um, traveling, right? So a lot of us are international nomads. We spend a lot of time traveling around, going to conferences, talking to customers and whatnot. It'd be really nice if we had our VPN follow us, because if we boot up a VPN in US Central 1, and yet we're in Malaysia, you know, we don't want to wait for our packet to go all the way to the US and then come back to us, because that's just going to make our experience bad. So I actually put together a, a little um, hack for this that I wanted to share with everybody. So it turns out that you can actually run a the Google Compute Engine and APIs from Google Cloud Functions. So I actually wrote a little web uh, location that I host that when I load it while I'm traveling, it'll figure out what my location is. And in Google Cloud Functions, it'll figure out what the closest zone is that I can run an F1 instance. It'll kill whatever the previous VPN instance I have is and actually create a brand new instance as close to me as possible. So as I'm traveling, I can basically just click a single button kill the old VM, and create the new VM as close to me as possible, no matter where I am in the world. Again, for free, because then I'm not doing more than 2 million invocations of cloud functions per month. So this is really nice. So if you want to get the people in your family using your VPN and maybe charge them $10 a month, <laughs> this might be a nice little racket to play at Thanksgiving. All right. Uh, so let's talk about something a little bit closer to home for a lot of you, is a WordPress site. Right? Anyone WordPress experts in here? A couple people? Still no caffeine in the house. I like that. I like that. We're closer to 9 a.m. now, and everyone's still sleeping. This is good. Uh, so WordPress is, is a large and unwieldy beast, right? There's lots of different components involved and lots of different ways you can take this. So when you actually Google for WordPress Google Cloud Platform, the first thing you're actually introduced to is a page for our Google Cloud Launcher with all of these pre-configured operations that allow you to one-click deploy a WordPress instance to your Google Cloud account and just get up and start moving. Right? So you can click any of these, and they have a bunch of different configurations of how you want it all set up. However, the default setup for this is actually less than ideal from an expense perspective. Right? So these are all going to be set up with an N1 standard one, which is $24 a month. And of course, you're still paying that $0.12 cents outbound egress from there. Right? So this is putting us in something we've seen before. But let's talk about uh, complexity here. So what if you're using the simplest uh, WordPress site possible? Well, obviously, you don't need, and you're only using a single instance. right? because you don't have uh, that, number, you know, that many number of users. Well, you can actually use the F1 Micro for this instead, which is free per month. And again, if you're under one gigabyte of outbound egress, you can actually get that for free as well. So if you're a brand new startup, right, and your friends are all like, hey, go sign up for this website over here. You know, it's $10 a month to host your WordPress site. And you're still living on ramen, right, out of the VC uh, incubator, along with 40 other people. Um, this actually saves you that $10 a month to buy more ramen. Yay. But the question that we have then is, this but is the concept that uh, we're free as long as we're under the free tier. And this is something I've been harping on for a while is, what is the cost before we eclipse that? Right? So if we assume that we've got network of one gigabyte free, and our default WordPress site that you deploy on App Engine is about 272K per visitor, it means you can get roughly about 3,800 visitors a month before you eclipse that bandwidth and actually have to start paying. And this is a really important number for startups, for, for the uh, hustle and flow type people, right? knowing how many visitors you can actually take before you have to start paying money, and where you want to start optimizing all of that data. And of course, we could go into a massive diatribe about how to properly optimize your images and compress your headers and serve all that data. That's a different talk. Right now, we're just talking about the fundamentals. Okay? So right here, we basically say, if we're under roughly about 4,000 users a month, we should be OK and always in the free tier. Right? And of course, if you turn on caching headers, that'll put things going into the CDN. So it'll increase this number significantly, because the more users you have, they hit the same content. It doesn't come out of your main bucket. It comes out of a different bucket. And you get this. You get a lot more users to hit your information. But what if you actually end up on the top of Hacker News suddenly, and you need to start scaling up and down? Well, the cool thing here is that putting uh, the load balancer between the CDN actually lets you do this. You end up with the same egress, right? $0.08 cents per gig outbound, and the same fill, $0.04 cents per gig fill and we can actually end up with the F1 Micro. The problem now we have, though, is because we have a number of instances instead of a single one, you need a persistent MySQL instance for each of your compute instances to be able to sync between. Now, unfortunately, as of today, I could not find a way to get a free tier set up with the SQL instance. So that's going to be around $29 a month. So if you're above that 4,000 user mark and you're expecting scaling, the minimum cost you're going to end up paying is around $29, just to make sure that the, that Cloud SQL instance is sitting around. Or you could run it on your own N1 standard or F1 micro and, and deal with all of the uh, provisioning and everything else yourself. 
Now, there are, uh, it's worth noting here that there's also a plugin for App Engine. So if you're running WordPress and you want to run it on App Engine instead of dealing with all that other stuff, you can actually run it on an F1 micro instance or F1 instance on, WordPress, on uh, App Engine and get that down to about $0 a month. Unfortunately, you still need the SQL scalable backend, which runs on its own instance at about $29 a month as well. So something to think about. In general, if you're doing WordPress on Google Cloud Platform, I got to tell you there's three strata you need to think about to make sure you're, you're really thinking about your uh, shoestring style budget. If you're under 4,000 visitors, just use an F1 micro and turn on the CDN, and you'll basically get the whole thing for free, which is fantastic, right? That's where we all want to be. If you're above 4,000 visitors, then you need to start thinking about uh, stringing together Compute Engine plus the Load Balancer plus the CDN and plus the SQL option, or using App Engine to do the same. Because you have uh, enough users there, you need to start making sure that you're, you're doing things properly. However, I got to tell you that there is a number of hosted WordPress companies that have their backends built on Google Cloud Platform that do offer you a subscription-based service. So paying $4 a month, they'll host your WordPress site. They'll deal with all the scalability. They'll deal with all the security updates. They'll make sure everything is running in the background. You don't have to lift a finger. And it might be a cheaper option for you to fall into that bucket if you're above 4,000 visitors. So that might be something to look at, too. All right, uh, final topic for the day, video content side on the shoestring budget. So with these things in mind, uh, we have to look at what it would take to make like a, um, an education website or like a, an online MOOC, right? You have students that log in, they have some data they want to look at, they, uh, they watch some videos, they take some tests. You know, maybe you have uh, maybe a sports site that's streaming all of your high school sports games, and you've got a lot of video that you need to transfer. But you have some combination of rich multimedia and rich website presence, right? So with a standard layout here, you would probably have to store that video data in Google Cloud Storage right, and serve that right to the user so that you can get streaming capability. Right? You don't want that going through a proxy. You want that coming straight to the source there. On the website side, you probably have an Apache instance or maybe a WordPress instance that's actually hosting your website. It's got some connection to some relational database, right? so it can keep track of who the users are, what data they've seen, and any other keywords that you need. And then, of course, you've got your standard load balancing and CDN in front of that, so you can scale up, scale down, and make sure that your data is consistently sent to users around the world. This gets pretty pricey, unfortunately. Right? You're looking at uh, $24 for the compute engines per instance a month. You're looking at uh, $29 for the Cloud SQL instance. Of course, you've got your fill and your egress costs. But where you really get hit here, of course, is serving that video. Now, as of today, and again, this can change in the future, internet, if you're watching this sometime in the future, um, as of today, uh, the Cloud CDN that's coming from Google Cloud Storage does not cache 206 responses from an HTTP header. 206 responses are the ones that are used for streaming video, which means as you're streaming video, it's not going through the cache. right? So we have to be very cautious of this, which means we're going basically into the 12 cents per gig ratio if we're streaming data directly from Google Cloud Storage. Not really ideal. This whole thing can get pretty costly. But there actually is a solution if you're willing to make a couple changes. We can get this almost down to free instead of all of this cost. So first off, if you're willing to make some changes, leave your CDN in place. But instead of actually using uh, a, a dedicated compute engine instance, switch over your page serving to be something invocation-based, like Cloud Functions. Minimize all of your crazy complexity down to something that it can use a template for to just scrape the data together, put it together, send it down in the HTTP request as easy as possible. Make it invocation-based. You don't really need to do that much in the back end. Right? And as long as you're under 2 million page views a month, you can basically get that entire serving process for free, which is pretty nice. Likewise, instead of using Cloud SQL, try to use Cloud Data Store for your relational database. Right? If you're on a shoestring budget, Data Store will still give you the performance you need, because most of it is fetch-based if you're using a website like this. And it has its own free tier. Right? If you're under one gigabyte of stored data and you're doing less than 500,000 reads and 100,000 writes per month, you basically pay nothing, which I think this is right in the range of a MOOC-style startup, because you don't really have all the visitors you need yet. And even the successful ones are probably not doing 500,000 and 100,000 uh, per month. And you know, a gigabyte of relational data is actually a lot in that scenario. So we can basically get our entire website serving and backend storage for about $0. Now, the problem, though, is what do we do about the video content? Because right? there's no real other place to store this in Google Cloud Storage, because 206 responses. My only solution here, <laughs> a little bit of a hack, store all your video in YouTube. <laughs> Upload your video to YouTube, leave it as unlisted, right? 
And basically, when you're streaming your uh, embedded URLs down to your user, obfuscate the hell out of your code <laughs> so they can't figure out where the video URLs are. If you can set it up this way, you get the entire content serving and video production platform for free. <laughs> I, a lot of chuckles, yes. This slide is, is very contentious internally. We had a lot of talks. <laughs> we had a lot of talks internally <laughs> about whether or not that last little animation should be in this talk at all. Yeah. So with that, I want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank you for being the hustlers and the grinders, working on your costs every single day. I want to thank you for waking up this early to hear another bald man rant at you. Most importantly, if you care about cost, if you care about the performance of your cloud applications, I got to encourage you to check out our YouTube channel for Google Cloud Platform. We have a ton of amazing people working on amazing content to help you lower your costs, increase your scalability, and basically get your cloud application to where you want it as cheap as possible. With that, thank you. Stay sunscreened, stay hydrated. Enjoy your last day of Google I.O. Thank you very much. to abandon it or send special offers to users who are likely to spend. We're bringing together Google's machine learning technologies from across Google and making that available to every mobile developer working on Android and iOS. And since MLKit is available through Firebase, it's easy for you to take advantage of the broader Firebase platform. We're rolling out a major update to AR Core to help you create even richer, more immersive and interactive experiences. That's why we've created SceneForm, a brand new 3D framework that makes it easy for Java developers to create AR Core applications. Today, we're introducing Augmented Images, a new capability in AR Core that makes it possible to attach AR content and experiences to the physical images in the real world. With Cloud Anchors, we actually allow multiple devices to generate a shared, synchronized understanding of the world so that multiple phones can see and interact with the exact same digital content in the same place at the same time.
Good morning and welcome back to IO Live. It's our third and final day of our developer festival. Now there are still so many great sessions and sandbox demos ahead, so let's get to it. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to talk more about new capabilities we're releasing, as well as the improvements we're making to the platforms and tools you use every day. Today, we are excited to announce the new app model for Android. Using the Android App Bundle, a new publishing format, you can dramatically reduce app size. We're announcing Android Jetpack, the next generation of Android APIs to accelerate Android development. Jetpack is a set of libraries and tools. Jetpack's APIs are integrated with the IDE, too. For instance, Android Studio now includes a navigation editor, which works with the library. You told us, work on emulator boot time. Ready, set, go. I was not cheating. It was not running in the background. Slices are a cool new way to drive re-engagement. We wanted these to be easy to build. So you'll find templates that are rich and flexible. And because it's Jetpack, slices work on 95% of devices. And starting today, you can deeply customize the appearance of your action. First, we're making it even easier for you to promote your action with something new we call action links. Right there at the bottom, these are hyperlinks that you can use from anywhere that point directly into your action. Once users opt in, action notifications gives you a way to connect with them about new features and content. These notifications work on the phone even if users don't have your Android app installed, and you'll be able to re-engage with your users on speakers, smart displays, and other assistant-enabled devices. After somebody engages with your action, you can prompt them to add your action to their routine with just a couple of taps. And we're incredibly excited that Service Worker, the underlying new API that makes PWAs possible, is now supported on all major browsers, including recently Edge on Windows and Safari on both desktop and mobile. This is probably the most important leap forward for the web in the last decade. Today, we're launching Lighthouse 3.0, which makes Lighthouse's performance metrics even more precise and its guidance even more actionable. I'm happy to share that AMP is evolving in some big ways. Now, all AMP content benefits from a fast, free, privacy-preserving cache that optimizes page loads. But they've had these Google.com URLs. So we're fixing that with a new standard called web packaging. We're expanding Chrome OS to support developers with the ability to securely run Linux apps on Chrome OS. So this means that many of your favorite tools, editors, and IDEs now work on Chromebooks. We're proud to announce Material Theming, a major update to the Material Design system. Today, we're also releasing two new tools to make it faster to go from design to implementation. Material Theme Editor. This plugin for the popular application Sketch helps designers create and customize a unique material theme. This is the tool used by product teams at Google to review and comment on design iterations to make material yours, get started at material.io. Cloud TPUs are now available to everyone, and getting started is as simple as following this link. We've released an MO kit in beta, an SDK that brings Google's machine learning capabilities to mobile developers through Firebase. We believe success in AI should be determined by your imagination, not your infrastructure. Predictions applies ML to your analytics data and predicts the future behavior of your users so you can take proactive actions to optimize your app. For example, you can lower the difficulty of your game for users who are likely to abandon it or send special offers to users who are likely to spend. We're bringing together Google's machine learning technologies from across Google and making that available to every mobile developer working on Android and iOS. And since MLKit is available through Firebase, 
it's easy for you to take advantage of the broader Firebase platform. We're rolling out a major update to AR Core to help you create even richer, more immersive and interactive experiences. That's why we've created SceneForm, a brand new 3D framework that makes it easy for Java developers to create AR Core applications. Today, we're introducing Augmented Images, a new capability in AR Core that makes it possible to attach AR content and experiences to the physical images in the real world. With Cloud Anchors, we actually allow multiple devices to generate a shared, synchronized understanding of the world so that multiple phones can see and interact with the exact same digital content in the same place at the same time.
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Shahid. I'm a product manager on the Chrome OS team. And uh, welcome to all of you uh, to our session on developing Android apps on Chrome OS. Now, we talked about this uh, last year at I.O. And if you saw that talk, uh, today's talk is a continuation. We'll be talking about the basics briefly um, and talking about uh, how we've worked with a number of you over the, the past year, and as well as sharing a number of new features that we'd love to tell you about. So first of all, um, let's talk about why this matters. So we've talked previously about the success of Chromebooks within the education space, where we outsell every other device combined. But Google's really been doubling down on Chrome OS. Uh, you've hopefully been inundated by ads over Q4 last year and ongoing this year. And that's helped drive demand in the consumer space, too. So much so that in Q4 last year, 17% of notebooks sold in the US were Chromebooks. So why does this matter to you, Android developers? So the headline here is, Android apps work on Chrome OS. How does that happen? It works via the Android framework running inside a container that sits on top of the base of Chrome OS. And the full Play Store is already available. So your app is probably already running on Chrome OS. Now, ultimately, what we care about is a good user experience. Part of that is the operating system itself. And part of that is the apps that users choose to run. And we've been investing heavily in improving the product. And those of you who use Chrome OS over the past year have seen evidence of that in system updates that you've gotten. And many of you who are developing apps, we've already been working with to ensure that you're uh, ensuring that the apps work really well on Chrome OS. Adobe, Roblox, Sony, EA, and many, many more have already included Chromebook optimizations in their latest updates onto the Play Store. And that's opening up different kinds of usage and different kinds of revenue. May Allen, PM from Evernote, told us Pixelbook users are spending four times more time in Evernote than an average app user. And Andrew and David, founders from Steadfast Innovation, who make the Squid app, told us that Chromebooks have made up 21% of their revenue over the last 30 days. So first of all, to begin, uh, we're quickly going to review some basics. Ensuring that an app works well on Chrome OS comes down to four key differences between Chromebooks and phones. Wider screens, default landscape, window management, and different primary input devices, keyboard, pointer, stylus. First, wider screens. Chromebook screens are bigger, from 10.1 inch on the smaller side to 15 inch on some of our larger units. So apps need to be able to work well at all of these widths and respond appropriately to resize events. For example, AIDE's coding lessons now switch to a two-column view when the app is resized to be wider. Second, default landscape. As a default landscape device, apps need to have a really great landscape experience. And so for example, Pocket Casts pins open its navigations menu and arranges items in a grid so they can fill the space available rather than listing items out with white space to the right. Third, multi-window. Chrome OS is a multi-window desktop environment. The SignEasy and Sony Sketch apps in their latest versions on the Play Store are now resizable. So users can work better with these inside our environment. And finally, maybe the most important, keyboard and mouse inputs. When a user pulls out a laptop and uses it, uh, the keyboard and touchpad are closest to the user, so they gravitate towards them as their primary inputs. So the Infinite Painter team, as an example, built keyboard accelerators for common commands so users can get around faster inside the interface. And that's especially true for games. So Pixonic, who make War Robots, built keyboard controls into their game. The game now uses a special manifest flag to get inputs directly from Chrome OS and enables standard WASD gaming controls. So these are just a few of the app teams who are now building and testing their apps for Chrome OS. And a huge, huge thank you to everyone, many of you are here in the audience, that we've worked with. We're always looking for apps that work really, really great on Chrome OS so that we can show them off. And we want your app to be one of them. 
Now, to talk about some of the latest improvements in Chrome OS for Android app developers, I'd like to hand over to Stefan, one of our lead engineers on Chrome OS. Please welcome Stefan. Morning, everyone. I'm glad that you could all join for our today's talk. And I'm here to talk about, well, all our latest news, what we have done, and what you can do in order to improve your application even more for a desktop environment. So first slide, uh, what is new? So that is one of the things which is mostly important for the user, but of course also has some impact on what you're doing. And then advanced things you can do. We have added a lot of stuff over the last year, and we really want to show that. And we hope that you are actually making best use of it. And last of it, best practices. So when you're following these best practices, you will have a better chance in the Play Store because you will bubble up, and we will make sure of that. So what's new? Let's see. So first off, we have improved our tablet mode. Why did we do that? Because we have now also a tablet-only device. Well, and what did we change? Well, there are smoother animations. We have removed the caption bar, so it means the window control bar. And the controls from the caption control bar, they are actually now moving down into the shelf, as you can see there. And uh, also, all windows are automatically started full screen, so which is, of course, the experience what you expect on a tablet. So next thing is split screen. We have added split screen, which is, uh, well, you know that, of course, from phones. But now on a big tablet and or bigger screen, it makes, of course, much more sense. So you can split now the screen with any kind of window which is available on Chrome OS. So it might be, well, it might be a Chrome window, might be, of course, an Android window. The only thing is, at the moment, you will not be able to figure out that you are actually running in split screen. We will add that later. The next thing is, we have added picture in picture. So it's the full specification according to Android O, and it'll come in soon. And um, you can resize the window. You can actually place it in multiple locations, and it will be fairly similar to the one which we are using for web applications as well. So we have also added. Uh, the Android keyboard, so you can essentially replace now, uh, coming soon, um, the, the, the Chrome OS keyboard with an Android keyboard, which makes a lot of people happy. Notifications, we have overhauled our notifications. They are looking not now much more alike, so color scheming and everything should be much more integrated. You have to tap now instead of swiping, and well, everything is much more integrated into the Chrome OS style in itself. And uh, yeah, Pro Audio. So we have actually added since M65, beginning of this year, M, that's our milestones. I don't know if you know that. But uh, it's essentially like every six weeks, we have a new release cycle. And M65 is out already since a while. And uh, MIDI is in since a while in, in our Pixel book. So and soon, we will also have multi-channel audio. USB audio, uh, multi-channel USB, A audio, A audio memory mapped. And this is all coming later this year. And with that, you have actually seen when you were coming in someone playing music here. He was actually using a pixel book. And to show you a little bit more about that, I want to invite Frederico Tesman from the founder of Algorithm to actually show how this works.
Thank you. So you have possibly seen how everything was really real time, synchronized with the device, and everything is real time. So it's getting more interesting. Advanced thinks now what you can do to your application in order to make your life, well, to make the life on a desktop better. Well, become desktop native. I think I had that already last year, but we have, of course, a follow up on that one. So first off, this is something which is something everybody knows from everyday business, right? Menu accelerators, they are not really very something special, right? But the thing is, like, if you were using the toolkit UI in the past, it was actually from A. I think it was like, uh, I don't know, Angel Cake or whatever Android was back then. Uh, so means like really ancient. So display was small, and they had to actually fit everything on there, and it looked ugly. It was really not, not meant to be prime time. So we have actually changed the library to make this much, much easier for you to actually get these kind of things in. So and all you have to do is you have to go into your layout XML, you use in your menu, you put into the item itself, then the, the shortcut means the character and the modifier keys, and you're ready to go. Well, not entirely, but if you're using a standard menu, you have to actually call then the set QWERTY. Uh, 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 what was it again? Set QWERTY mode to true, uh, so that you're actually getting alphanumeric characters. OK, this is really old, but it's still there. So shelf integration. That is something like, if you want to do something inside the shelf, you want to change your icon, like, for example, you're opening a document or whatnot, you want to change the shape of the icon itself, or you want to display then the document which you have opened, you can actually do that with this set task description. Very simple and very effective. Next thing is, if you want to combine multiple items inside the shelf into one menu item, you can actually put then my intent put extra. You put then the shelf shortcut to it, and uh, you take then the, any kind of string for a kind of modifier which you actually know, and you actually then reuse it for all the items you want to put into the same thing. App shortcuts are coming. So this is something which is. Uh, coming soon. It's there already since, I think, NMR1. And we will support them very soon as well. So essentially, you can actually have actions and any kind of short things which you want to do in order to, uh, to get the user faster access to things. The back button. Well, I think many of you, since you were already doing something for Chrome OS, have already seen that there's a back button up in the window control bar. Well, you have also a back button. We know that. And the problem is, of course, two on top of each other looks pretty crappy. So therefore, by adding this special meta flag, you can get rid of it. Makes it much, much nicer, and that helps. But there's one other thing, and this is, I think, even more important. If you're on a desktop and you're pressing backspace or escape or navigate back or whatnot, and your window suddenly disappears, is something which is very unexpected to the user. Please don't do that. So if you can do it, please, what you should do is you should actually check if your activity is at the bottom of, well, at the root of the stack. And if it is, and you know that you are windowed, please don't close your window. Please keep it open, because it's really, really unexpected and disturbing for the user if suddenly all his work is suddenly gone. Lifetime management. So we were getting a lot of requests from, uh, from users which said, well, you know what, my application isn't really running multitasking. Well, why is it not multitasking? Well, because the thing is like, I have this game I'm playing, and I'm also checking my new status. And the new status isn't updating while I'm playing, but I would really like to see that. Well, there are actually three states. There is running, there is paused, and there is stopped. Running and paused means you are visible on the screen. So, which means not that you should actually drop everything and stop dead when you're getting a pause. No, you can actually continue to run unless you are a high whatever game where you have to have a lot of real-time action and whatnot, where you maybe want to really pause. In most cases, you really want to continue running. So please do this, and you make a lot of users much, much happier. Next thing, sharing data. Well, I said already earlier that 
we have plenty of windows on our desktop, right? So there are all kinds of Chrome OS, your window, and whatnot. If you don't specify drag flag global and you are doing a drag and drop operation, it will not be dropped on another application. This is then only for you. So in order to allow other applications to actually get your data, please specify this flag. And if you are actually getting some data from someone, well, also check out what you are getting. If you are simply blindly taking text, well, you might actually miss out of all the richness of the data which comes with it. So therefore, please check that out as well. And if you're looking at the clipboard, it's exactly the same thing. You definitely want to have, of course, all the richness of whatever is being copied and pasted as well. So with that, resizing. I was talking last year about resizing, that it's a really big problem, right? Because resizing looks pretty plonky on Android in general when you're doing this. So here is a solution for you. This is an application which was written for Material Design 2.0. And uh, it looks nice on a phone. See, this looks actually pretty nice. So when you are doing, when you're following the design study from, from material design, they are coming up with this thing for tablet form factor. See, there's more information. You can actually see more things. And they are revealing more stuff. So with that, let me show you a short demo of my notebook. So. So there's the application, and we can resize it. And as you can see, while I'm resizing it, more and more data is actually coming into play. And see, more stuff is coming. Oops, that was, of course, the wrong guy. Eh, there we go. And you see that more and more data is coming in. This is all dynamically happening, and it's very fluid without a restart, which is usually the problem, right? Can I back to my slides, please? So first off, good news. The demo is actually online. You can download it. You can test it out yourself. Um, it's on GitHub. And there's also an excellent code lab, which is actually even showing more. So you can also doing animations while you're transforming from one layout into another, which is then looking really cool. You should check out the, the code lab for sure. So how is it being done? Well, first off, you need to have a constrained layout state file. It's like a blueprint, which is essentially getting all the different layouts into, into some kind of order, when to use which one. And then comes the tricky part. Every of these layouts need to have all UI elements which you use. So if you don't want to see, if you want to show it, then you simply hide the thing. If it's hidden, it doesn't show, but it's still in the layout itself. So and by doing this, and in onCreate, you will actually create then the transition which you want to use when you want to transition from one to another. And you set the onConstraint changed layout handler. You will be able to, do, uh, uh, to add then the, the pre-layout change handler, which is then essentially like giving the control to the, to the, to the uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, which is giving the control to our layouter and um, which is doing the, the transition itself. So inside your activity, what you have to do is you have to add the on configuration change handler, which is usually being called every time when something changes, like the virtual keyboard is disconnected, the screen resolution changes, or anything like that. And fine, well, and from there, you are essentially calling the constraint changed layout handler to actually let him know what the size is. And that will actually then do all the work for you. And finally, you will actually add inside the Android manifest file the request that you want to handle all configuration changes for size changes. And with that, you are done. If you want to try it out, again, try the code lab to actually get this done. So the next thing is near, well, zero latency ink. What does zero latency ink mean? Well, you have possibly had already a pen. You were trying to draw something, and you see there is a lag between drawing something or using the pen and seeing something on the, on the device itself. So where is it coming from? Well, first off, you have to read the sensor. You have to do the input processing. You have to then do the upcode, whatever the application is doing. You have to do some drawing with OpenGL. Then you're actually doing multiple buffering because you have to actually pass everything to the compositor, which is then compositing actually everything on the Chrome OS side or 
whatever your operating system you have, to the compositing side, and it's going through the entire pipeline, which might be four, four images or whatnot. So in total, you're coming out to 100 milliseconds of delay, which is very, very noticeable. So the ideal thing is, of course, you simply remove all the compositing. So now you're down to, well, roughly two frames, which is less than 32 milliseconds, right? So, but if we are adding now also the prediction logic to it, well, then we are really at pretty much zero. So, mission accomplished. So, and with that, I will actually hand it over to Paolo Riviera, a comic book author, which is showing us the whole thing in action. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hmm, let's see. All right, can you guys see what I got up there? So uh, I drew some Spider-Man. Uh, that's typically what I'm known for at Marvel, but I also drew Thanos. Did anyone see Infinity War yet? <laughs> All right, I did too. All right, so what I like about this app is, uh, you know, you can rotate, you can draw at any angle. You can also do layers. This is uh, Infinite Painter, by the way. So what I've done is I've, I've drawn Spidey ahead of time, and I'm going to ink on top of him using some of the inking tools. Oh, I've got to change my color. I'm from the school of thought where Spider-Man should have excessive eyes. And so I'm glad that they did that in the movies. Some people don't like doing the webbing, but I do. It does add a little bit of time to each panel, but it's worth it in the end. And then, of course, you can add color as well. I put in a, a, a layer already with a, uh, a red base, and I'm going to add some shadow to it. One of the other features I like about this is you can double tap to reset it, and then if you hold and long press, it'll flip it. So as a comic book artist, I'm always flipping things uh, if I can because it gives you a fresh perspective. And of course, there's all kinds of drawing uh, tools that you can use. Some are more painterly than others. And what I did was I clipped the shadow layer to the layer beneath it, which means that Everything I do on this layer will be bounded by the layer below it. One way to save time. And of course, the other nice thing about the stylus is it has tilt. Uh, so in this case, I made tilt. Oh. Uh, depending on which way I hold the pen, it will give me a thick or thin line.
could do this all day. <laughs> <laughs> I usually do. <laughs> usually this, there aren't this many people watching while I'm drawing. <laughs> Y'all are lucky I'm even wearing pants. Let's finish it off with some spidey sense because uh, Thanos is nearby. And he's a Malthusian. There we go. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Thanks. OK, so how is it done? So we have an ink overlay view, which is a new thing, which is not yet really public. If you want to get access to it, there's a QR code. Please grab it and uh, sign up for our, our release. So you will actually be added then to our release notes as soon as we are giving you access to it. So but essentially, we have, well, you can see the code. And uh, it might change a little bit. So multi-display, which is another topic. So it's a very big topic, because the thing is like on a phone, you have two screens, right? You have the internal screen, you have an external screen, maybe. On a, well, if you're really creative and you have a Pixelbook Pro, you might actually get up to seven screens. I'm not entirely sure. I've heard that is possible. So anyways, but the thing is like, what does it mean for you? Well, actually, it means a lot, because the thing is like, many applications are doing stupid things. Uh, sorry, you are not that, right? Uh, but the thing is like, for example, simply using, hey, I want to get the display, uh, uh, the display information for display ID 0, well, which is a default display, right? Well, the thing is like, it's not the default display, because what is the default display? You don't know that, right? So therefore, we have actually, if you are pre-O, then we are thinking that you are a non-multi-display aware, multi aware application. And in this case, we have a special thing for you to make your life easier. Essentially, zero is like a virtual display, which is always a display you are on. So, and therefore, the entire API is, is really clear. Everything is exactly as it should be. But the thing is, like, you get this kind of special display so that you are working fine. If, however, on the other hand, you are actually something after O or O, then you will actually get a different treatment. In that case, you will get the real IDs, the real display IDs. So therefore, if you are doing these kind of things, you should be careful what you are doing. So and uh, yes, yeah, one additional thing is if you are actually running an NYC application, you still have the set launch display ID as a function call. So what should you do? Well, you should definitely use the, the, the the size of the window. So always use your context and try to get the, the display metrics from that. That is working perfectly for you. So and if you want to see any kind of changes, like for example, you were moved to a different display or something like, then look at uh, on configuration change to see these kind of changes. And uh, if you want to actually position yourself, think also about setting the set launch display ID if you do not want to get to the same screen where your current application is on. What you shouldn't do is you shouldn't really assume anything, well, without using your context. If you're using any kind of display ID, I mean, trying to get the default display, you will get something which is most certainly wrong. So and also, um, uh, what was that? Yeah, don't, don't make any assumptions that you are actually on the built-in display, because that is definitely wrong as well. And um, last but not least, uh, don't assume that you're always running from the same display. So presentation API, we were being asked to actually get this to you. We are getting that very, very soon. And uh, it is, well, actually, I think by pretty much by now it should be there. You can alternatively also use set launch display ID and set launch uh, bounce, which will actually do pretty much the same thing. Uh, 3D and gaming. So what is there? So basically, we have Vulkan support for uh, for example, the Pixelbook. Um, 
It was actually shipping already. 1.0 was already shipping beginning of this year. 1.1 should be shipping around now. And older architectures are also on the way. So Vulkan is much faster than and so on. So when you are building your own game, one, so there are a few things what you should actually take care of. First off, you should always use the latest version of the framework. If you're using Unity and whatnot, they are actually fixing their stuff. So if, for example, a window size changes and whatnot, and there's the input region which is changing a little bit, uh, they will actually fix that for you. So please, use the latest one, because otherwise your application will fail when you are trying to be resized. So the next thing is uh, also use Intel uh, either 64-bit or 32-bit native code as well. Don't use only ARM, because ARM is, of course, a little bit slower, especially on the high-end devices. So when you're running a game, uh, application quality control might actually be bad for you, depending on what you're doing. So if you have, for example, multiple surfaces and whatnot, and you're trying then to, to squeeze out the latest thing, and if you're running into a state where you're using suddenly quadruple buffering because you're being composited on the desktop or something, your quality control might actually do something negative to your quality, and you get some kind of really weird behavior. So therefore, try it out on Chromebooks before you, before you release it. That would be really awesome. And um, yeah, if you're using a lot of layers, like a lot of surface views and whatnot, you might also fall out of this, and uh, then your quality might actually drop. So therefore, if you can actually do everything in, one, in a single layer instead, please try to do that instead. And always be aware that your window size might change at any point in time. And uh, of course, since a user is, for example, minimizing you, you might actually lose your state. And or if the window gets being resized, uh, the state might actually be lost. So please save your state. Best practices. As I said earlier, we are trying to work with Play Store to actually uh, surface applications which are really good for the Chrome OS environment. So therefore, if you are doing everything which we are asked for, you will actually get a better rating. So therefore, target SDK bigger than 26, uh, that is definitely something good. Implement keyboard mouse uh, uh, and mouse navigation, that is a good thing. Uh, UI elements, when you're resizing, they should always be inside the screen. So because if you're alt tabbing through something and suddenly your element is outside of the screen, that's bad. When you're doing resizing, definitely try to think about landscape and portrait. Both orientations are really important. Uh, make good use of a lot of space, because you have a lot of space. So use it. I showed you how to. Uh, use architectural components whenever possible in order to save your state or save instant state. That does also do the same thing. Be fluid, and please don't crash. That is really the worst thing which can happen. Check out that you are not crashing. And with that, I'm passing it on to Emily, who is talking about all the great tools we have for you. Thank you. There's so many exciting new things for Android applications on Chrome OS. Um, and I'm honored to be able to present to you three new amazing developer tools to help optimizing your application for Chrome OS faster and easier. Um, the first one, um, you've all been very patient. Um, so thank you for your patience. And a big thank you to the engineering team for making this happen and doing it right. Um, in Android Studio, we're pleased to present uh, the Chrome OS emulator. So right in Android Studio, you have a full Chrome OS image. You can test out the user flow for Chrome OS and, of course, test and optimize your app for Android. Um, your Android application right in Chrome OS, which is awesome. Um, however, if any of you have ever made an Android application, that's my joke. OK, some of you did. Some of you made one. If you do, you'll know there's nothing like testing on a real device, um, especially a form factor like this, um, where the user will be flipping it, rotating it, tossing it on the bed, keyboard input, mouse input, MIDI controllers, stylus input. You just you need to test this on a real device. So we've made that a lot easier. Um, I'm very happy to present um, ADB debugging over USB. <laughs> it's available for your Pixelbook and your HP Chromebook X2. Um, the public documentation will be out in a, a week or two, so please watch those links. Um, and more devices coming soon, and it makes development that much easier. OK, so I said there was three exciting developer tools we're announcing 
And um, the first two are awesome. But I actually think the third one is even more exciting. And I truly, truly believe it's going to knock your socks off. And we didn't want anyone to go home with cold feet. So we brought some replacement socks for when they fly off your, uh, your feet. Here's some. And if you're in the middle of the audience or at the back, don't be jealous. There's plenty of socks for everyone. And on your way out of the session, you can, you can pick them up. We're going to have people handing them out. Um, so with that, yes, yeah, socks, right? Socks is your new developer tool. So I'm going to switch over to the Chromebook for a quick demo. We have a terminal. Yes, a terminal. Yeah, a terminal. Yeah. Super exciting terminal. You can see uh, Git clone, all sorts of exciting things. I clone the Code Lab, optimizing your Android application for Chrome OS, which you should check out at the Code Lab tent. There's dinosaurs. Um, but what's interesting about this particular terminal is it's running inside a full Linux environment. Um, no clap? OK. You watch the keynote. You watch the keynote. OK, fine. So if you have a full Linux environment, you can clap for this next one. You could install an application, Linux application, like Android Studio. So here we have Android Studio. Yeah, more exciting than a terminal, I guess. So here I have the code lab loaded up. I'm making those dinosaurs click. I'm adding drag and drop. And I go and hit run. Oh, so if you're in the back and you can't see, that says Google Pixelbook, which means when I press OK, you know, it goes through the Gradle build, um, oh, pushing the application to the device. What? On device. Yeah. So look, you can click. Oh, we got keyboard commands. And that's, it's pushed it straight to the device. So we can program on the Pixelbook in Android Studio, push directly to the device, test your app out. And of course, you have your Logcat there with, and all your debugging tools. So this is amazing. Yeah. And I'm so glad the engineering team let me present this super exciting announcement. Um, so we're super excited about Linux on Chromebooks. We're going to tell you how to set it up for yourself. Um, before I do, we had a lot of questions at office hours um, and in the code lab, what's going on behind the scenes? How does this work? How is it set up? So I'm going to give you a brief overview. Um, here's Chrome OS. In real life, it's a bit snazzier, but it's a <laughs> representative box. Um, and inside there, we have the Android container. This is nothing new. Um, this is how your Android apps run on Chrome OS today. Um, of course, what is new is we have a Linux VM. And we install great applications like Tux Racer, which they wouldn't let me show today. Also, Android Studio. Um, and to achieve that last step, which I think is the most exciting, pushing straight to the app and debugging on device, we need to connect ADB to the Android container. Um, to do that, it's quite simple. It's uh, ADB connect command. It's not a secret IP address. It's the IP address um, for the AD, ADBD um, on the Android container. Um, this will be in the public, it is in the public um, instructions already. But here's a pro tip since you came to our session. Um, for some situations, it's handy to set up a little SSH tunnel, simple SSH tunnel in Chrome OS that will just forward those connections automatically. Not necessary, it's helpful in some situations. Um, here's the instructions if you haven't, oops. Here are the instructions if you haven't seen it. Um, I think we were number one on Hacker News yesterday or something. So that's kind of exciting. Um, please install it on your Google Pixelbook. Coming to more devices soon. We're super excited about it. Let us know how it works. Try it out. Um, so where are we at? We have an emulator. We have ADB debugging over USB. We've got Linux on Chromebooks running Android Studio, which you can de debug and develop on the device. And you have socks for those long, cold coding nights so your tootsies stay toasty. What's missing? Nothing, right? Except I heard a rumor on the way in that some of you don't yet have a pixel book. What? So um, we're going to help you out a little bit with that. Um, on your way out, when you grab your socks, you can pick up. <laughs> a coupon for 75% off a Google pixel book. Don't forget your socks. Um, Oh, they're kicking me off the stage. So I'm going to say quickly, come to our code labs. We have two great code labs. You can do the resizing with animations. It looks great. You can make keyboard input, drag and drop, click on the dinosaurs, talk to us office hours today, fill out the survey. Thank you. Can everyone come back on stage? It's a bow. We're done. Yes? 
Shahid, Federico, come on up, Stefan, Paolo, thank you, thank you so much.
Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. I'm Andrew. I'm a software engineer on the ExoPlayer team. And I'm Mark. I'm developer advocate for Android Media. So in today's session, we're hoping to demonstrate how you can build really, really fully featured media playback functionality into your apps using quite little code using ExoPlayer. And to do that, we're going to guide you through the process of building two applications. We're going to start by focusing on the video use case. We're going to build a simple video player app that will play an MP4 stream. Then we're going to show you how to insert ads alongside that video content. Then we're going to shift our focus to audio a background service. We're going to show you how to integrate with Android media sessions. And finally, we're going to take a look at some new functionality we've, re we've recently released for downloading media for offline playback. Uh, so like last year, we're hoping to have a mixture of some introductory content and also some coverage of slightly more tricky use cases. So hopefully there's something for everyone. And with that in mind, I'm going to start by saying a bit about what ExoPlayer is for anyone who hasn't used the library before. OK. Clicker doesn't seem to be working. Next slide. Great. Um, so ExoPlayer is an application level media player. That means that you choose which version of ExoPlayer you'd like to use, and then you bundle the player implementation into your application as a dependency. And what that gives you is consistent playback functionality across all different Android versions and across all different devices. ExoPlayer works from API 16, that's Android Jelly Bean, upwards. So with that, you can reach more than 99% of active devices. The project is open source. It's hosted on GitHub. And we have an active community there. And you can file issues with feature requests, bugs, and you can even send us pull requests. ExoPlayer is also quite widely used, both within Google applications like the YouTube app for Android and also in Google Play Movies. It's also quite widely used in the wider Android community. Um, and there are actually over 200,000 applications on the Play Store that are using ExoPlayer. Um, and the team's always really excited to see the kind of great products that you're all building using ExoPlayer. Since last year's talk, we've been working hard on both stability and performance improvements behind the scenes, but also on some brand new features. And in doing that, uh, ExoPlayer is gradually evolving into quite a fully featured solution for media playback. So uh, here's uh, some of the highlights of the features that we've added over the past year. Uh, there's much too much to go into detail on here, uh, but I'd encourage you to check out the release notes in the root directory of our GitHub project, uh, where you can find full details of all of the changes included in each new release of the player. In today's talk, we're just going to cover a few highlights, including support for downloading media, as I mentioned, and also support for player notifications. OK, I think that's enough on the slides. Um, let's get on with some live coding. And for each of these two apps, our video app and our audio app, our starting point will be a mostly empty project, um, because we want to show you as much of the interesting code as possible. But we're going to provide a link to a branch on our GitHub project where you can check out the code afterwards if you want to look at things in a bit more detail. OK, Mark, are you ready to do some furious typing? Yes, I am. Great. OK, um, if we could switch to the laptop, please. Um, our starting point is a, is a mostly empty project, as I mentioned. Um, we're going to make a video player app where we start playing the stream as soon as the app comes into the foreground, and then we stop playing the stream when we go into the background. And to do that, the first step is going to be to add a dependency on the ExoPlayer core library. And this provides the main interface to the player that you can use to control playback from within code. As you can see, Mark's added a dependency on the core library with the version 2.8.0, which is the new release that we've done this week. He's also added a, dependency, added a dependency on the optional UI module. This provides some customizable high-level UI components, which you can put into your applications for things like showing a video player in a view. That's player view, which we're going to use today. And it also provides playback control view and some other components. And these are all very customizable. So you can change which icons you're using. You can customize the layouts and so on. So you can see that Mark has added a player view, which is going to fill the activity. And he's given it an identifier, player underscore view, so we'll be able to access it from code. Now if we switch over to our main activity, we can see in our onCreate method, uh, we can get access to that view using find view by ID. And once we've got access to that view, then the next step we're going to take is to actually initialize the player. OK. So once we've got our player view in a field, let's override the onStart method. Uh, 
And then on start, we're going to initialize the player. To initialize the player, we're going to use a static method on the exo player factory called new simple instance. This is going to give us a simple exo player instance. Now, it might sound like simple exo player is only for really basic stuff, but actually, simple exo player is our recommended way of integrating at the moment because it provides, it does lots of things for you. For example, handling the lifecycle of the surface holder for video output. You can see also that we're passing in, as well as a context, a track selector implementation. In this example, we're going to use a default track selector. But this is an example of a pattern which is very common in ExoPlayer's API, where you pass in a dependency of a component. In this case, um, we're passing in a default track selector, but you could pass in your own track selector implementation if you wanted to have much more control over how track selection is working. So Mark's already gone ahead, and he's bound the player to the player view so that the player's output is going to appear in that particular view. OK. So the next step is to tell ExoPlayer what we want to play. And for that, there are really two parts. The first one is to provide a factory for data sources. Data sources tell ExoPlayer how to load data, for example, using a particular HTTP stack or loading files from the local device. In this example, we're using a default data source, which is suitable for many use cases. It provides loading for HTTP URLs, files from the local disk, uh, assets and resources bundled into your AVK, and so on. But if you wanted to, for example, use the Chromium network stack here, then you could use a Cronet data source factory. OK, so that's the first part of telling ExoPlayer what to load. The next part is specifying a media source. Your choice of media source is going to depend on the type of media you're trying to play. In this example, we're going to be playing an MP4, so we're going to use an extractor media source, which supports formats like MP4, MP3, Matroska, and so on. If you wanted to play Dash or HLS or smooth streaming streams, then you would use the corresponding media sources for those different formats. And you can see that Mark's passing in the URI to our MP4 when he's creating the media source. OK, once we've got our media source, now we just need to prepare the player to start buffering data. So we'll pass that to the prepare method. Then we're going to call set play when ready to tell the player that as soon as it transitions from the buffering state to the ready state, then playback should begin automatically. Having done that, all that remains is to clean up um, when the activity goes into the background. So we'll override on destroy, uh, sorry, on stop. Okay. And in that, we're going to clear the player reference on the player view. And then we're going to release the player. OK, and this is kind of the, the minimal code you need just to, to play a video stream. Uh, let's go ahead and deploy that to the device now. And if we could switch to the phone, please. Hopefully, you haven't missed out anything. So when, when the application's uh, been installed on the device, the device, you should see the video starts to play automatically. Uh, and uh, you can see that if you tap People on the video, you get some mobile devices simple playback ways. controls. Uh, pretty much what you'd expect from a video player app. So you can pause and resume. You can seek around, and so on. OK. Um, let's, uh, let's now switch back to the laptop, please. So let's imagine we've launched our video app. Um, if we could switch to the laptop, please. We've launched our video app. And now we'd like to think about how we're going to monetize our content by showing ads. This is extremely easy to do with ExoPlayer. We've recently added. Uh, an IMA extension, which makes this very easy. So ExoPlayer extensions are wrappers around external functionality that make it very easy to use with ExoPlayer. In this case, the IMA extension is a wrapper around the Interactive Media Ads SDK, which provides support for loading XML ad tags in VAST and VMAP formats, which is a standard format for information about ads. So we're going to be using that to load ads, and then we're going to insert it within the content in our player. So Mark's going to create a ads loader, which is a, we're going to use an IMA ads loader, which is the object that's provided by the IMA extension. This is going to take the context and an ad tag URI, which is the URI of an XML document specifying what ads to play, where in the content. So we're going to create that ads loader in onCreate, and then we're going to release it in onDestroy. The reason we're using onCreate and onDestroy is that that ads loader contains information about which ads have already been played. So we want to make sure that if the app goes into the background and comes back into the foreground, we don't show the same ads multiple times. OK. Um, as I mentioned before, media sources are how we tell ExoPlayer what to play. And in order to play ads, we use the predictably named ads media source. 
So we're going to create an ads media source. We'll pass in the content media source that we want to play. We'll pass in a data source factory, which is going to be used to load data for playing the ads. We'll pass in the ads loader. And finally, we'll pass in a view group that's on top of the player. And that's going to be used to show any user interface associated with ads, like, for example, a skip button. And building an ads media source out of a content media source like this is an example of media source composition. And this is something that you can do with ExoPlayer. Um, we'll see some more examples of that later when we look at playlists. OK, so we, we prepare the player with the ads media source, and then we should be good to go. So you can see we hopefully, hopefully this will work. If we could switch to the phone. Um, we were able to add support for playing ads with maybe 10 or so lines of code. And actually, this, this way of integrating the uh, IMA SDK gives a really good user experience, because ExoPlayer knows about which ads are coming up in the future. And that means that it's going to be able to buffer the content in advance and the ads. It can buffer the ads in advance to give you seamless transitions between ads and content. So as you saw, we had a pre-roll ad at the beginning. And now the time bar has little yellow markers, which are showing us the positions of ads within the content. And ExoPlayer is taking care of all of the, the difficulty of loading the ads and buffering everything behind the scenes for us. OK, so that's ad playback. And now over to Mark to talk a bit about audio. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. <coughs> so far, we focused on video only. So let's switch to another application and look a little bit into audio playback. Audio playback is a little bit more challenging because we want to enable the user to put our application into the background and use another application, and audio should still keep playing in the background. For this, we are going to use a so-called foreground service. It's called a foreground service because we need to attach a notification to this service, and this notification is in the foreground. It's visible to the user, so the user is always aware we are doing some work in the background. <coughs> Since Oreo, such, an o such a foreground service is a mandatory requirement. If we don't put our service into the foreground, the system will kill our service and the application crashes. So let's have a look at the starting point of our foreground service. And let's switch back to the uh, laptop, please. Yes, we see here uh, we have this audio player service, which extends from the service. We have already overridden the onCreate method, where we put the code from our video sample, where we initialize and prepare the player with a single media item. In onDestroy, we release our resources. And finally, in onStartCommand, we return start, start sticky, so the service is not immediately destroyed. And we can explicitly terminate our service when we are ready, <coughs> when we are finished with audio playback. The service is also already registered in the manifest. We have this simple service element, which just points to our audio player service clause. And finally, we need to have a way to start our service. We do this in the main activity, in the own create method of the main activity. Here we create an intent pointing to our audio player service, and then we use a static method of the exo player library, which starts the service in foreground according to the to the API level. <coughs> so now let's go back into the audio player service again, and let's change this code a little bit uh, of the, where we initialize our player. Because for audio, we don't want to only support playing a single media item. We want to support playlists, so the user can, can move to the next or to the previous item, or can just let the playlist play one item after the other. <coughs> With ExoPlayer, we are using a concatenating media source to implement playlists. <coughs> this concatenating media source just joins together a number of media sources and plays them gaplessly and without rebuffering in between. So we achieve a pretty nice user experience for, pla for audio playback. The concatenating media source also allows us to dynamically change the playlist, so we can add and remove media sources while the player is playing. Or we can even move the currently playing item in our playlist while the player is playing. That's pretty neat. So Andrew already started to iterate over our samples array. And for each sample, we get a URI. We again are going to create an extractor media source. But then we add this extractor media source to our concatenating media source. In the end, we prepare our player with this concatenating media source, and we are already done. We are now supporting playlists with gapless play, gapless, which play gaplessly and without rebuffering. So, but now 
let's have a look at our service again and make it a proper foreground service. We've already said we need to attach a notification to our foreground service. And for this, we are going to use the player notification service manager. The player notification manager will not only create the notification, but it will keep it nicely in sync with the state of the player. So each time the player state changes, the manager will update the notification and post it to our drawer again. We use a static method to create this player notification manager, and we need to pass a couple of arguments to it. First, we need to pass the context. Then we need to pass the channel ID, which identifies our channel to which we post our notification. The next parameter is a string identifier, which, which gives us a localized name for our channel. This is the name which shows up in the settings dialog, where our user maybe want to mute our notification channel. And then the next parameter is a notification ID to identify, identify our notification. And finally, we need to pass a so-called media description adapter. The manager will use our adapter to get information about the currently playing item. So each time the notification is rebuilt, the adapter is called to get this information. So we see that for each of those uh, callbacks, the player instance is passed to the method. So we can use this player, uh, this player to get the current window index. The current window index gives us the index to pick our sample out of our samples array, which is kind of the playlist. We return the title to get a content title. Then we have a pretty similar method where we just return the description, which is a longer text which is displayed in a context in a notification. And finally, we also provide a bitmap to make our notification a little bit nicer. <coughs> we just use a convenient method of our samples to get such a bitmap for each of our samples. Finally, we also need to provide a pending intent. This pending intent is fired when the user taps on the notification. And we want to get the user back to our application, in, this in our example, to the main activi activity. So we create an intent pointing to our main activity. And then we wrap this intent into a pending intent, which we are using with the static method get activities on the pending intent. Here again, a couple of arguments, the context as the first argument, then a request code, which is zero in our case. We are not going to use it in our sample. Then the intent pointing to our main activity. And finally, a flag to tell the system to update any pending intents already in the queue. <coughs> so now we have this player notification manager. We now also need to register a notification listener. This listener makes our service aware of the life cycle of our notification. It has two methods. So we register uh, this notification uh, listener, which is a, an uh, anonymous class in this case. The first method, or notification started, is called when the notification is initially created. Here, we are now pass those two arguments to the start foreground service. And this is now the moment where our service is officially a foreground service. We are now safe. The system is not going to kill our service anymore. The next method, then, is called when the notification is canceled. Here, we just stop self our service because we want to terminate the service. Finally, we also need to register the player. We set the player with the set player method on the notification manager. So the notification manager can sync the player state to the notification. So that's about it. We also need to clean up in the on destroy method. Here we just null the set the player instance again so we don't leak a player, a player reference when the service is being destroyed. So now please change back to the phone and if we done everything right, we should now be able to hear the playlist playing in our service. The application comes up. We see the notification in the drawer. We, the not it's playing. Then let's have a look at the notification in the drawer. We see here the information which it comes from our adapter. We can use the playback controls to control playback. We can pause or start again. We can skip to the next item, and if we tap on the notification, it gets us back to the application. So fine. <clears throat>
So as a next step, we have seen now that this notification contains information about the current item and about the state, and it lets the user control the media playback. What if we want to expose this functionality to external application? Good. Let's go to the next. Can we go back to the slides, please? Thank you. Google Assistant, for example, may want to. Yeah, here we are. Here we go. Google Assistant, for example, wants to allow the user to use voice commands to control media playback. Android Auto or Wear OS let the user remote control, remote control a media application and browse in a media catalog of our application. <clears throat> the Android framework has a solution for this because we essentially need to provide three things to let external application participate in media playback. First, we need to expose the playback state. This is the things like the player state itself, the current media item, or the playlist with which we prepared our player. Second, we need to be able to retrieve playback commands from external, command, external application so we can execute those commands on our player instance. And third, we need to provide ways to browse in our media catalog. The Android framework provides a solution for this. It provides the media session and the media browser service. We are not going into the detail of the media browser service because we don't have time for this, but we, let, we look at the media session, which allows us to expose the playback state and retrieve playback commands. <laughs> In our code sample, we are going to use the media session connector, which is part of the media session extension of the ExoPlayer library. This media session connector synchronizes the player state with the state of the media session and retrieves commands from the media session. So let's change again back to the laptop, please, so we can see how we can do this in code. We are again in the onCreate method of our player, of our audio player service, and we are now going to create an instance of a media session, session compart. We assign it to a field, we just call the media session compart constructor with the context and an identifier, which is, the media, which is just a string. Then we immediately set our media session to active by, call, by passing true to the set active method. Now, as a first step, we want to make the player notification manager aware of our session. And we pass the token to the player notification manager so we can en enhance the media style notification and provide an, art an artwork for our lock screen of our device. But now, we are going to create such a media session connector. We call the constructor, and we just pass the media session to the connector so he has access to the session. We've said we want to synchronize our playlist with the queue of the media session, so external application know what items we are having in our playlist. For this, we are going to use a timeline queue navigator. The timeline is the internal representation of the playlist after the player has been prepared. So there are as many windows in our timeline as we have items in our playlist. So with this, we can use the window index, which is the parameter which is passed to our, uh, our method we are going to override to create, to get the samples again out of our, our samples array. And we then are going to create a media description for such a sample. Let's have a look in this uh, get media description method to see that there is not much magic behind it. We see we are just using a media description compat builder and then we populate this data with the data from our samples, and then we build such a media description compat, which we return to our connector. <coughs> so now we have our, we've already this media session connector. As a next step, again, we need to pass the player to the connector so we can sync the player with the media session. Here, we again set, use the set player method, the first parameter is the player itself. The second parameter is a playback prepare. We are not going to use it because we don't want to allow external application to initiate playback in our sample. So that's kind of it. Again, in on destroy, we need to clean up. First, we just release the media session. And as a second step, we again set the player instance to null, this time in the connector, to avoid leaking an instance of the player. 
So now that's kind of it. If everything is correct, we should be able to deploy the application again. Please switch to the phone again. And Andrew should now be able to use Android Google Assistant to skip to the next item. Let's see if this works. Play next track. Why? Fine. Well done. Thank you. And now, now over to Andrew again for downloading an offline functionality. Thank you, Mark. If we could switch back to the slides, please. OK. Um, so another feature of media apps that I'm sure you're all familiar with is support for downloading media for offline playback. This is really important if your users are going to be in a situation where they have no connectivity or intermittent connectivity. Um, this has been a much requested feature for a while now, and we're really pleased that we've been able to launch this in our 2.8.0 release this week. In ExoPlayer, our support for downloading is built on top of our support for caching. So I'm going to um, say a little bit about how caching fits into the picture of the player setup, and then we'll look at how downloading builds on top of that. So this diagram is intended to show the data flow when playing one MP3 file. We have a song which is in the cloud somewhere. We have a data source which is requesting that over HTTP. It's loading the data. And then we had a media source that was getting the information from there and providing it to the player. Let's see how caching fits into this. Well, it's quite simple. We just add a cache data source. That sits in between the data source we're using for loading from the network and the media source that's providing data to the player. And it's going to be responsible for dealing with a cache instance. In this case, we're using a simple cache, which is provided by ExoPlayer's core library. The way this works is as follows. When the media source requests some data, it's going to ask the, ask the cache data source to provide that information. The cache data source is going to look in the cache. If it's present there, then that's great. We can get the data from local storage. That goes to the media source, and we never had to go to the network. On the other hand, if the data is not present in the cache, so we've got a cache miss, then the cache data source needs to go to the data source that's being used to load from the network, and it's going to request the data from there, and then it's going to store it in the cache when it arrives. And in this way, the cache gradually gets populated with the data that's loaded while du during playback. You can see also on this diagram, we've got a cache evictor. This component ground, so it might need a service. And this downloading operation, what's going on internally, is it's going to read through the entire stream. And as it does that, it'll be populating the same cache instance that you're using for playback. And as you can probably guess, when you do this operation, if you've populated the cache with all of the data, then when it comes to playback, your player is going to be able to get everything from the cache from the cache data source. There's never a need to go to the network in this case. One very important thing to note is that we've got a no-op cache evictor. So this is an implementation of cache evictor, which does nothing. Uh, it's never going to evict data from the cache. The reason we have that is that we don't want to have a situation whereby we're, lo we're downloading the stream. And then when we've downloaded up to a certain amount of data, we start getting rid of data at the beginning of the stream, because that would be very annoying for users. OK, so that's the theory. Let's see how this works in practice. If we could switch back to the laptop, please. So we're going to do this in three steps. The first step is we're going to add support for caching to our player. Then we're going to implement an audio download service, which is going to actually run the download operation as in the background. Then finally, we're going to add a very minimal piece of UI to our activity in order to let us trigger the downloads to take place. OK, uh, so we'll go ahead and create a cache data source factory. And as we saw on the slide, this is going to sit between our data source factory for loading from the network and the media source, which is actually going to be extracting the media. So you can see we're using a utility method to get our cache. Um, let's jump into that and see what's going on there. So as I mentioned, we're sharing the same cache for playback and downloading. And that means it's important that we just have a singleton for our whole process. Inside get cache, what we're doing is we check if we've got one already. Uh, if we don't have one, we're going to create a file which is pointing to a directory where we're going to store the downloads. Then we're going to instantiate a simple cache, passing in that directory, and also a no-op cache evictor, which is very important, uh, because we don't want to be removing data from the cache. OK. So that's how we make a, a simple cache. We also need to provide the cache data source factory with the upstream data source factory for loading data from the network. 
OK, and that's all we need to instantiate a cache data source factory. Let's introduce a local variable for that. And then we're going to use that cache data source factory in place of the data source factory we were using before for loading from the network. OK, um, so hopefully that makes sense for adding support for caching to our player. Now we're going to move on, and we're going to add an audio download service, which is actually going to run the downloading operation. So we provide a superclass for, um, called download service for your, for your download services that you'll be putting in your application. So we'll be inheriting from that here. OK. Um, so there's a few, things, few steps we need to do now. The most important one, important not to forget, is to add a declaration for the service to your manifest. So we're going to add our audio download service here. Now we can switch back, and we have to implement a constructor and three methods. So let's, let's start doing that. We'll create a constructor with no arguments, but then we're going to call the super constructor and pass in some information about the download notifications. So we'll need a notification ID, which must be different from the notification ID we used for audio playback. We'll also pass in an interval at, what, at which to update the, the notification, and we'll just use the default here. We'll pass in, we'll pass in a channel ID for our download notification channel. And finally, we also need to provide a string resource which describes the notification channel. And that works just the same as the one we did for um, audio playback that had the notification channel as well. Now we need to override some methods. So let's have a look at those. The first one is we need to provide a download manager. And we have a utility method for this, which we'll have a look at in a second. That's just taking a context. Let's jump in there. So again, we're using a singleton instance of a download manager for our whole process. This is also creating a file because it needs to persist some information about downloads that are in progress. And then we're instantiating a download manager, passing in the same cache instance as the one that we're using for the cache during playback. You can see also there's a data source factory for loading data to populate the cache. And we've also got a deserializer for, pro for progressive download actions because we're downloading progressive media. OK, for get scheduler, for the purposes of our simple demo app, we're just going to leave this returning null. But in a real application, you would want to provide some kind of job scheduler so that the system can start your download service when your process isn't running in order to resume downloads. You can have a look at our full demo app for an example of how to do that. Finally, we're going to provide a progress notification. And we've got a handy utility method to build one here. This is going to take a context an icon which is going to be shown in the notification associated with the download that's in progress. And we'll just use our playback icon for, for that. Then we provide the download channel ID, which is the same one that we used earlier. Uh, this one's actually a string, not a resource. One, one parameter for our head. <laughs> OK, uh, so we get our download channel ID. For our, um, we actually need an intent next, which we'll just pass null for. I think we got a bit mixed up with the parameters here. So if you remove download channel name, no. <laughs> easily done. There's lots of parameters. <laughs> OK. Then the message is null. Uh, content intent is null. The message is null. And we'll just pass our task states, uh, which has information about the downloads that are in progress, what their status is. Phew. That's a lot of parameters. OK. So that looks pretty good. Um, that's implementing our download service. The final step, I promise, is just providing a way to trigger these downloads from our activity. So as you can see, we've got an empty list view here. We're going to replace that with a list of samples. So we've just got three items in a playlist. When the user taps one of those, we're going to trigger the download to start. And to do that, we'll, we'll be creating a progressive download action. If you were downloading a different type of content, like a dash stream, then you would not use progressive download action. You'd use the corresponding download action for the type of stream you're downloading. That's going to take a URI. It's going to take a flag to say whether we're removing or not. We want to add it to the cache, so we'll pass in false. We don't want to associate any custom data, so we'll pass null for the data and the custom cache key. Once we've created our progressive download action, all that remains is to call a method on the download service. There's a static method to start the service with that action. And that takes a context, which is main activity dot this, not the item click listener this. OK, 
Uh, it takes the class of the download service, which is audio download service dot class. It takes the download action, which we've just created, progressive download action. And finally, we can pass false for foreground because our activity is already in the foreground. OK, uh, there's quite a few bits to remember there, but hopefully we've got everything. Uh, let's give that a try and see if it works. Now, we had planned to show you putting the device into flight mode and playing back the downloaded content, but unfortunately, we're having to use cost to play the stream, so we won't actually be able to show you the, uh, putting the device in flight mode. You'll need to use your imagination. As you can see, when we tap the items, you get a little play icon, which is our download notification. And that's going to progress as the download progresses. Uh, and that's populating the cache in the background. OK, so that's pretty much it for downloading. Um, I'm now going to hand back over to Mark to say a few words about cost. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So there is a last uh, important integration we did not cover in code, and we will not cover in code. It's the integration with Google Cost. Google Cost is almost expected by all users, uh, by users to be supported by uh, media apps. We've recently added a Cost extension, which makes integration with Cost for ExoPlayer application pretty easier. Let's switch to the slides again, please. The cost extension. The cost extension takes advantage of the player interface of the ExoPlayer library. All the UI components and other components, like the player notification manager, the media session connector, which we've seen in action, take advantage of this player interface and only rely on this player interface. The most prominent implementation of this player interface is the simple ExoPlayer. Almost all ExoPlayer applications use the simple ExoPlayer for local playback. The cost extension now adds another implementation of this player interface, which is the cost player. The cost player wraps the remote media client of the cost SDK, so it gets pretty easy to swap local playback done with the simple exo player with remote playback of the cost player. So if because all those uh, components of the ExoPlayer library and hopefully also your application only rely on the player interface, you can exchange this local playback with remote playback quite easily. You can also have a look at the cost demo application, which we added to our GitHub repository. And we have also a blog post on media, on Medium, which shows you how to set up the cost parts uh, for your application. OK, great. Thank you, Mark. Um, so all that remains, really, uh, is to provide you with a link to the branch, which has uh, the code that we've written today, or at least it will be very similar to the code we've written today. Um, and please go and check that out and try it out. Uh, you'll actually be able to try the download functionality by putting your device into flight mode and making sure that it plays it back, which we can't do now. Um, so please check that out. We have an office hour session today at 3.30. Um, please come along if you've got questions. Um, lots of members of the team will be there, and we'd be delighted to meet you and find out about what you're doing with ExoPlayer and how we can help you with that. This is a link to our GitHub project, uh, if, you, if you haven't seen that before. We have a developer guide, which takes you through the process of getting started with ExoPlayer at a slightly slower pace, and it helps to explain some of the background. Um, and finally, as uh, Mark alluded to, we also have a blog on Medium, where members of the ExoPlayer team are writing blog posts about new functionality that we're working on. So please do check that out and subscribe. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. was about dynamic app bundles, but I think there's another video on that, so I'm going to lead people to do their own research on that. Um, something else that was big was slices and actions. So both of these are ways of propagating intents that your application can take care of um, deeply in other applications. So you can propagate this information in a way that maybe the assistant or search can take advantage of that. And perform that action uh, via like a button, right? So it can say, oh, I can, I can handle this. You put it in an actions.xml file, and then search or some application assistant, whatever, can uh, propagate a button into the UI so the user can click on that to perform that deep action. Slices is kind of like that. It allows you to perform these actions, but with a 
a much richer UI. Basically, it's a way for an application to propagate rich UI to perform all kinds of things in another process. Um, you can think of it as related to remote views, but way better. Uh, so that's that. Sorry, that's that's exposed in limited ways right now, but we'll probably be building on that in, in more interesting ways. And there's APIs for developers to take advantage of that. How about the battery? Is there anything else finally for battery? How about that battery? Well, we are all power users, unfortunately, which means we need to keep working on things that we can do at a, at a platform level to preserve battery for users to get longer battery life. A couple of the things that are interesting that are going on in this release uh, includes app standby buckets. Um, so we determine the level of activity that a user has with an application, and based on that activity level, we expose capabilities of the platform to that application or not. It may not be appropriate for an application that the user hasn't actually run for a while to be taking up CPU and battery doing this thing in the background that probably the user didn't want them to be doing. Uh, so that's one thing. Another is uh, background restrictions. So if we notice that applications have bad behavior characteristics, things like holding wake locks for a very long period, which means the, the system can't go to sleep, or waking up frequently, or using services when they're not on power that they shouldn't be as frequently as they are, then they'll be propagated into a list that the user can see through settings and then disable background capabilities for that app to make sure that the user has control of how much battery is being used. Okay, cool, so we covered slices, battery, anything else exciting in P? Uh, well, there's exciting and there's necessary. Um, one of the necessary things that's there is that we're preventing applications from calling private APIs. Uh, it is possible now to call APIs which are not in the public platform, but through Reflection or JNI, you can get to these methods anyway. And we allow that because we didn't have a way to really stop that. You can sort of query this and go for it. Well, now in the ART runtime, we can detect that you are calling these methods from an application when they shouldn't be and we can prevent that. So in the preview release, which we encourage everybody to pick up and play with, we have these methods in a light gray or dark gray list, uh, which means that you're gonna get either a warning in the log or a toast popping up on the screen. So if your application is calling these and shouldn't be, you're gonna get a warning about it. But when that release comes out, it'll be on a blacklist and we'll simply stop it from being called. So the call to action would be go run with the preview release for key and make sure that your application is safe from these. Um, and if it's not, then either fix your application or if it is some facility that you absolutely need, then maybe it's something that we can work on and we can put it on a whitelist instead, but you need to tell us that information, which is why we have the preview, so give us that feedback. Okay, great. There's this Android no, 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 no. there, there. No, no, no. no? That's a totally different object. I think we need to talk oh. about text. Yeah, so what about text, text? Text happened in, in my larger toolkit team, so I understand that. Uh, in fact, you understand that. I want to ask you about text. So what happened in text? So in text, we released a few new APIs. Um, now you can pre-measure text. So this means that you can move all of that measuring work that takes quite a lot of time um, from rendering a character to a background thread. And, and why is that helpful? Well, because then the text is displayed faster. So faster rendering means less frames skipped. Sure. So it, it's also good because like, it, if it's time for you to display the text and then you have to measure it, it's not very helpful, but a lot of times you know ahead of time when you're going to need that, so you can actually ahead of time shove it off to a background thread so that by the time you need it, then you can display the text, which is awesome. What else we got? <laughs> we added a new feature for the user, the magnifier, yep. and we also added an API for that. So we now have three methods, uh, magnifier, show, update, and I think this miss. And this means that if you're developing your own custom views that also display text, you can also show that magnifier in your custom view. Also, it's not limited to text. That's the cool thing is we are using it for text because we wanted to make it easier for people to manipulate the cursor. But you can use it for whatever you want. If you need a zoomed in view, that API is general purpose. Okay, that's great. And I think we also added some more improvements on uh, Smart Linkify. Do you know more about that? I do. Smart Linkify is like Linkify, except it's smarter. Uh, so we already have the ability to 
uh, create links in a block of text for you if we detect things like phone numbers and addresses. That's been there forever. But now through machine learning models that we have on the system, which are used for things like smart text selection, we can detect more complex entities there. Uh, like you may select a word which is part of a larger phrase, which we detect because of this entity detection in the model. Um, you can ask Linkify to detect those as, uh, as entity links as well. Can I now go back to this? Because oh, it feels right. like it's looking over our shoulder. Ah, yes. OK. So, so what's with the Android with a jetpack? Um, well, that would be Android Jetpack. So Android Jetpack is a set of components as well as architectural guidance for helping developers build better Android applications. Uh, most, I would say all Android developers are familiar with a lot, of, a lot of what is in Android Jetpack already because we have taken all the goodness of support library and put it under this banner and we are going to continue to add to that specifically with the intent of making Android development better and easier. So I'll give you some examples. One of the big ones, <laughs> one of my favorite things about support library is AppCompat and the way that we baked in the uh, releases for certain APIs into the package names. So now we have package names like V4 and V9 with some of the APIs. We don't even support those releases anymore. So I think all of the existing developers don't even think about it. That's just noise at the top of their at, at the top of their file, right? It's one of those imports they never look at. But I think if you're new to Android or if you're looking at the documentation, I think it's terribly confusing. So we're doing a major refactor where we turn all those package names into Android X dot whatever to be a little more sensible. Major effort. Um, it will require refactoring on our side, a lot of it, um, but also on developers' sides, but we're giving tools in Android Studio to help with that. Um, the other part of it is uh, the existing architecture components are a big piece of it, things like lifecycle support and room, view model, uh, all of that stuff is good. Also the new paging library, which went uh, 1.0 this week, uh, paging and recycler view, and we have two new things. Actually, they're, they're to our sides here at the demo table. We have navigation controller and we have work manager. Navigation controller makes it easier to create the links of the flow of your application. Um, it, it makes things like up versus back easier. And we also have a tool in Android Studio where you can visualize this and create those links. Um, so it's sort of an integration of the APIs as well as the tool uh, for making this complex application flow a lot easier to develop. And then Work Manager is about an easier way for creating and executing background tasks. Um, so before we would recommend, well, Job Scheduler is really good for scheduling things at particular times, you know, when Wi-Fi is there, when you're charging, whatever. Um, and that works really well if you're on KitKat and above. What if you're on an earlier release? Well, we also have Job Dispatcher, uh, which is in the Play Services APIs. Well, what if you're on a device that doesn't have Play Services? Well, then you're probably rolling your own solution. So applications would need to do all three of these. Work Manager is an attempt to have a simpler, more elegant, fluent API for doing all this stuff that handles all of that for you. Okay, right, so lots of new things, both in uh, Android, but also with Jetpack. Jetpack. So check out all the videos that we have uh, from, from Google I.O. And also check out the documentation on developer.android.com. Thank you, Chet. Thank you, Florino. Android Jetpack is here to accelerate Android development by facilitating a modern app architecture, eliminating boilerplate code, simplifying complex tasks, and providing robust backwards compatibility. Jetpack consists of architectural guidance supported by a set of libraries and tools in four key areas of Android development, architecture, UI, behavior, and foundation. Each Jetpack component is individually adoptable, but are built to work well together. Jetpack builds on the popular architecture components we introduced last year. These components facilitate a highly testable, robust app architecture while individually addressing developer pain points, such as lifecycle management or data persistence. We've also added three new architecture components, Paging, Navigation, and Work Manager. Paging facilitates gradual on-demand data loading from a local or network data source, allowing apps to work with large data sets, including support for Recyperview. Navigation provides a framework to build app flows that comply with Android design guidelines, with proper behavior for up and back buttons, support for deep linking, 
automated fragment transactions, support for the overflow menu, navigation drawer, and bottom navigation. This is combined with a powerful graphical editor included in Android Studio to allow you to visualize, design, and test app navigation graphs. Work Manager makes it easy to schedule one-off or periodic asynchronous tasks. Tasks can execute in order, in parallel, or in even more complex configurations. It's also easy to query for the state of tasks and to provide constraints, such as requiring unmetered network or charging. Perhaps most importantly, Work Manager takes care of compatibility issues, so you know that no matter what platform the user is on, tasks are scheduled efficiently and with system-wide health in mind. UI components like animation, transitions, layouts, such as constraint layout, text, emoji, and fragments, along with the TV Leanback library, the Where UI library, and the Auto library, are now part of Jetpack. Behavior includes support for evolving Android areas such as notifications, permissions, and sharing. Jetpack adds support for slices, which allow your app to expose templatized pieces of itself to integrate with other apps, such as Google Search and Assistant. Foundation includes AppCompat, libraries for automated testing, and new Android KTX Kotlin extensions, which make Android development with Kotlin more concise, idiomatic, and modern. And we're just getting started with Android Jetpack. We have a roadmap of useful libraries and tools in development to help your Android projects take flight. To get started, check out developer.android.com slash jetpack.
Hello, everyone. My name is Eiji. I'm a developer advocate uh, working on the web at Google. Um, so today's session is about what's new with Synapse and Synim on the web. Are you enjoying Google I.O. so far? We only have, yeah. We only have a few hours left for uh, rest of Google I.O., but um, I'm pretty sure we'll be excited to learn uh, new things from this session. OK, so I need to have this clicker. <laughs> so let me start with this question uh, for you. What makes good sign up and sign in? We consider there are three principles. First, good security. Sign in is uh, the imp most important gatekeeper for a website to protect users' information from uh, abusive behaviors and attackers. Building a website with a vulnerable sign-in uh, sign mechanism means giving attackers a chance to abuse your website, and in the worst case, it critically damages your business. So building your website with first-class security is quite important. But that doesn't mean that you can sacrifice user experience. In many cases, adding better security it creates more obstacles and brings more friction for your users to enter your, web your website. Thinking about users' user-first web experience, you should make sure logging into your website is as seamless as possible uh, while having good security. And finally, Good sign up and sign in are often overlooked as a critical part of user flow. Developers tend to be more excited about new ideas and innovative features and pay less attention to make their sign up and sign in secure and low friction. That's why it's important that building them is easy enough and low cost. With that in mind, today we'll cover three topics. One tap sign up and auto sign in, recaptcha v3, and web authentication. Let's get started. Implementing sign up and sign in securely using username and password is challenging. I'm not saying that it's technically impossible, but the user's safety heavily relies on how they create their own passwords. Their passwords could be weak, forgotten, reused, or stolen. Balash is going to explain more about this, uh, these challenges later in this session. But this is why we've been recommending uh, Identity Federation for many years. Identity Federation is a way for users to sign up or sign in using an account hosted on a third-party website, which is called Identity Provider. Identity Federation is usually built upon standards called uh, such as OpenID Connect or OAuth. With Identity Federation, users do not need to create additional passwords. You can delegate security challenges to an identity provider, and you can receive profile information from that identity provider. And as many of you know, Google is one of such identity providers. You can already take advantage of Google sign in button to enable identity federation on your website. And at Google I.O. last year, I briefly talked about a JavaScript library that makes sign up e easier. And at Chrome Dev Summit last year, we've officially announced it as uh, one tap sign up and auto sign in. It's a new user experience for identity federation with Google that allows users to sign up with just one tap. We have a number of partners already on board or implementing with this library, and they're producing amazing results. Let me briefly talk about a few of them. Redfin, a real estate company in the US, saw an 80% increase in signups after implementing one tap sign up. Also, over 40% of these new users return to their website more than five times after signing up. 
Trivago is one of the world's leading hotel search engines operating in 55 countries. It gained 50% more new signups with twice as many signed in users after implementing this library. Sixth Flag Club, Letras, and Parco, popular music sites in Brazil for chords, lyrics, and songs, got 43 times more users signing up after integrating OneTap sign up. This is not a typo. I said 43 times, which means 4,300% more users. That's an incredible number. And user engagement, such as favoriting artists, uh, creating playlists, or commenting, liking chords, has also increased almost 50% per user. This is impressive. So here's how it works. The user, operates, uh, user opens the sign-up page, selects one of the Google accounts, and they're signed up. It's just that. It takes less than 10 seconds. The animation on the slide might be uh, too quick to catch up what's going on, but it's actually that easy. One tap sign up is revolutionary because, on top of those benefits that I have briefly mentioned earlier in this session uh, for identity federation in general, it's completely passwordless and requires only one tap for users to sign up. No email verification is required. Think about it. You have to open up email client, find the right email, and clicking a link in that email. It's a kind of a hassle, right? You can completely eliminate that step from the user. It's a big deal. And third, it works across modern, all modern browsers. Using this API is quite simple. Start with loading this JavaScript library. Once it's loaded, show a sign up layout by calling this method, googleyellow.hint, and it will show an account chooser. You need to create a client ID at Google Developer Console in advance. Note that since this is a powerful API, we are reviewing sites that are making use of this library. Once a user taps on one of the accounts, the promise will resolve, and you will receive a result that contains an ID token. Use the ID token to verify uh, the user's identity on your server. If you already have a Google sign-in backend, you can reuse it. Once the ID token is verified, extract the user's profile information and establish a new session. And the user is signed up. As a bonus, when the user session expires or the user lands on your website from a different device, you can let, them, uh, let, you can let the user sign back in automatically. To perform auto sign in, just call googleyellow.retrieve Google to obtain the user's ID token. Then you can use the ID token to let the user sign back in and resume the session. By the way, uh, you might have heard about an API called the Credential Management API. It's an open web API to handle credentials using JavaScript. The OneTap library actually uses this uh, credential management API behind the scenes if the browser supports it, and there is a stored password for the website. If you want to retrieve an existing password, add Google Yellow ID and password. It will give you a username and password instead of an ID token, so you can use that information to authenticate the user. When, you, when a user clicks the sign out button, the user probably wants to keep signed out. In that case, call googleyellow.disable auto sign in. That way, googleyellow.retrieve will stop returning ID token until the user explicitly uh, signs back in. So that's the one tap sign up. Let me recap. One tap sign up is secure because it's Google's identity federation. It provides a great user experience for users to sign up with just one tap and auto sign in. It's easy to implement with simple, simple APIs. To learn more about one tap sign up, please visit developers.google.com slash identity. And you'll find more detailed documentation. 
Okay, so far, I've been talking about identity federation. But I guess that many of you might be interested in some solutions about uh, when you are using password, uh, username and password. Earlier in this session, I talked about challenges with passwords. What can you do if an attacker already knows your user's password and tries to hijack account? And in many cases, account hijacking is done by bots. This means if you could filter out bots, the number of account hijacks should decrease. And that's what recapture does. Six years ago, it asked users to read a distorted text like this. But we knew we could do better. We then developed recapture v2, where users can simply tap a checkbox to verify. v2 is smart enough to determine if an in interaction is abusive just with that simple gesture. And if recapture is still uncertain, it asks an additional challenge, like select all images with a street sign. This is an example. Uh, this is an example question many bots cannot answer easily. And we are protecting over 2 million websites every week from spam and abuse. But bots evolve also. The attacks against recapture over the last few years, last several years, have evolved from brute force or random guest bots to a smarter and even AI best bots. They began to bring machine learning solutions and abusive humans to try to break these challenges and attack websites. But we want to stop bots whether or not they can find the street signs uh, in a set of images. Today, we are announcing public beta of recapture v3. This new version comes with three new things at a high level. First, it requires no interactive challenges. Two, it scores traffic with the adaptive risk analysis engine. And third, it breaks down your traffic by action. Let me walk you through each one. In v3, Recaptcha detects whether an interaction with your website is abusive without even a single tap. This means you can keep your website with safe without interact, uh, interrupting any users. And instead of simple yes or no answer, it will give you a score which ranges from 0 to 1.0. The score is calculated by the Recaptcha Adaptive Risk Analysis Engine, and the signals from interactions with your website. Based on the score, you, will, you can define your own threshold to determine whether you, you should do further verification on the request. Let's say you get a login request with a barely low score of 0.2. In that case, for example, you can request an additional authentication factor, such as email verification. Or send an email to an admin to ask for moderation. Or throttle search requests from bots as a protection from scraping. To use recapture, first, load the JavaScript library. When the user submits a form, request a recapture token. And finally, submit the form along with the obtained token. One nice thing about V3 is that it enables you to put it into almost all parts of your website, not only the sign-up page, but also many other places. For example, from home page to reading posts, logins, adding comments, and such. Wherever your website has potentially risky actions, you can protect with recapture. To do so, you can define a tag for each action. Actions will also become a signal into the adaptive risk analysis engine. As a result, you can treat scores differently depending on the actions. Also, you can see the traffic breakdown and score distribution per action in the recapture admin console. So that's recapture v3. Let me recap. 
Recaptcha v3 makes your website more secure by stopping bots. It doesn't require user gesture by eliminating challenges, so there's zero friction. It gives you the flexibility as to how you want to treat suspicious traffic. To learn more about Recaptcha v3, please visit g.co slash, uh, slash Recaptcha v3 IO. OK, I've been talking about two large features from Google. But I'd like to make a transition to talk about Open Web API, the Credential Management API. I briefly, I briefly talked about it earlier in this session. As I said, once up sign up contains a Credential Management API. But as it focuses on identity federation with Google, if you choose to use other identity options, such as Username and password, you should use Credential Management API. We have already covered this topic at Google I.O. last year. So let me quickly re recap. It's an open web API that allows you to handle credentials using JavaScript. With this API, you can enable things like auto sign in or sign in with browser's native account chooser. It can handle two different types of credentials. Password credential and federated credential. And now we have a new type of credential being added to this API, which is called public key credential. With that, let me invite Balash to talk about web authentication. Thank you, AJ. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Balash. I'm a software engineer on the Chrome Web Identity team. And AJ already mentioned that passwords create a number of issues. I would, like a little, I would like to talk a little bit more about two of them in particular. The first one is password reuse. When your users are using the same password on multiple different websites. And the second one is phishing. When attackers trick your users into entering their credentials into fake websites. Historically, these issues have been really hard for developers to address because they both have to do with your users being only human. So suppose one of your user, users, let's call her Jane Doe, has accounts on 50 different websites. What do you think? On how many other websites is Jane using the same password that she is using on your site? To answer that question, we've calculated some statistics client-side among Chrome Password Manager users. And if Jane is anything like them, she will be reusing that password on 10 different websites. That's 20% of all her accounts. What does that mean? It means that if Jane's password is compromised on any one of those 10 websites, it's compromised on all of them, including yours. So how often does this happen? According to another study, during a period of just one year, data breaches exposed a total of 1.9 billion usernames and passwords. So this means that even if you have implemented all the password management best practices, for instance, you serve your login page and preferably your entire website over HTTPS, you never store or log plain text passwords. You always hash passwords. And maybe you do even more. You are still not done. So suppose you are using two-factor authentication. To log in, Jane has to enter her password plus an OTP a one-time password, for instance, a six-digit number that she receives to her phone. Surely, Jane is safe now, right? Well, unfortunately, OTPs are fished just as easily as passwords. Let me show you what happens. As soon as Jane enters her password into the phishing page, the attacker connects to the real website and initiates a login flow using the freshly stolen password. The real website asks the attacker for the OTP. The attacker, in turn, asks Jane. In the meantime, the six-digit number is sent over SMS to Jane's phone. Jane is under the impression that she's logging into the real website, so she expects that she gets asked for the one-time password. So as soon as it arrives, she enters it into the phishing page. 
the attacker then simply forwards the OTP to the real website, and with that, they just gained access to Jane's account. Similar attacks are possible if Jane is using time-based OTPs generated by an app on her phone or a hardware token, or if to sign in, Jane has to confirm that login attempt on her mobile device. The problem is that in all of these cases, we rely on, we rely on Jane, a human, to recognize when she is not on the real website, but on a phishing page. Remember the study from before? It also estimates that around 12.4 million users fell victim to phishing during the same one-year period. This is why last year at I.O., we recommended using security keys instead. Many of you are familiar with the U2F universal second factor security keys that look like this. Some of you may even be using them for two-factor verification already. The main, main, the main advantage of security keys over OTPs is that they cannot be fooled by phishing. Security keys talk directly to the browser. They can easily verify that the URL of the page that Jane is visiting is the legitimate URL and not a slightly different URL corresponding to a phishing site. So this removes the human error factor. It is no longer Jane's burden to verify the URL. But if security keys are so awesome, how come we aren't all using them on every website already today? Unfortunately, a key piece of the puzzle had been missing. Previously, there hadn't been a good way to access security keys on the web. Some of you are already familiar with the U2F JavaScript API, which was a great first step, but it also had a number of limitations. For instance, it wasn't available across all browsers. And this is why I'm super excited about the Web Authentication API, which is a brand new web platform API that provides a standardized way for using strong authentication on the web. The new API is coming to major browsers and will be available on both mobile and desktop platforms. And in fact, I'm delighted to announce that you can already try out the initial feature set with the latest Chrome beta. So let's see what makes this API so great. First, it's backwards compatible with existing U2F security keys. The very same key that you registered through the U2F API can now be used through the Web Authentication API. That means that you can migrate your site from U2F to WebAuthn without any user visible changes. But WebAuthn is much more than just a new API. WebAuthn also enables authenticators that come in a wide variety of form factors much more exciting than USB hardware tokens. So if hardware tokens are not your cup of tea, don't fall asleep just yet. WebAuthn also brings many new features that enable exciting new use cases. The single most important feature is probably that authenticators can now perform user verification. This means that the authenticator can locally verify the user. If Jane drops uh, her authenticator on the street, you cannot just pick it up and use it. It only responds to Jane. User verification can take many forms. It can be done using biometrics, such as a fingerprint scan, or an easy-to-remember PIN code. And we are not only talking about external hardware tokens. With WebAuthn, the built-in fingerprint reader in your notebook or phone can also become a user-verifying authenticator. Regardless of phone form factor, what makes user-verifying authenticators so interesting is that they do not need to be combined with passwords to implement two-factor authentication. There is already something that you have and something that you are. So you get great security. And you also get a great user experience. You no longer have to type your password, which is especially frustrating on mobile devices. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Can we switch to the demo device, please? Suppose that I'm browsing the web and I find something I want to buy. I have with me here a Pixel 2 phone with a fingerprint sensor. So suppose I have this camera cleaning kit that's really nice, and that's a really good deal for just 10 cents. So I add it to my cart. Then I go to check out.
and then I choose to complete my checkout with PayPal. I get redirected to PayPal, and because PayPal supports the web authentication API, I can easily verify my identity using just my fingerprint. Sorry. I select the credit card, the shipping address, then I get redirected back to the merchant. And there, my order is confirmed. So I didn't have to type a password, and it was still secure. And it was so much better a user experience. Back to the slides, please. So how does that all work? First, let's take a look at how authenticators work in the first place. All WebAuthn authenticators use public key cryptography. There is a one-time setup flow during which the user registers an authenticator with an account. During registration, the authenticator generates a new public-private key pair. The private key is stored locally and cannot be extracted from the authenticator. The public key is sent to the server. Then every time the user wants to authenticate, they have to prove to the website that they possess the private key. This is done through a challenge response-based protocol. The web server sends a challenge to the authenticator, which in turn uses the private key to provide a cryptographic signature for this challenge. The signature is sent to the web server, which verifies it against the public key and the challenge. With user verifying authenticators, releasing this signature is also gated on successful user verification, such as a fingerprint scan. So your fingerprint never leaves the device. It's only used to locally unlock the authenticator. So now let me walk you through the one-type setup flow in more detail. You did, not see in the, you did not see this in the demo, because I already did this last week. There are three important participants in this flow. The authenticator itself, the web application running in the browser, and the web server. Suppose that it is once again Jane, who is now setting up the fingerprint reader in her phone as an authenticator. To kick off the registration flow, the server first generates a challenge a large random number that will be only used for the registration process and thrown away later. The server stores the challenge in association with the user account and transmits it along with user information to the web app running in the browser. The web app then calls the Web Authentication API. This is what it looks like in code. As AG mentioned, WebAuthn extends the Credential Management API, so it's available under navigator.credentials. To create a new public key credential, you call create with the public key option. You specify the challenge you received from the server, user information that will be displayed on the authenticator if it has a display, and the crypto algorithms that you wish to use. In addition to these parameters that we just specified, the browser also extracts the authoritative domain name of the calling web application. Then, all this information is sent to the authenticator, which asks for user consent. This is required so that malicious websites cannot use the API to track the user. This protects the user's privacy. Once user consent is given, the authenticator generates a new public-private key pair. It stores the private key internally, along with the credential ID, user information, and importantly, the domain name this credential belongs to. Then, the API call is resolved, resolved with the public key credential, which contains the unique identifier, the public key, and the signature calculated over the challenge, the domain name, the public key, the credential ID, and some other parameters. The web app then forwards these values to the server. There, you need to validate the signature. And as a last step, uh, if the signature checks out, the server has to store the credential ID and the public key in association with the user account. And don't forget to invalidate the challenge. It's only valid for one transaction. 
This concludes the registration flow. And remember, you only have to do this once. Now let's take a closer look at how Jane can use the authenticator to log in without a password next time. The starting state here is that the authenticator already has a private key, and the server has the corresponding public key in association with Jane's account. Remember that authentication is performed using a challenge response-based protocol where Jane calculates a cryptographic signature to prove possession of the private key. So once again, the flow starts with the server generating a challenge, a large random number which is used to prevent replay attacks. Then the server transmits the credential ID and the challenge to the web application, which in turn calls the web authentication API. Again, to create a cryptographic signature, you need to call navigator credentials.get with the public key option. You specify the challenge that you received from the server, the credential for which you want to get a cryptographic signature, and here you see that we also ask the authenticator to locally verify the user. In addition to these parameters that we just specified, once again, the browser extracts the authoritative domain name of the calling web application and sends all this information to the authenticator. The authenticator looks up information stored for this credential ID. Next, and this is very important, the authenticator checks that the domain name of the calling website matches the one that was provided at the time the credential was created. This is what makes th these authenticators resistant to phishing. If Jane is on a phishing page with a slightly different URL, the authenticator will notice the discrepancy. So next, if it is indeed the real website, the authenticator performs local verification using the fingerprint reader. If the fingerprint checks out, the authenticator uses the private key to generate a cryptographic signature over the domain name and the challenge. The API call is then resolved with the signature, which is sent to the server. There, once again, it is verified that it corresponds to the challenge and the public key. And if it does, then the server consider uh, Jane's authentication uh, successful. And as a last step, again, don't forget to invalidate the challenge. And this concludes the registration, uh, sorry, the authentication flow. But if you have dealt with a large user base, you know that you cannot just replace your identity management overnight. What's also great about WebAuthn is that it enables to you to adopt it one step at a time. You can use more and more of the API to get more and more of the security and usability benefits. First, you can use it as a drop-in replacement for the U2F API for second-factor authentication. Then, with minimal changes, you can implement passwordless reauthentication before sensitive operations, such as making a purchase. For instance, this can be done using the fingerprint reader built into a phone or a mobile device. And finally, once your users warm up to the idea of signing in using a fingerprint or a hardware token, you might even consider making it their primary login mechanism. So to summarize, we talked about the Web Authentication API, which provides strong authentication on the web using public key cryptography. It brings new features and form factors that enable a passwordless login experience, making it very easy for your users to sign into your site securely. And it all comes in the form of a simple to use, standardized open web platform API, which is available across all platforms and browsers. With that, let me hand it back to AG to wrap it up. OK. Thank you, Bash. So we've been walking through three new exciting features to the web. One tap sign up and auto sign in for ultimately low friction signing up and signing in. Recapture v3 for zero friction bot prevention. And web authentication for stronger authentication with open standard API. I have just tweeted with hashtag IO18, but we have published an article about it. By now, you should have understood what makes good sign up and good sign in. Great security, great user experience, and great developer experience. 
If you have any questions, please visit us, the web sandbox, which is right next door. Uh, and finally, we'd love your feedback on our session today uh, at google.com slash IO schedule. With that, we hope you enjoyed our talk. Thank you very much. geometry, all of these things, math, science, it's all around us constantly. So it was really easy at some point to start just looking just into nature because it's, it is science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is technology. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like the way everything works. So looking beyond the, the hardware and the finish of the hardware of it and the, into the or, organic nature of it all. That, that's a, like a little dive into how <laughs> it went. <laughs> it must have been a very full 14 months working on this film. Beyond. We were on three continents. We were in two states. And I had a team at any given moment that were 500 strong um, just in my department. So we went 14 months. And we went uh, hard as we could go for 14 months to get this done. and and put every last, like my whole team put every last inch of themselves. So, you know, it was a beautiful thing because we, we represented the diaspora, just our crew. So it was a micro version of the macro that we were building in Wakanda. And I lived that every single day for a little over a year. All right, I want to ask you about what's next, but it doesn't have to be specific projects. But it's like, where do you go from here with everything that you've talked about, right? Like the, the production design itself, but like the bigger themes and ideas that you're working on. Uh, you know, i ch challenging myself, I think, to try to continue to do things that are out of my comfort zone. Something I learned from Ryan Coogler, who has taken me from Fruitvale Station to a boxing movie Creed to a comic book movie Black Panther. I want to continue the trend on my own and not just be in a place that I feel comfortable. My next project with Melina Matsuko, who is a director um, for Insecure, we're doing, I'm, I'm just working on the pilot for Why the Last Man, which is a graphic novel. Yes, I've read the entire series. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so I'm going to be designing the um, pilot. We're working on that currently. I can't really say much more than that, but it's super <laughs> exciting. The script is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and our approach to it is going to be, I think, something really cool. So I'm really super excited about that. Worked with Beyonce again. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the future is... Um, wide open and if Denis Villeneuve is uh, listening I'd love to do Dune. <laughs> yes. I throw that out every opportunity I can get. Denis? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah thank you so much for joining me and sharing your story and all the work that you do. Thank you so much it's super exciting I'm so happy to be here and uh, I think I'm gonna learn something today too so you know it's all about soaking in all this greatness so fabulous thank you. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. All the way up now. I can't imagine how anybody passes a problem that they know that they can fix and doesn't try to fix it. That's not some complicated thing. It's just stop talking about it and start doing it. I feel an absolute obligation to serve. I did two tours in Iraq as a helicopter pilot. I loved being part of the cavalry. But then I got injured, and that caused me to lose my ability to fly. One day you're a soldier, and then overnight they rip off that tag and slap veteran on your chest. I didn't know where to start looking for the next thing. What I do is math and engineering. So I had to find a way to apply those things in a meaningful way. The service doesn't end when you get out of the military, it just changes. And I started reading about the research that they were doing at the Human Engineering Research Lab. And I thought, man, I gotta go be a part of that. Hurl's mission is to help people with disabilities increase independence and quality of life. I prepare 
the software to support the research that we do. One of the big things that I've done is help us transition to using Android tools. They make things really accessible. Anybody can sit down and start using these technologies and perform the tasks that we hope that it'll be useful for. That's the right thing to do, is to make things not just able to be used, but to be used with the same sort of joy or ease as I do. A big part of why open technology is so attractive to engineers like myself is there such an active community of people designing and innovating. Welcome to Pittsburgh. <laughs> All three of my children have a disability. The fact that my son has autism is just one little part of him. But almost his entire existence is defined by that autism. There was part of me that hoped someday I'd be able to help my son be able to live independently and give him a future. That's part of why I became an engineer, it's part of why I get into this field. There's gonna be a time where someone like my son will have gotten a better opportunity, a better swing at this thing. I'm not gonna sit around and wait for somebody else to fix the problem. There's not a minute to be wasted thinking about anything but the good things that we can do.
I'm Elizabeth Churchill, and I head up research for material design. And I'm sure you've been hearing about a lot of the innovations that material has brought out recently here at I.O. And we've done a lot of research in the background to back up much of that innovation. And what we're going to do today is just tell you a little bit about some of that research. We're also going to encourage you to come and talk to us later, and we will be in Dome F, because we're interested in knowing how you're integrating research into your product and design system development. But before I get going, I want to know how many people out there consider themselves to be developers? Yay. Welcome. Thank you for coming. And how many consider themselves to be designers? And you might have multiple roles. Wonderful. This is great. Finally, researchers. Yay, research. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. One of the things we want to emphasize in this talk and that Material is extremely committed to is that we believe the tight collaboration between engineering and development between design and research really is the key to creating great user experiences. And by user experiences, I mean the users of the things that you build, but also you as users. Because in material, as you will see, and you've been hearing, we build products for you so that you can build great products for your users. So, I just wanted to go over a few things about material, which you may know, just to remind you. So the material design system is open source. It's adaptable. And it helps you bring high quality experiences to your users. And our aim is to help you make things that are beautiful, but that are usable and useful, and also, importantly, accessible. We're very committed to helping you do that. So material consists of components. And components are things like buttons, things like text fields, and things like tables. You're familiar with that. And at this I.O., we have brought material theming into the picture. And we've heard you, and we have responded, because we want to make all of these components customizable so that you can adapt them for your experience, so that you can have your brand and your look and feel for your users all the way through systematically from design to code. So that's very much a key part of our innovation. Material also consists of patterns, patterns like account switching, accessing settings, or handling empty states. All of this information, these components, these themes, and these patterns, roll up into guidance that you can see on our site, our spec. If you have not yet checked out material.io, please do so. Please go and have a look. Check out what we've got there and send us feedback. Because a great part of this talk is to remind you that we can shape great experiences for people with the help of folks like you. So we need your feedback. Material also, as I mentioned, has a suite of products and tools that are designed for you. One of them is here. This is Gallery. And Sarah is going to be talking about Gallery in a bit of detail later. Gallery has also been launched here at I.O. And again, we want your feedback. Gallery will allow you to take those components, those themes, and that guidance and turn it into reality. We're really building these tools to build this relationship and this collaboration, the deep collaboration between design and development. So just as a pause, this is the outline of the kinds of research we do in this team, in the material experience research team. The most granular research is on components, and Michael is going to be taking you through some of that. 
Here we look to make sure the components really are beautiful and usable and useful and accessible. The next level of research is the product research on things like gallery. And here again, we use interviews and observations, and we work with folks like you to make these tools great. Sarah's going to be taking you through some of that. Finally, we look at workflow. Where do all of these tools fit into your lives as designers and developers? How do you pull these together to accomplish the things you need? What is the bigger ecosystem of the idea to design, to develop, to iterate workflow? And again, we do interviews, we do behavioral studies, we observe folks in workplaces like where you work, we do surveys to try and understand where our tools fit in for you now, how we can improve them, and to start to think about where we need to go in the future as the whole field explores and innovates. And Sarah is going to help you with that. So with that said, from our studies with a few users to thousands of users, from our close studies as we talk to you to our surveys, we're going to give you a bit of a flavor of that today. And I would like to hand off to Michael, who's going to talk about components research. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction, Elizabeth. And once again, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael, and I lead up research on material system. So as Elizabeth mentioned, we do research on everything that covers the minor details of users' experience all the way up to the big picture. We look at everything from how things look on the web or on your mobile device to how those things come together to form an application or a brand or an experience. For today, I'm going to be focusing on two types of research that we've done, both examining the components of a design system. First, I'll go into some detail on the top-down experimental work that we've done, which looks into how the details of design can really impact how your users interact with your products. And second, I'll go through some of the bottom-up experiential research that we've done, focusing on those same components, but also aiming to understand how experiences come together in our products and what those experiences mean to our users. And by the end, I'm hoping to give everyone a better understanding about how we do some of the research here at Google, so you can take that back and do it within your own teams. But first, a little background on what I mean when I say components. Elizabeth already introduced some of the components, the patterns, and the guidelines available in material design. Here we have three examples of uh, abstractions of those components. And just to introduce them, on the left, we have the material fab, or the floating action button. This was introduced in the first iteration of material design. and since has become one of its more recognizable characteristics. In the center, we have the material text field. And this provides a core means for users to input content into applications. And on the right, material buttons, which provide a core means of interacting with content in applications. And you probably are all familiar with these already. But what I want to call out here is not that these components are necessarily unique or that they're earth-shatteringly critical to any one single interaction, but that these components are a fundamental part of a larger experience. And because of that, we want to make sure that we understand these components at a fundamental level. But for now, we're going to focus just on this first one, the material text field. So this is the text field that we started with. This was our baseline. This text field performed well, and it aligned with the original material vision. But there was an opportunity to make sure that it worked even better, that it worked across all devices, that it worked in both consumer and enterprise applications. 
And when you look at something like this, think of all the different parts that have to come together to make a text field. There's the underline that indicates where the field starts and where it stops. There's the label that hints at what might be typed in there. And there's the text itself once you've entered it. And of course, there's the shape of the entire component, how each of those individual parameters come together, and then how they're used on a page. So it's clear that even for a text field, there's a lot going on design-wise. But really, how many options could there be? Well, it turns out quite a lot. And as an aside, I'm not expecting everyone to read through the actual text on this slide. I just want to show a few of the details that we're considering here. So what we're looking at here is an exploration of label placement, as well as some of the possible values in consideration for label placement. But we also looked at things like background fill. We looked at different elements of style, different types of contrast. And of course, whether there should be squared or rounded borders. In the end, there were over 140 different variations that we looked at in a couple different contexts. First, we looked at simple forms, which had stub content that was procedurally drawn so that we could test a whole bunch of them. Second, we looked at real quote unquote forms, which were forms that we actually took from the wild and then inserted our experimental text fields. And then third, we looked at complex forms. And these are forms we hope you would never encounter you know, in nature. They're unreasonably complex, but we created them to see how each text field would perform in extreme circumstances. Would it stand out too much or would it get lost entirely? And we'll show examples of that one in a minute. But first, what does that look like? This is ultimately a tool that we created that would create each of those forms uh, with each of those text fields, randomly drawing the layout, the theme, and each of the characteristics that we had identified. We then deployed these forms in a set of large scale surveys so that we could test both the performance of every individual text field as well as get an idea of what users actually preferred. And on the right, you can see the admin interface for this tool that we built. And it's, it's simple, but it allows us to zero in on the types of designs that we want to research. And more importantly, it provides us with an artifact that we can share with the designers and developers who are creating and building these text fields. And maybe you're curious about the complex forms. Well, this is what I mean when I say complex forms. Uh, we don't condone their use in the wild, but this is just so you know the lengths designers will go to to make sure that every opportunity is explored. And they, re they really are something. Um, what we were able to do in the end was to create a way for people to interact with ideas rather than products. And to be clear, we weren't doing this research as a way of telling designers what products should look like. We were doing research as a way of working with designers to show them what parts seemed to work and what parts might require caution. To provide them with the tools that ultimately can allow us to more effectively bring our users into the conversation. And this is one example of what that conversation looks like. This is another, this is what the data actually is from those text field experiments. And without going into too many of the details, I want to show you how we were looking at all the possible text fields, every possible combination, without dropping any of those possibilities because the data says this or that. Each step that I'm showing you here involved a process of working with our team to explore the landscape and to provide our designers and engineers with the tools that they can use to create great products. And here I'm referring to research and the artifacts from research as one of those tools. 
And here is the before and after example of what just one text field might look like given this approach. Because ultimately what we aim to do is to support design that is more usable, more useful, more beautiful, and importantly more customizable. Especially with today's enhanced material design system and the introduction of material theming we want to emphasize that the components are customizable and that within that customizability, we've done the legwork to make sure that those components will still work the way that they, they should. And importantly, that they'll still look the way that you want them to. So that's a quick look at some of what we've done with the material text field. But let's take a look at the fab and the button next. At the beginning, I mentioned that we'd be looking at both the top-down experimental research that we'd done, as well as the bottom-up experiential research. And this may look familiar to many of you, this bottom-up research. It usually involves sitting down with your users across a table, sometimes in something like usability studies, sometimes in things like interviews. And frequently, it looks a lot like just a normal conversation. But what we try to do as researchers is to make sure that we're asking the right questions. And that's not always, how long does it take 10,000 users to click on this? Sometimes what we want to know more about is how the users think and feel about our products and about interactions. Because material design is about the performance and the usability of components, but it is also about that look and that feel. So next, I'm going to show three examples to give you a sense about how users feel about these components and what that means for our design. So this first example is from a study participant who is interacting with the new material button. And she said, when the boxes are really bolded like that, it makes you feel like you're actually pressing a button. And sometimes something like this that happens in the middle of these interviews will make you actually take a step back and ask yourself, what is a button really? And, and really, what should a button look like if we define it by how it feels when we press it? Or what should a button look like if it's trustworthy? And these aren't just strictly questions for fun, either. There is an entire landscape of what, a, what buttons might look like, of what they might be, of what is buttony. And part of the research we get to do is to better understand that landscape. And we get to do that by talking with our users. And the second example is from a study participant who was interacting with the Google Material-themed fab shown here. And she said, the last time I looked at your email app, it didn't look as googly as this. And I love this because when we actually talk to our users, we learn about more than just the components. We learn about more than just the interactions or the products. And in this example, we can clearly see how design can impact brand. But we get a better sense from the user's own perspective about what seems to jump out at them. And in the end, we can speak more effectively about the meaningful characteristics of brand with the designers and the developers who are building these. And this last example is a quote from a study participant who could use assistive devices to see, but he was actually legally blind. And he was interacting with the Google Material-themed extended fab shown on the bottom. He said, it actually jumps out a little bit more, even without the color. It pops out. It just seems more obvious what's going on there. And I think this is one of the main strengths of actually sitting down and talking with our users. In the same way we want to explore 
how a hundred different text fields can be implemented in a hundred different ways. We want to see how these components in our products are encountered by all our users. It's a different way of looking at the exact same landscape. To wrap things up, I've shown you a brief look at how we've approached a couple different types of research. First, looking at the material text field from the top down, experimentally. And second, looking at the fab and the button from the bottom up. I'm hoping you can see some of the simil similarities of these two approaches. On the one hand, we are aiming to better understand a whole range of possible expression to better support the brilliant designers and engineers who are building material design. And on the other hand, we are aiming to better support our users to make sure that each component is usable, is useful, is beautiful, no matter how it's used or by who. And last, again, I'm hoping you might be able to take some of the ideas we've talked about here to be able to do research within your own teams. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and welcome Sarah to the stage, who's going to be talking a little bit about designer and developer research. Thank you, Michael. So as Michael said, I'm Sarah, and I lead research for material product. And what we do is create products and tools, resources for designers and developers just like you. So Michael shared with you how we do research with our end users so that we can really understand how to make our components most effective. But you are our end users too. And designers and developers is where I put my energy to understanding our products and how you're using them to make them better. So what I'm going to talk about is the other two types of research Elizabeth mentioned, the workflow research and product research. And I'll give you examples of how products that have launched here at I.O. have been made better through our research. So let's start with workflow research. This gives us a really big, broad picture for how people creating digital tools, people like you, how you're doing your work day in and day out. Usually how this looks is I'll interview ideally designers and developers who work together. I'll go to your office. I'll talk to you about how you're working. I want to know all the tools you're using, who you're collaborating with, and especially anything that's a problem in your workflow. And our goal with this kind of research is to get a big picture of the bigger problems that affect a lot of people so we can prioritize building tools that solve those problems for you. So this example is from workflow research we did with designers and developers that work together. Like I said, we went to their offices. And one of the things we had them do is take us through a recent project from beginning to end. We had them walk us through every part of the project, who they worked with, what the tools they were using, and especially anything that was a struggle. So here's a couple of examples of how people think about their work. You can see people look at their work in really different ways. Whenever I do this kind of research, I want my developer, designer, and product manager colleagues working on those products to come with me, because everyone hears different things, and different things pop out at them during the interviews. So we always do a debrief where we compare notes on what we heard and what was interesting or surprising. And because this research was really focused on understanding the UX design process itself, we were going to be doing a timeline of a typical UX design project. And so I had my colleagues uh, categorizing the different phases that they heard the people we talked to went through. So let me show you what this turned into. This is a UX design workflow. Uh, it's also known as a journey map or experience map. But what we ended up with was six phases for the design process. Discovery, initial design, iterating on the design, validating, beginning building, and then the final implementation. And I'll explain the structure first, and then I'll come around and 
fill in some details. So below that in the green to red are a single positive and a negative key moment in each phase. And those were from stories we literally heard from the participants we talked to that were either really meaningful or were a pattern we heard several people talk about. And then at the bottom, we had the tasks, pain points, and tools. And this gave us a really rich range of experiences that we heard different people using. Now, I took that out to just simplify it to show you, but that whole thing is a big poster that hangs in our office. So for instance, thinking about the, uh, the key moments, often we heard people get really excited when they're starting a new project. There's a lot of promise and potential, but they quickly get overwhelmed by scope or scope creep, so that becomes a negative moment. And as you might imagine, there's a lot of interplay between designers and developers here. Uh, the first one is when, in the initial design phase, when a designer is really excited about an idea they have and they have to go to their developer and the developer says to them, this, we cannot build this. The technical constraints make this impossible. So has anybody here ever had one of those conversations? Okay, all right, that's good that we're resonating with, uh, with your experiences as well. But of course, there's positive interactions between designers and developers throughout this process. We definitely have heard that designers do not enjoy making design specs for handing a project off to a developer. But when that moment comes where they get to hand off formally to a developer, that's usually a milestone, a really positive milestone in a project. So that's positive. And it can go south again, because what happens often is that developers uh, come back later with unexpected problems due to legacy code, and the designers have to step back in often after they've already moved on to another project. So again, is this resonating? Anybody had this happen? OK, all right. So the whole point of doing this kind of really deep dive into understanding the practices, again, is to surface those problems that affect a lot of people so we can prioritize building them. And I just want to take a minute and define, I've mentioned design specs, and I'll talk about it more in a minute. But when I say design specs, what I mean are the margins, guidelines, colors, fonts, and often even behaviors that designers give to developers when they're getting ready to implement a design. So another thing that came out of that research is pain points of designers and developers. And I'll go through these with you. So the key pain points we heard from designers are having to aggregate feedback from a lot of different stakeholders. Often the feedback is living in different tools. Having to prototype motion but not having time to do it. Having to keep track of different project resources that they're going to need at different phases of the design process that often are living in different places. Now remember this because I'll show you a solution that we came up with for this in gallery. Um, creating design specs, as I mentioned, and then having to share design assets across their team and keep them consistent. Top pain points we heard for developers was having to solve for edge cases and often responsiveness from a singular happy path that they're getting from their designer. Getting incomplete design specs or getting ones that are wrong or not getting them at all. F F absolutely have heard that one a lot as well. When you have to create a new component, trying to figure out, am I going to customize something that's existing or build something new from scratch? Getting design changes late after you've started working, leading to rework, and finally, having a lack of context of what the intent was with a design, so not knowing what really matters. So you'll notice with this kind of uh, list that both pain designers and developers both found design specs as a real pain point. So it was this kind of research that let us realize what a problem this is for both roles and let us prioritize building a tool that solves this problem. And that project is, as Elizabeth mentioned, is Gallery. And I'm going to tell you more about Gallery in a minute. But before I do, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the other type of research I mentioned product research. And this is really just a big bucket for any time we show you something that we want to get your feedback on. It may be a really early stage idea that we just want to validate and make sure the concept is sound, or maybe it's a refinement of a product we've already invested a lot of time in, and we just want to make sure that it's really functioning well for how you want to use it. 
So a lot of people call this usability, but for us, this type of research is doing so much more than just telling us if a product is usable. So, and also let me walk you through a little bit about how I conduct research when I'm doing product research with designers and developers. So this is one of our research labs on the left. Usually I'll bring somebody into our lab. I'm meeting with them one-on-one. -on -one. It's streaming to a room that my designer, developer, and product manager colleagues are sitting in, like the one on the left. And I'll walk you through some kind of prototype or beta tool and getting your feedback as we go along. Like, what do you like? What's confusing? And especially at the end, I want to know, how does this fit into your existing workflow? Is this going to solve any problems for you? And then after all that is done, go back in, talk to my colleagues, and we figure out what was really interesting here. What can we take from this that we can use to make our products better? So now I've told you a little bit about how this process works. Let me walk you through an example of something we learned when we were doing research with Gallery and how that made it better for the final product. So has anybody seen a demo of Gallery in the uh, our, OK, just a couple folks, and let me walk you through. So this is a project page in Gallery. And also let me just uh, give an overview. Gallery is an online collaborative tool that lets designers share their designs with other colleagues, get feedback. And it also has a design specs feature where they can get the, um, the metadata from the sketch goes into an online way for developers to get that, the code and the values. And then the developers also have an access to material components in that gallery feature if they're using the material components when they're designing. And it's being demoed in, in Dome F over there, if you want to check it out. So we're in a, a project called Pause Vibes. There's a little description of the project at the top. The colored rectangles are a way for designers to collect the, the links that they're going to need at different stages of the project. So as I mentioned, we were solving one of the problems we uncovered in the research with that one. And then below that are basically folders, and people can organize them however they want. And in this case, they're organized by the device that it's being designed for. So let's say you clicked into the tablet view from here. You would see all the screens that are in that tablet. And if you clicked into the first screen, then you're going to see that screen in more detail. Now, at the yellow box at the top, you can see all the different things you can do from here. You can comment, inspect, you can share it. But what's happening here is someone has rolled over the type at the top, and you can see it's got the, the, the typeface, the weight, the color. All that stuff is right there for the developer to access. So that's how it looks now. And let me show you something that we were uh, getting feedback on a couple months ago when we did some research on it. So this looks a little bit different because it's the older mock, but you can see it's basically the same thing. So in the study, what we did is we were talking to designers, we had them use our new material theme editor, which is, I hope you've heard about the, the material plugin we have for Sketch. And that has, gives them access to all these pre-built material components where they can customize for their own brand. So that uh, the one in the, the green bar, the green bottom app bar, had, they had customized that in Sketch and changed the color and changed one of the icons in there. And then they had uploaded that to Gallery, where they were looking at what they would be sharing with their developers. So we were wanting to know, you know, what do you think of this? And what we heard from them, as you can see here, when you roll over that bottom app bar, what you're getting is the link to the code and the specs for that, but you're not getting any more granular information beyond the, the size of that entire bar. And what we heard designers saying is like, well, I want to see what that shade of green that I changed it to was. I want to make sure it's my right brand color. And I want to see what that icon was. I want to make sure it's the right icon in there. So what we heard is that they wanted a lot more granular data for the material components than we were showing them in gallery. And we had it. We just didn't put it in there. So this was a really important thing for us to know. So this is the final version that's been released. So as you can see, you've still got that bottom app bar. But when you roll over any single component inside it, you get that really granular data for that particular component, in this case, the, the size and the, of that, of that uh, diamond-shaped fab. So this is just one of many examples 
of how the research has made our products launching here at I.O. better. Another one is the Material I.O. homepage. So we, in the same research I'm talking about, we also got feedback on an earlier version of the homepage design. And we heard from designers that they really like to get overview videos of any time there's a new evolution of something so they can get a quick sense of what's changed. And we had that, but it was at the bottom of a really long page and nobody found it before they were able to click on the video. So what we did is in the the website that went live a couple days ago, right underneath that fold, that video is really prominent. So we made it really easy for you all to get a quick overview of what's new in material. So what I've just gone through with you is giving you some examples of how we use workflow research to identify the big problems that we want to put our time into solving and how product research improves the product no matter what stage it's in and how we use products that we're releasing at I.O., how we use research on these products to make them better. And if you want to go check out Gallery, go to material.io slash tools. All right, I'm going to hand it back to Elizabeth now. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. So um, just a little bit of a wrap up and a reminder of the invitation to visit us in Dome F. And so what we've shown you today is just a flavor of the ways we're using traditional methods for research, as well as inventing new methods to understand how the components work for everyday users in terms of beauty and aesthetics, in terms of usability, in terms of sort of usefulness, but also accessibility. And Sarah has shared how important it is for you to send us feedback on our products because we do want to work with you to make sure that your lives are easier in this pretty difficult workflow process from idea to product that really works. Another thing I want to let you know is that we know that many of you don't have research teams. We're lucky enough to have one. And so we think of ourselves as the research system that aligns with the design system and the engineering system. And we have committed to writing up some of the methods that we're using and inventing. And we'll be sharing that along with the other guidance and spec and sharing how these methods can help you understand how our tools work for your context. Because as Michael said very clearly, your context might be slightly different from our own. So we will be sharing more of that with you over the next year. And so, Finally, I hope you take away how we're bringing together design and development and engineering and research and how we're really treating this as a conversation and a conversation that needs to be a rich one. And so with that said, thank you again for your attention. Please come and join us in Dome F, uh, Tent F, I should say, at Design and Access Accessibility. And Again, thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming. Particularly is this idea of the color cascading through your whole design when you just make a simple change. Right, so it's not just taking one color and applying that to everything in the interface, it's actually drawing from this tonal palette to say like, what is the best shade for a text field in its resting state, or what should the text label be? So it tunes that for accessibility and for style. And can you show us one more thing, uh, exporting this into gallery? Yeah, absolutely. So part of our sketch plugin is also the ability to upload everything to gallery. So I can just upload this as a new iteration on our existing Crane project. And once it uploads, there we go. We can just hit view. And in gallery, it's uploaded all of our mocks. And because we used theme editor, um, when you enter inspect mode, you can actually click on things and find what the text style is and all of the different uh, 
all the different specs that you'll need to actually implement this. So you can select something like a fab, and that will actually give you links out to both the material spec and the platform specific implementation. So you can switch to Android if you're working on Android, and then click out and be taken right to documentation for that component. That's really awesome. Thank you so much for showing that to us. Yeah, thank you. And if you'd like to find out more about material design and all the announcements from here at I.O., head on over to material.io.
interested in AI. <laughs> Woo! Me too. <laughs> Me three. Okay, so I'm, I'm the moderator today. I'm Diane Green, and I'm running Google Cloud and on the Alphabet board. And I, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce our really amazing guests we have here. I, I also live on the Stanford campus, so I've known one of our guests a long time because she's a neighbor. Um, <laughs> So let me just introduce them. Uh, first is Fei Fei, Dr. Fei Fei Li, and she is the chief scientist for Google Cloud. She also runs the AI lab at Stanford University, the Vision Lab, and then she also uh, founded Sailors, which is now AI for All, which you'll hear about a little bit later. And um, is there anything you want to add to that, Fei Fei? I'm your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. And so then uh, the other, um, so now we have Greg Corrado. And uh, actually, there's one amazing coincidence. Both Fei Fei and Greg were undergraduate physics majors at Princeton together at the same time and didn't really know each other that well in the 18-person class. We were, we were like, studying too hard. No, it was, it was kind of surprising to, you know, go to undergrad together and then none, neither of us in computer science and then rejoin later, only once we were here. <laughs> All Google. paths lead yeah. to AI and neural networks and so forth. But anyhow, so Greg is a principal scientist in the Google Brain Group. He co-founded it. And more recently, he's been doing a lot of amazing work in health with neural networks and machine learning. He, he has a PhD in neuroscience from Stanford. And so he came into AI in a very interesting way. And maybe he'll talk about the similarities between the brain and what's going on in AI. Would you like to add anything else? Or? No, yeah. sounds good. OK. So I thought, since both of them have been involved in the AI field for a while, and uh, it wasn't, you know, it's recently become a really big deal, but it'd be nice to get a little perspective on the history, you know, uh, in yours in vision and yours in neuroscience about um, AI and, and, and how it was so natural to, for it to evolve to where it is now and what you're doing. Start sure. with Fei Fei. I guess I'll start. So, first of all, AI is a very nascent field in the history of science of human civilization. This is a field of only 60 years of age. And it started with a very, very simple but fundamental quest is can machines think? And we all know thinkers and thought leaders like Alan Turing challenged humanity with that question can machines think? So about 60 years ago, a group of very uh, pioneering scientists, computer scientists like Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, started really this field. In fact, John McCarthy, who founded Stanford's AI lab, coined the very word artificial intelligence. So where do we begin to build machines that think? Humanity is best at looking inward and ourselves and try to draw inspiration from who we are. So we started thinking about building machines that resemble human thinking. And when you think about human intelligence, you start thinking about different aspects, the ability to reason, the ability to see, the ability to hear, to speak, to move around, make decisions, manipulate. So AI started from that very core a foundational dream 60 years ago started to proliferate as a field of multiple subfield, which includes robotics, computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition. And then a very important development happened around the 80s and 90s, which is a sister field called machine learning started to blossom. And that's a field combining statistical learning, statistics, statistics with computer science. And combining the quest of machine intelligence, which is 
what AI was born out of, with the tools and, and the capabilities of machine learning. AI as a field went through an extremely fruitful, productive, blossoming uh, period of time. And fa fast forward to the second decade of 21st century, the latest machine learning booming that we are observing is called deep learning, which has a deep root in neuroscience, which I'll let you talk about. And uh, so combining deep learning as a powerful statistical machine learning tool with the quest of making machines more intelligent, whether it's to see or is it to um, hear or to speak, we're seeing this blossom. And last, I just want to say three critical factors converged around the, the, the uh, last decade, which is the 2000s and the beginning of 2010s, which are the three computing factors. One is the advance of hardware that enabled more powerful, capable computing. Second is the emergence of big data, powerful data that can drive the statistical learning algorithms. And I was lucky to be involved myself in some of the effort. And then the third one is the advances of machine learning and deep learning algorithms. So this convergence of three major factors brought us the AI boom that we're seeing today. And Google has been investing in all three areas, um, honestly, earlier than the curve. Most of the um, effort started even in early 2000s. And as a company, we're doing a lot of AI work from research to products. Yeah. And it's been, uh, it's been really interesting to watch the divergence and exploration in various academic fields, and then the reconvergence as we see ideas that are aligned. So it wasn't, as Faye says, Faye says it wasn't so long ago that fields like cognitive science, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, even things that we don't talk about much more like cybernetics, were really all aligned in a single discipline. And then they've moved apart from each other and explored these ideas independently for a couple of decades. And then with the renaissance in artificial neural networks and deep learning, we're starting to see some reconvergence. So some of these ideas that were popular only in a small community for a couple of decades are now coming back into the mainstream of what artificial intelligence is, what statistical pattern recognition is, and has really been delightful to see. But it's not just one idea. It's actually multiple ideas that you see that were maintained for a long time in fields like cognitive science that are coming back into the fold. So another example beyond deep learning is actually reinforcement learning. So for the longest time, if you looked at a university catalog of courses and you were looking for any mention of reinforcement learning whatsoever, you were going to find it in a, in a psychology department or a cognitive science department. But today, as we all know, we look at reinforcement learning as a new opportunity, as a, something that we actually look at for the future of AI that might be something that's important to get machines to really learn in completely dynamic environments, in, uh, in environments where they have to explore entirely new stimuli. So I've been really excited to see how this convergence has happened back in the direction from those ideas into mainstream computer science. And I think that there's some hope for exchange back in the other direction. So neuroscientists and cognitive scientists today are starting to ask whether we can take the kind of computer vision models uh, that, that Fei Fei helped pioneer and use those as hypotheses for how it is that neural systems actually compute, how our own biological brains see. Um, and I think that that's a really, it's really exciting to see this kind of exchange between uh, disciplines that have been uh, separated for a little while. You know, one little piece of history I think that's also interesting is what you did, Feifei, with ImageNet, which is a nice way of expl explaining 
you know, um, building these neural networks where you labeled all these images and then people could refine their algorithms by, go ahead and explain that just real quickly. Okay, sure. So um, about 10 years ago, that the whole community of computer vision, which is a subfield of AI, was working on a holy grail quest, uh, problem of object recognition, which is you open your eye, you can see the world full of objects like flowers, chairs, people, you know, um, and that's a building block of visual intelligence and intelligence in general. And to crack that problem, we were building as a field different machine learning models we're making small progress, but we're hitting a lot of walls. And uh, when my student and I started working in this problem and start thinking deeply about what is missing in the way we're approaching this problem, we recognize this important interplay between data and statistical machine learning models. They really reinforce each other in very deep mathematical ways that we're not gonna talk about the details here. And that realization was also inspired by human vision. If you look at how children learn, it's a lot of learning through big data experiences and exploration. So combining that, we decided to put together a pretty um, epic effort of we wanted to label all the images we can get on the internet. And of course, we Google searched a lot. And we downloaded billions of images and used crowdsourcing technology to label all the images, organize them into a data set of 15 million images uh, in, um, organized in um, 22,000 categories of objects and put that to, uh, together and that's the ImageNet project. And we democratized it to the research world and released it open source. And then we, starting 2010, we um, held an international challenge for the whole AI community called ImageNet Challenge. And one of the teams from Toronto, which is now at Google, um, won the ImageNet challenge yeah, yeah. with the uh, deep learning convolutional neural network model. Mm -hmm. And that was year 2012. And a lot yeah. of people think the combination of ImageNet and the, the deep learning model in 2012 was the onset of what we Greg gave is people doing. a way to compare how they were doing. Exactly. And it was really yeah. good. So yeah. And so Greg, you've been doing a lot of uh, brain-inspired research, very interesting research, and, and I know you've been doing a lot of very impactful research in the health area. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the ImageNet example actually sort of sets a playbook for how we can try to approach a problem. Um, the kind of machine learning uh, and AI that is most practical and most useful today is ones where machines learn through imitation. It's an imitation game where if you have examples of a task being performed correctly, the machine can learn to imitate this. And this is called supervised learning. And so what happened in the image recognition case is that by, by Feifei building an object recognition data set, we could all focus on that problem in a really concrete tractable way in order to compare different methods. And it turned out that uh, methods like deep learning and artificial neural networks were able to do something really interesting in that space that previous machine learning and artificial, um, uh, artificial intelligence methods had not, which was that they were able to go directly from the data to the predictions and break the problem up into many smaller steps without having be being told exactly how to do that. So that's what we were doing before, is that we were trying to engineer features or cues, things that we could see in the stimuli that then we would do a little bit of statistical learning on to figure out how to combine these signals. But with artificial neural networks and deep learning, we're actually learning to do those things all together. And this applies not only to computer vision, but it applies to most things that you could imagine a machine imitating. And so the kinds of things that we've done, like with, um, with Google Smart Reply and now Smart Compose, 
we're taking that same approach, that if you have a lot of text data, which it turns out the internet is full of, what you can actually do is you can look at uh, the sequence of words so far in a conversation or in, in, um, a, uh, in an email exchange and try to guess what comes next. You know, and, you know I'm going to interrupt here a little bit and um, get a little more provocative here. All right. So you're talking about, uh, you know, neural inspired machine learning and so forth. And uh, so, you know, this artificial intelligence is kind of bringing into question what are we humans? And then there's this thing all there called artificial general AGI, artificial general intelligence. What do you think's going on here? Are we getting to AGI? I really don't think so. <laughs> so so uh, there's a variety of opinions in the community, but my feeling is that, okay, we've finally gotten artificial neural networks to be able to recognize photos of cats, right? That's really great. Um, uh, we, we also, it's now can... Uh, Fei, Fei know, was that AGI when we recognized a cat? No, that's not enough yeah. to define AGI. So the kind of thing that's working well right now is this sort of pattern recognition, this immediate response where we're able to recognize something kind of reflexively. And we now have, I believe, machines can do pattern recognition every bit as well as humans can. And that's why they can recognize objects in photos, that's why they can do speech recognition, and that's why they can win at a game like Go. But that is only one small sliver, a tiny sliver, of what goes into something like intelligence. Uh, notions of memory and planning and strategy and contingencies, even emotional intelligence, these are things that are, have just, we haven't even scratched the surface. And so to me, I feel like it's really a leap too far to imagine that having finally cracked pat pattern recognition after some, some decades of trying, that we are therefore on the verge of cracking all of these other problems that go into what constitutes general intelligence. Although so, we have gone way faster than either of you ever expected us to go, I believe. Um, yes and no. H humanity has a tendency to, un um, to, to overestimate um, short-term progress and underestimate long-term progress. So eventually we will be achieving things that we cannot dream of. But Diane and Greg, I want to just give a simple example to define AGI. <laughs> so the definition of AGI, again, is an introspective definition of what humans and human intelligence can do. I have a two-year-old daughter who doesn't like napping. And uh, I, I thought I'm smart enough to scheme to put her in a very complicated sleeping bag that doesn't get herself out of the crib. And uh, just a couple of months ago, I was on the monitor watching this kid, two-year-old, where for the first time, she, I was training her for napping for, by herself. She was very angry. So she looked around, figured out a weak spot on the crib where she might be able to climb out, figured out how to unzip her complicated sleeping bag that I thought I schemed to do really, you know, uh, to, to, to prevent that, and figured out a way to climb out of a crib that's way taller than who she is, and managed to escape safely and, um, and <laughs> without breaking well, okay, her legs. Okay, how about AGI equivalent to my cat, or equivalent to, my, to a mouse? If you're shifting the definition, sure. <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> but even cat, I think there are things that the cat is capable yeah. of doing. That, so, uh... so I do think that if you, if you look at an organism like a cat from a behavioral level, like the, what, how cats behave and how they respond to their environments, I think that you could imagine a world where you have something like a, a toy that you know, is for entertainment purposes that approximates a cat in a bunch of ways, in that the sorts of behaviors that the human observe, you're like, oh, it walks around, it doesn't bump into things, it meows at me every once in a while. I do believe that we can build a system like that. But what you can't do is you can't take that robot and then you know, uh, dump it in the forest and have it figure out what it needs to do in order to, to, to survive and make okay. things work. Okay. But, but it's a goal. It's a healthy goal. To, it's a to, healthy goal. 
And, and along the way, like you both, at least we all three agree that AI's capacity to help us solve all our big problems is going to outweigh any kind of negative, and we're pretty excited about that, I guess. Like, like in cloud, you're kind of doing some cool things with AutoML and so forth. Yeah, so um, we talk a lot, Diane, about the belief of building benevolent technology for human use, right? Our technology reflects our values. So I personally, and I know Greg's whole team is working on um, bringing AI to the to people and to the fields that really need it to make a positive, uh, positive difference. So at Cloud, we're very lucky to be working with customers and partners from all kinds of vertical industries, from healthcare where we collaborate, to agriculture, to sustainability, to um, entertainment, to, to retail, to commerce, to finance, where our customers bring some of the toughest problems and their pain points, and we can work with them hand in hand to solve some of that. So for example, uh, recently we rolled out AutoML, and that is the recognition of the pain of entering machine learning. It's still a highly technical field, the bar is still high, not, not enough people are trained experts in the world of machine learning. But yet, our industry already has so, many, so much need to you know, tag pictures, understand imageries, just as an example in vision. So how do we answer that call of need? So we worked hard and thought about uh, this, this suite of pro uh, product called AutoML, where the customer, we lower the entry barrier by relieving them from coding machine learning custom models themselves. All they have to do is to give us the kind of, provide the kind of data and concept they need. Here's an example of a ramen company in Tokyo yeah. that has many shops of uh, ramens, and they want to build an app that recognizes the ramens from different uh, ramen stores. And they give us the pictures of ramens and the concepts of their store one, store two, store three. And what we do is to use a technique, a machine learning technique that Google and many others have developed called learning to learn, and then um, build a customized model for the customer that recognize ramens for their different stores. And then the customer can take that model to do what they want. You know, I can write a little C++, maybe some JavaScript. Could I do AutoML? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We're working with teams that uh, they don't have not even C++ experience. And the, we have a drag and drop interface, and, uh, and, and, and you can use AutoML that way. Because I really believe that you know, there are so many problems that can be solved using this technique that it's, it's critical that, that we share as much as possible about how these things work. I don't believe that these technologies should live in walled gardens, but instead we should develop tools that can be used by everyone in the community, and that's part of why we have a very aggressive open source stance to uh, our software packages, particularly uh, in, in AI. Um, and that includes things like TensorFlow that are available completely freely, and it includes the kinds of services that are available on cloud to do the kind of compute storage and model tuning and serving that you need to use these things in practice. And I think it's amazing that we, the same tools that my applied machine learning team uses to, to tackle problems that we're interested in, those same tools are accessible to all of you as well to try to solve the same problems in the same way. And um, I've been really excited with how, how much it's, uh, how great the uptake is and how we're seeing expanding to other languages. Uh, mentioning JavaScript, quick plug for tensorflow.js is actually really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yep. Oh, and you should probably run it on a TPU. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, it does give a nice boost, but um, so so you're doing you're building. I mean, 
with machine learning, we're bringing it to market in so many ways because we do, we have the, the tools to build your own models, the TensorFlow, we have the auto ML that brings it to any programmer. And then what's going on with all the APIs and, and how is that going to affect every industry and what do you see going on there? So cloud uh, already um, has a suite of APIs for a lot of our industry partners and customers from translate to speech to vision to... Um, which are based on models that we built. Yes, yeah. which, um, build, uh, for and example, Box is a major partner with uh, Google Cloud where uh, they recognize a tremendous need for organizing uh, customers' uh, imagery data to help customers. So they actually use Google's Vision API to yeah. do that. And, yeah. uh, and that's a, a, a model easily delivered to our customers through, through our uh, service. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I mean, Greg, how do you think that's going to uh, play out in the health industry? I know you've been yeah. thinking about yeah, that. Yeah. So, it, so healthcare is one of the problems that a bunch of people are working on at Google and a lot of people are working on outside as well because I think there's a huge opportunity to use these technologies to expand the availability and the accuracy of healthcare. And part of that is because there's, um, there's uh, doctors today are basically trying to weather an information hurricane in order to provide care. And so there's... There are, I think there are thousands of individual opportunities to make doctors work more fluid, to build tools to solve problems that they want solved, and to do things that help, um, that help patients and improve patient care. I mean, but I think I, you're, you, you were telling me that so many doctors are so unhappy because they have so much drudgery to do. Is this, is this a big breakthrough? Yeah, or? absolutely. I mean, I, I believe that there's, a, there's been a great, um, you know, when you go to a doctor, you're, you're looking for medical attention, right? And right now, a huge amount of their attention is not actually focused on the practice of medicine, but is focused on a whole bunch of other work that they have to do that, that doesn't require the kind of uh, insights and care and connection the real practice of medicine does. And so I believe that machine learning and, and AI is going to come into healthcare uh, through assistive technologies that help, help the doctors do, do what they want to do better. By understanding what they do in a system. No substitute for the human. No, the I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no substitute. Speaking of human, uh, Feifei, do you want to talk a little bit about why um, you've been so you think this humanistic AI approach is so critical? Yeah, thank you. So if we look at the history of AI, we've entered phase two. The first 60 years is AI as more or less a niche technical field where we're still laying down scientific foundations. But starting this point on, AI is one of the biggest drivers of societal changes to come. So. How do we think about AI in its next phase? What is the frame of mind that should be driving us has been on top of my mind. And I think deeply about the need for human-centered AI, which in my opinion uh, includes three elements to complete the human-centered AI uh, thinking. The first element is really advancing AI to the next stage. And here we bring our collective uh, background from neuroscience, cognitive science, you know, whether we're getting to AGI tomorrow or, or, or in 50 years, there's a need for AI to be a lot more uh, flexible, nuanced, uh, learn faster in more um, unsupervised, semi-supervised, uh, uh, one-shot learning ways uh, to be able to understand emotion, to be able to communicate with humans, so that is the more human-centered way of advancing AI science. The second part is the human-centered AI technology and application, is that I love what you're saying, that there's no substitute for humans. This technology, like all technology, is to enhance humans, to augment humans, not to replace humans. We'll replace certain tasks. We'll replace humans out of danger or our tasks that we cannot perform. But the bottom line is we can use 
AI to help our doctors, to help our disaster relief workers, to help decision makers. So there is a lot of technology in robotics, in design, in natural language processing that is centered around human-centered AI technology and application. The third element of human-centered AI is really to combine the thinking of AI as a technology as well as the societal impact. We are so nascent in seeing the impact of this technology, but already, like Diane said, that we are seeing the impact in different ways, ways that we might not even predict. So I think it's really important and it's a responsibility of everyone from academia to industry to government to bring social scientists, philosophers, law scholars, policy makers, ethicists, and, and historians at the table and to study more deeply about AI's social and humanistic impact. And that is the uh, three elements of human-centered AI. That's, that's pretty wonderful. And, and I think we at Google here, Alphabet, are working as hard as we can to do humanistic AI. Um, you know, you mentioned a, um, you know, what we need to be careful about out there with AI and regulatory. What are some of the barriers to, you know, I think every company in the world has a use for AI in many, many ways. I mean, it's just exploding in all the verticals. But there are some impediments to adoption. For example, in financial, the financial industry, they need to have something called explainable AI. And could you just talk about some of the different barriers you see to being able to take advantage of AI? We should start yeah. with healthcare. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think that there are, there are a bunch of really important things to consider. So one of the things is, uh, of course, we want to um, uh, have, have machine learning systems that are de designed to fit the needs uh, of the folks that are using them and applying them. And that can often include not just giving me the answer, but telling me something about how that was um, derived. So some kind of explainability. So in the healthcare space, for example, um, we've been working on a bunch of things in medical imaging, and it's not acceptable to just tell the doctor that, oh, you know, something looks fishy in this x-ray or this pathology slide or this retinal scan. You have to tell them, you know, well, what do you think is wrong? But more importantly, you actually have to show them where in the image you think the evidence for that conclusion lies so that they can then look at it and decide whether they concur or they disagree or, oh, well, there's a speck of dust there and that's what the machine is picking up on. And the good news is that these things actually are possible. And uh, there, I think there's kind of been this unfortunate uh, mythology that AI and deep learning in particular is a, is a black box. And it really isn't. Um, uh, we didn't study how it worked because for a long time it really didn't work that well. But now that it's working well, there are a lot of tools and techniques that go into examining how these systems work. And I think explainability is a big part of it um, in, in terms of making these things uh, available for a bunch of applications. So I, in addition to explainability, I would add bias. Um, I think bias is an issue we need to address in AI. And I see bias from where I said two major kind of bias we need to address. One is the pipeline of AI development, starting from the bias of the data to the outcome of the bias. And we have here a lot, uh, heard a lot about if the machine learning algorithm is fed with data that does not represent the, 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 the problem domain in a fair way, we will introduce bias. Uh, whether it's uh, missing a group of people's data or, or uh, biasing it to a skewed distribution, um, these this are things that would have deep consequences, whether you're in the healthcare domain or finance or legal decision making. So I think that is a huge issue. Uh, very nicely that Google is already addressing that. We have a whole team at Google working on bias yeah, in, in this. That's true. And, and another bias I think it's important is the people who are developing AI, it's the human yeah. bias. And 
and the lack of diversity is also another it's bias. so important and that kind of brings me to maybe our some of our we're getting close to the end but um if you uh you know where is AI going? I mean, how prevalent is it going to be? I mean, we look at our universities and these machine learning classes have 800 people, 900 people. You know, there's such a demand. Every computer science graduate wants to know it. Where is it going? I mean, will every high school graduating senior be able to customize AI to their own purposes? Um, and, and how will, you know, how, wh what does it look like five, ten years from now? So, from a technology point of view, I think that the, because of the tremendous investment in resource, both in the private sector as well as in the public sector now, every, many countries are waking up to uh, invest in AI, we are going to see a huge continue um, development of AI technology. I'm mostly excited uh, either at cloud or seeing what Greg's team is doing, AI being delivered to the industries that really matter to people's lives and uh, work uh, quality and productivity. But Diane, I think you're also asking is, um, how are we educating more people in AI, right? So both making it easier to use and educating them, and, and what's it going to look like? I, you know, what do you predict? So, that's a really tough question because at the core of today's AI is still calculus, and that's not going to change. <laughs> so, so I, th I think that from the kind of from the the tech uh, the tech industry perspective or from the computer science education perspective, I think that we're going to see AI and ML become as essential as networking is, right? Like, no one really thinks about, oh, well, I'm going to write some software and it's going to be standalone on a box and it's not going to have a TCPI connection, right? Like, we all know that you're going to have a TCPI connection at the end of the day somewhere, and everyone understands the basics of the networking stack, and, and that's not just at the engineering of the level of engineers, that's at the level of designers, of, of, of executives, of, um, uh, of product developers and leaders. And the same, same thing I think is gonna happen with machine learning and AI, which is that designers are gonna start to understand how can I make a, a completely revolutionary kind of product that folds in machine learning the same way that we fold in networking and internet technologies into almost everything we build. So I think we're gonna see tremendous uptake and it becoming kind of a pervasive background part of the technologies. But I think that in that process, the ways that we use AI are going to evolve. So I think right now, you're seeing a lot of things where AI and machine learning adds some, some spice, some extra little coolness on a feature. And I think that what you're going to see um, over the next decade is you're going to see more of a core integration into what it means for the product to actually work. And I think that one of the great opportunities there is actually going to be the development of artificial emotional intelligence that allows products to actually have much more natural and much more fluid human interaction. We're beginning to see that in the assistant now with speech recognition, speech synthesis, understanding dialogues and exchanges. But I think that this is still in its, in its infancy. We're going to get to a point where uh, the products that we build, they interact with humans in the way that the humans find most useful, just out of the box. And I spend a lot of time with high schoolers, because I really believe in the future. You know, we always talk about AI changing the world, and I always say the question is who is changing AI? And to me, bringing more human mission thinking into technology development and thought leadership is really important. Not only important for the future of our technology and the value we instill in our technology, but also in bringing the diverse group of students and future leaders into the development of AI. So, you know, at Stanford at Google, we all work um, a lot on this issue, and personally, I'm very involved with AI for All, which is a nonprofit that educates uh, high schoolers around the country from diverse backgrounds, whether they're uh, girls or, or students of underrepresented uh, minority groups. 
and we bring them onto AI, in, onto campus, university campus, and uh, work with them on, on AI thinking and AI yeah. studies. And, and at Google, we're just completely committed to bringing all our best technologies to everybody in the world, and we're doing that through the cloud, and we're bringing these tools, we're bringing these APIs, and the training, and the partnering, and the processors, and we're pretty excited to see what all you guys are gonna do with it. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'm at the Community Lounge. This is where anybody can swing by, meet up with old friends, or make new ones. I'm going to go find some certification alumni to talk to them about the program. Hey, Marga. Hi, everyone. How you doing? Doing good. How are you? Awesome. <laughs> really great. <laughs> I'm sitting here with Henry, Ashesh, and Somia, and they're all alumni in the certification program. I'd like to ask you just a few things about the program, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Let's start with, how did you get involved? Like, what made you want to get certified? Okay. So, actually, before in, in Indonesia, they have like a scholarship. So they, they give out the 500 scholarship for the people to take with the UDCT and certifications. And I was, I, I registered on that one and I, I got it. And then after that, I, I tried the certifications and yeah. So your path was some scholarships to certification? Yes. Ashesh? Okay, so uh, if you see the reason I went for the certification, in our professional life, uh, we strive for a few things. One of them is uh, to prove the word to ourselves, and second is to prove our word to others. Like, so to proving word to ourselves, we go for a benchmark, right? We try to achieve it. So for me, that certification was a benchmark, a milestone achieved. And once I've achieved that, there's the only one way that is to go for something higher, right? So this was one reason to prove myself the worth so that I can, you know, go for more higher things. So certification was a commitment to me, to myself, to go for in search of more knowledge. And second thing is to prove worth to others. So if you see when you go for the job, uh, there are very various phases. There are interviews, there are tests and everything. But the first phase is always the qualification. What degrees do you hold? What certifications do you hold? If you don't cross that door, there's no point. I mean, you might be a very good programmer or something, but to have a certification, you are always have a key to open a door. 
So that was the other thing which I went certification for. So in short, to gain confidence and to be job ready. Right. Thank you. And Soumya? So I've been working on Android since 2010. What pushed me to do the certification was probably that, you know, like like Ashish said, you know, there, there's a benchmark or there's a standard with a certification. And after working for so long in Android, worked on various kinds of applications, how do you differentiate yourself from the others? Thank you. Can you each tell me one thing that has been helpful in your career because of certification? Sure. So uh, actually, in my current organization, we now have a team of about 20 mobile developers, mobile team more, more or less. And uh, what, what I noticed was uh, we had the support of the management for conducting various certifications and things like that. But uh, when we did the certification and I told my team that, see, I did this and it was cool and it, it, you know, it gave a validation to the team also that how we are doing this. And after that, very quickly, we have almost 10 team members now who are certified already. So that was a big boost, uh, energizer to them too, you know, from a team lead to the rest of the team saying that, oh, you should do this. And then that has worked out very positively for them. I work for Paradise Publisher saying, we're into ebook publishing. So we provide a platform to indie authors. For that, we have an app, Android app. So uh, the thing is that we had outsourced it to some other company. So when we outsource something, we have to uh, engage our resources. And not being a large company, this could be a problem, right? So we had to talk to them about exposing our internal APIs, and then our boss had to sit with them. So this was this was this was the one thing which motivated. Like I, when I was uh, uh, getting into Android, uh, that th that point of time, I thought, okay, I will try to make the Android app in house for my company, but. The certification was not there, so I was also a little hesitant to ask my boss that to give this job to me, because you know the app matters as such uh, financially. Once I got the certification and I told my boss, he was very happy about it, and of course he was quite confident. So till now I have developed two Android apps for my company that is in-house. So we have more control over the app, especially since I am working already. I know the back end and everything. And our consumers also get a more robust and something, you know, more user friendly app. So this certification has helped me to gain the confidence with my boss and to move my career in Android app development. Before I took the certifications, it's like whenever I apply to a company, I always choose the Android developer job. And then they always give me the interview for iOS developer job. <laughs> So and then I, I tried the certif certifications and then after I get certified, it's it's naturally they it just knocked them to their senses that okay I'm certified by Google, uh -huh. so then they, they give me more chance they give me chance for interview for the test. Yeah. Otherwise before it, no one they just give me the test for iOS. Thank you all so much for sharing your story with me today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about certification, head on over to g.co slash dev slash certification. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. Having a technical background or having technical knowledge, do you think that it can help um, make the creative process burgeon and grow, or do you think it can hinder the creative process? It can go both ways. Um, but I've definitely found myself early in my career kind of uh, noticing that, yeah, I, I've started thinking about how to actually implement uh, an, a design and that sometimes hindered my design process because I was thinking so much of how to actually make the solution happen. That's quite a challenging thing. So how did you manage to break through so it's not stopping you but maybe enhancing the stuff that you actually do? I think one of the things that I always struggled with is that uh, from a visual standpoint, like I'm not a super talented visual designer. I've seen some amazing visual designers that I'm just like, oh my goodness, like that is really, really slick and I love that and um, that's not like my strength. And so I was a, a lot, came back more from like the coding perspective, being able to actually implement some stuff in code, which they couldn't. Um, but you know, there, there was this kind of this deciding factor of realizing Am I more of a designer or more of a, a developer? Like, you know, I'm not necessarily that great at the graphics, but there's still so many other ways of design that can kind of spread in. Uh, so really like doing some research and finding about more about UX design and realizing that is really kind of what, what I wanted to focus on yeah. um, is kind of what led me to that. So it's, 
it definitely was this, this kind of process of navigating through it. It's like, where do I fit? Am I a designer? Am I a developer? Where, you know, I, from the first projects that I started doing, um, you know, a lot of the time I did a lot of websites. And when people come to you, they go, hey, we need a website built. They don't necessarily <laughs> say, hey, we need a front end developer to come, <laughs> come, come do this, especially if you're working with uh, smaller businesses and clients. So you do take on the designer and developer hat um, to kind of make that happen. A lot of developers are very afraid to learn about design. It's like, because I get question, question like, if, if I was to, to write an article, the perfect article for the developers would be how to, be, how to learn to design, or how do you, you know, which makes no sense to me, because learning to design doesn't really mean anything. It's just like, what, what part of design, you know, what discipline of right. design? Um, but there's still that question of, okay, what is the first step that someone who wants to really, as someone who's gone through this process yourself, what was your first step to say, okay, that's it, I'm becoming a designer? Right. I think, you know, following a lot of design patterns, at that time I didn't really understand that they were called design patterns, right? You kind of, you implement them um, in the sites doing a lot of web work. You yeah. kind of take on, okay, the navigation uh, menu, where does that live? And you're following a lot of the patterns that have already been created, and so you kind of learn to explore through that and then, you know, testing out the site and realizing, oh, this doesn't feel right, like something's off, let's, let's work on how to make this better. Um, but I think one of the, the great things that can really help designer or developers wanting to go into design is looking at a lot of like the material spec guidelines are actually really, really helpful because not only does it actually tell you, hey, here's some guidelines of what to follow, but it actually does a really go a good job of explaining why you're doing that certain and the certain thing. And, and logic. Yeah, exactly. So that actually is really helpful because then you're able to understand why was this created? Like what was the thought process behind um, adding potentially a, a bottom navigation, or why would you have a side uh, side nav? You know, it's it's really getting to kind of explaining that, so you're able to learn from learn from actually interacting with something and seeing how they're doing it, but also getting finding out why they decided to do that. Because I think so much of design is so much it's problem solving, right? Yeah. So. Um, so many people forget that when they think of design, they think of the finished product, but there's so many different stages of how you got to that finished product. Um, and so a lot of it, being able to understand how someone was thinking through that really, really helps you, um, from a development perspective, get into that design field of understanding, oh, okay, how do I get from thinking of how do I develop this versus how do I even arrive to the solution? I think that's, the, that's kind of the big difference there. As developers, you, know, you have something that's already uh, designed for you for the most part. I mean, some people get handed things. Some people get handed an iOS mock uh, and said, hey, make this, make this into Android. So then at that time, you kind of become an Android uh, designer yeah. in that aspect. What do you think is like the biggest thing that stops developers really understanding design? One of the things that we do at uh, Google is we do design sprints. So the design sprints are really great because it brings people from all the different disciplines and specialties together um, to work into solving a, a challenge that we have. You know, so you have product managers, engineers, designers, researchers, everyone um, in, in the room together and kind of thinking and working through a problem, which is really fantastic because you get all these different ideas. Um, and one of the things that I really notice is we're, as we're bringing in designers you know, and uh, engineers and all these people together is that when we're walking through the challenge, the engineers are already thinking of the solution yeah. and already thinking about how to implement it. They go straight to that, which makes sense. That, that is their role, right? As engineers, um, usually you are given something and you have to go, oh, how do I, how do I make this happen? How to, like, I'm thinking through problem solving, how to actually get to that solution. Whereas designers, we don't know what the solution necessarily is. So I think a lot of the blockers is automatically wanting to know the answer yeah. instead of being more aware and being okay with saying, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but let's, let's explore it together. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the biggest hindrance that can really stop developers into getting into design is wanting to have all the answers. It's, it's okay not to have them. I mean, and what do you think developers can actually do um, to get past that? I mean, because I find, like, for me, it's always sketching and just experimenting. Right. So I suppose it's how does the, the developer maintain that kind of playful space where they're not thinking, right, uh, here's the library we're going to use to do, like, a whatever widget or a fab or whatever, but what can they actually do that allows them to to not thinking about like the end result or breaking from that cycle. Yeah, you actually bring up a great point with sketching. That's probably one of my favorite exercises when I'm working with different people to get them thinking of, uh, of solutions. So it's particularly if you're developing an app or so is, hey, let's get some sketches out there, get a Sharpie and just start sketching out through some ideas. Um, because that really, 
that doesn't, you can really get some ideas on paper and not be uh, married to them, you know, and not feel like really connected because you spent all this time developing the solution and realizing, oh, it doesn't really work. Um, and so if you start really low fidelity with some sketches, that can really open up your mind in terms of thinking about different solutions because as you're sketching through it, you're realizing, oh, like maybe I want to use this fab button or something or everyone loves fab, right? So <laughs> you want to incorporate it somewhere and then you realize, hmm, maybe that's not the, the right thing to do and I haven't spent all this energy developing or even designing this. So then I can kind of toss that and move on and create a different solution. So sketching, I think, is a great uh, resource instead of people go straight. A lot of people like to prototype in the code. Um, but I usually like to challenge people and go, hey, start sketching some ideas, and then once you've landed on something that you think you, you want to explore some more, then dive into code or dive into sketch or whatever you're, you're using. So I suppose um, for the engineer to really understand design is almost like, okay, just start sketching first um, and start thinking about the thing you're going to build and the possibilities rather than straight to the end solution. Hi, friends. Thanks for, uh, on this last day, coming to our talk, an overview of Cloud IoT Core. I'm Gabe Weiss. 
And I'm Gus Klass. We're engineers working on Google's cloud platform specializing in IoT. Uh, we're going to bring Gus back on a little bit, but first, I want to have a little chat with you guys. First thing I need to know, who are you? Quick survey time. Who out there are engineers, are the people that do in the work, developers? Oh, nice. OK, most of you. Good. Um, do we have any biz dev, managers, C-levels, kind of decision makers? All right, got a couple here. Good. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to actually call on any of you. That's what we call that theater of cruelty. I won't do that to you. Uh, do we have any data scientists in the crowd? Ah, oh, nice. Good, good, good. All right. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, who knows what IoT is? OK, most of you. What about IoT Core? All right. Yeah. Good. Um, just to make me feel better, do you all know what Google Cloud Platform is? Even if you don't, raise your hand. Just make me feel good. OK, so for those that haven't heard of it yet, there, I saw a couple of hands didn't go up. IoT, it's the Internet of Things. I actually voted for 5TI, things that talk to the Internet. Um, I thought it would have been a little more indicative of what it is. So what is IoT? A computer, your computer connected to Wi-Fi, IoT device. Your smartphone, IoT device. Smart meters connected to your house, electricity, uh, gas, all of those, IoT devices. Raspberry Pis, microcontrollers. We'll get to all of these. All of these are IoT devices. In 2015, Business Insider, along with Gartner, did a study that said by 2020, 30 billion connected devices, 30 billion IoT devices. That's the, the phones and the computers, you can see, are a tiny slice of what we're talking about here. So why aren't we there yet? Why isn't my world connected and smart? Well, these things take time. They take money. Um, so to really understand what the holdup is, I want to do a little brief introduction to the world of, world of electronics. Does anyone know, if I say the word constrained device, does anyone know what that is? A constrained device? A couple people are nodding. OK. A constrained device is a tiny computer. It's got its memory, its processor, its analog to digital signal conversion, all in a single chip. That's a constrained device. So because everything's on that single chip, it's called constrained because its memory, its processing, its storage are all severely limited. This is the class of computer we're talking about when we talk about 30 billion connected devices. Who remembers floppy disks? I'm not talking about, hold on, hold on. I'm not talking about the three and a half inch you know, firm ones, five and a quarter inch, the really floppy ones. All right. Now, I know some of us are old enough that we remember there were bigger ones, right? They're like the dinner size plate ones. Those aren't the ones I'm talking about. The five and a quarter inch floppies, those things held 360K of storage. These microcontrollers hold less than that on average. If we remember those floppy disks, a single program came on many disks. So to load an application, we had to switch those things in and out to load your program into RAM. We don't have that luxury with microcontrollers. We can't just swap them in and out to load an application. That's why we need something, a more powerful computer or cloud IoT core, to expand the capabilities of the device. So since I keep bringing it up, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with IoT core. What is IoT core? It's a 100% managed service. This means that you don't have to stand up anything. You don't have to put a service up in a VM. We handle all of that for you in Google. There's no need for auto scaling, redundancy, scaling. All of that is done by the cloud for you. IoT Core provides a global endpoint. No matter where your devices are in the world, it's the same endpoint. So latency is to your nearest data center and back, and that's it. IoT Core has two main pieces. It's a communication broker, and it's a device management. For um, IoT Core, the organization of it is you have IoT Core. Inside, you create registries. Registries are buckets for your devices, so you can create some, some logical organization to them. And then the devices yourselves. The messages from your devices will, using either HTTPS or the MQTT protocol, shuttle your device's data up into the cloud. And then IoT Core brokers, that's a communication piece, your messages from IoT Core into Cloud PubSub, and we'll talk about PubSub later. PubSubs are uh, event stream manager. And from there, it's the gateway. IoT Core gives you access to the rest of Google Cloud's platform. So to wrap your head around why, where we are now and why it's really getting excited, I want to go back to our little history lesson and talk about how electronics evolved. In the before times, your household stuff, like your blender, your microwave, your washing machine, all of these were made up of electronic components like capacitors, diodes, resistors, things that would respond to electric signal strength alone. The more power for the signal, 
the more it would happen in the electrical component. So your microwave, for example, how it works. The, magnet, the magnetron inside your microwave, you increase signal strength to it, your food gets hotter. Decrease signal strength to it, and it reduces the temperature. That's how basic electronics work. Because the, of the physical relationship of these components to each other, as the electrical signal come in, each component would actuate or not actuate the next pieces in. It's like a Rube Goldberg machine. And because of the tight physical relationship to it, change was very difficult. If you wanted to change functionality of your electrical circuit, you had to make physical changes to it. You had to change your bomb, your build of materials, so there would be cost associated with it. The minute you add something to an electrical circuit, your resistance goes haywire. You might have to change the whole layout of your circuit. If you wanted to mass produce your circuits, this is a problem. Once you've created your tooling for your manufacturing line on your circuit, mass producing the same template's nice and easy. If you've introduced change, now you have to retool everything to, to recreate your circuits. So it was very expensive to make any kind of change. Some of these kinds of circuits, we call them the analog circuits, still exist today. But modern electronics, and why this is all exciting, are a little bit different. Modern electronics are still composed of sensors, components, actuators, all of these things that still work with electrical signals. But instead of the way that we used to do it, where signal strength was what changed things, now we have things called digital protocols. Electrical signal will go on and off very rapidly in a predefined pattern, a digital protocol that is understood by another piece in the circuit. This means that we can center our electronics around this constrained device, this microcontroller, which is very good at reading signals, both analog and digital, and speaking in this digital protocol. The chip itself can now create functional change in your circuit without having to physically change anything around it. It's important because they're, they're inexpensive. Until relatively recently, these microcontrollers were pretty expensive. But now, mass market. I can go out and buy a microcontroller with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth for less than $5. So adding these complex circuits and creating these complex circuits is now very inexpensive. The trade-off, of course, is that microcontrollers are still relatively constrained. They don't have a lot of memory. They don't have a lot of storage. So they need something else to help them achieve the capabilities that they're not able to accomplish on their own. So hopefully this gives you kind of a backdrop uh, for why we're at this tipping point with electronics, where cost and complexity have arrived where we can do things at scale. Being able to create these cheap, complex circuits with the microcontrollers allows us to think about creating those cheap or inexpensive, complex smart devices that are going to connect our world. So take a step, and let's talk about smart devices. What is a smart device? At the simplest, a smart device is something that can complete an objective, that can do a task without human intervention. I don't need to do anything for it. Modern electronics and the availability of these microcontrollers makes intelligent control of these devices economically feasible. And you might notice, I'm really harping on economically feasible and inexpensive, and I am. If there's just one takeaway that I want you to walk away from this talk with, it's that what a few years ago might not have been possible because of cost and complexity is easily achievable now. We have the tools now to create these ecosystems of smart devices. So smart devices, so we can understand them, there's three basic approaches to a smart device. And I'm holding up three fingers. First, there's 100% on device. Everything is contained and done within your single device, something like Google Home, where I can use my voice as the input to a device. It uses speech to text to convert to text. It uses natural language processing to analyze what I really asked for, because maybe I didn't ask for the right thing, and run some kind of task on device, and it can accomplish it, all without me having to do anything else. I have a spoken word, and something happens. It might use the internet to call out to do something else, but that's part of the task it's already accomplishing. The second, there's edge or border routing. Sometimes we call it as the, the radio protocol approach. For example, Nest has released something called OpenThread. OpenThread allows your device to call out to another nearby device to take advantage of its capabilities. So say you've got a device that can do everything except internet. But whatever the task is, it needs to be able to call out to the internet. Well, with OpenThread, it can reach out to another, another device that's nearby and connected and borrow its internet connection in order to accomplish its task. It's still doing some of the work on board, but it's using these other devices to finish off what it needs to be done. And lastly, a device can delegate all of its control to something else. 
a lot of the times these microcontrollers do that. So they will become a very dumb but very fast gatherer of information, gatherer of data, and then hand off all of that I.O. to something else, a computer nearby, the cloud, something else. Fermata, made famous by Arduino, that's the perfect example of what this is. Over a serial wire, you can delegate all of your control, all of the, the information that you've gathered on one device to a computer, to something else nearby. So what if I told you that the computer that we're connecting to that's that is doing all this power for us didn't have to be anywhere near the devices? And that's where we're back, oops, that's where we're back to IoT Core. This is how you can start to think about that. Like the concept of Fermata, IoT Core connects your device to the cloud. It expands the capabilities of this little device and all of its data it's collecting to the power of the cloud. It gives your device these new capabilities without adding, adding any complexity. You don't need more local hardware. You don't need anything local. All you need to be able to do is talk to the cloud. So all of this so far, that our history in electronics, our talking about smart devices, is to hammer this point home where we're in a world where creating devices that talk to the internet, it's not only easy, it's inexpensive. And here's the inexpensive again. We can, we can all do it. So I've touched on why the cloud is integral to IoT. But just in case you aren't convinced yet, I want to show you a couple of things to make sure that you understand. Let's take a look at this graph. This graph is all of the oil and gas fields in the Gulf of Mexico. There's a little over 1,300 of them. Each of these gas fields could have potentially thousands of sensors all streaming data. To keep our math simple, let's say it's just 1,000. From there, let's say that each of these sensors is only streaming 100 bytes a second. It's nothing, 100 bytes a second. Even if that's true, that's 137 megabytes a second. It's just over 8 gigabytes a minute. It's 11 and a half terabytes a day. You could manage that data if you want. I'm just saying there's a reason the cloud was created. The cloud offloads all of the infrastructure, all of the overhead of managing this big data. You don't have to worry about backups. You don't have to worry about IT people to, to run your machines and make sure you've got uptime. The cloud handles all of this. The other point I want to talk about is security. Some of you may have heard about it. A couple of years ago, there was a thing called the Mirai botnet attack. This is where uh, a bunch of unsecured devices, mostly routers and stuff like that, were hijacked and used to attack the domain name services of the internet, DYN. Took down huge swaths of the internet for a pretty good amount of time in the, in the internet scheme. Also, a, a temperature sensor in a fish tank. Last year, this happened. A temperature sensor in a fish tank in a casino was compromised. The hacker was able to, through this temperature sensor, pull out all of the personal information of the casino's high rollers, all through a temperature sensor that didn't happen to be secured. So security is massively important. If you're doing IoT, you need to think about security. IoT Core registers all of your devices with an SSL key pair and does all your, your encrypted communication through TLS 1.2 or later to ensure that all of your devices are secure when they're talking to the cloud. So we understand now, hopefully, why IoT Core is awesome, but what else? IoT Core is this gateway into the Google Cloud Platform. What does the Cloud Platform have for you for IoT? This is a small sampling of what Google Cloud Platform offers. If you want a really good time, go to cloud.google.com slash products and start scrolling and just keep scrolling and keep scrolling. It's really impressive. There's, there's enough products on there that even we don't know what all the products really do. They're all specialized. There's a ton of products that will fit pretty much any need that you want. But back to our sample. So first, we've got our devices bringing their data up into GCP. As I've talked about before, these payloads, the messages, end up brokered as events into Cloud PubSub, our event, managing, uh, manage, our event stream manager. Um, from there, once it's in PubSub, we have some products that can respond to our incoming messages. We've got cloud functions. Cloud functions are serverless functions that just exist in the serverless space that you can call either with an endpoint, like you're calling a URL, or they can respond to um, events within GCP. In our case, the PubSub message coming in will trigger a cloud function to run on it. The other product we've got on here is called Cloud Dataflow. Dataflow is our managed service to handle transforming incoming streams. It's managed. So again, like Cloud IoT Core, it will scale without you having to do anything. However much data it's processing, it will scale to handle it. It can be used to do things like filter incoming data if there's only some data you want to make it into your final storage. Or it can massage the data into a specific format if you need it to be processed in a specific way. It also acts as a pipeline for your data. Cloud PubSub is temporary. Messages will stay there for seven days. If you don't do something with them, they go away. You don't want your data to go away. So a product like Dataflow can shuttle your data into the other products, which brings us to 
our storage and analytics section. There's way more than are shown here. These three are just a very small sampling of what we've got. First, we have um, Bigtable. Bigtable is our NoSQL storage, uh, our NoSQL database option. Again, managed service. It will scale with however much data you put in it. BigQuery is our enterprise-level data warehousing. It allows you to query your big data, I mean, petabytes of data, with simple SQL statements. That means your data analysts and your data scientists don't have to learn a new system. They can just use SQL to find insights within your data. They can spend their time analyzing data, not learning a new system. And finally, we've got machine learning. TensorFlow is the open source software that allows you to train your models and run inference against your models. Cloud Machine Learning Engine is hosted TensorFlow. It allows you to harness all of the power of Google's backbone to train and run inference on your models faster and more efficiently. Finally, we have tools that can visualize your data. We've got a couple of options here. We've got Cloud Data Lab. It's built on Jupyter, so you can build notebooks to visualize the data however you want. And we've got an out-of-the-box solution, Data Studio, which lets you look at time slices of data in charts and graphs, however you want to visualize it. So for IoT, with all of these together, you can do things like perform device man management and monitor your health across fleets of devices. You can warehouse and analyze truly absurd amount of data. And lastly, you can perform things like predictive maintenance on man in manufacturing or utilities to see when your stuff is going to break using tools like machine learning. Cloud IoT Core provides that gateway. It provides the device management and connectivity for all of your devices into the rest of Google Cloud Platform. It's been only a year. Last year, I.O. is when we announced Cloud IoT Core. So I want to take a sec just to highlight the, what we've done since then. What are the improvements we've made? First, when we, when we announced that beta a year ago, it could only talk MQTT. If you didn't have a device that could do MQTT, you're out of luck. We've added HTTP, HTTPS since then. So now a broader range of devices can connect to IoT Core and have their data managed. A year ago when we launched, each registry, remember those buckets of devices, mapped one to one to our um, to PubSub. So any device data that was coming into your registry would only go into a single bucket of PubSub. We've now added the ability to map multiple PubSub topics to a single registry. So you can shard your data that way. You can organize your data into multiple PubSub topics. We've added stack driver, stack driver logging so that you can monitor your health through stack driver, which is um, it's a logging and monitoring tool that we've got. I forgot to mention it before. And brand new, and I, I don't think anyone's actually announced this yet, so I'm kind of excited I get to announce something, um, Android Things. I'm sure you've all heard a lot about Android Things across this conference. Android Things has created a plugin that they're releasing next week that will allow you to easily connect your Android Things devices to IoT Core. So all of those sessions that you went to about Android Things and all of the cool stuff you can create using it, now let that kind of percolate in the back of your mind what more can you do with it? If it's connected to the cloud, what else can you do? What global reach can you accomplish with Android things now that it can connect to cloud IoT core? So now that I've talked your ear off, uh, I'm going to bring Gus back up, and he's going to show you in practice some of the stuff that I've been talking about. Thanks, Gabe. Mm -hmm. Let's have a round of applause for Gabe and his wonderful blue hair. Look at this guy. Yeah, yeah I don't know how I'm going to follow that. Um, just kidding. Actually, I'll be the yin to his yang, and I'll show you the things that he's been talking about. Um, so, this is actually the th this is the third time that I've given that I've shown kind of the nuts and bolts of how Cloud IoT Core works, and kind of this is I/O right now. And I remember a year ago, uh, the Cloud IoT Core team came in front of you all and demonstrated the demonstrated the product for the first time. And when they did it, I. I have no idea how they were able to get such a robust and beautiful demo at that point in time, because there was a lot of pieces that the experience was a cliff. You know, the first time that I showed, the first time that I showed this demo that I'm just about to do, um, the, it, it blew up in my face. And that was because, uh, that was for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them was we didn't have, the, we didn't have the, the cloud console features for IoT Core. So, there was no visual way of, do, of adding devices and creating registries. And we, there, also, uh, there also was no command line utilities for managing IoT Core. And so I had to write a sample that would make API calls with the device ID, the registry ID, the project ID, all of these values that uh, are really easy to fat finger. Um, so when, uh, when we went to general availability, uh, the Google Cloud SDK, or G Cloud, um, for, those who, for those who don't know, Google Cloud ships a command line utility uh, that's written in Python, I believe. 
and it allows you to do all the things that you can do in cloud programmatically from the command line. And it, um, it actually works, it works really well from, um, from cloud resources. And if you go and do the code lab, um, I actually have you do a lot of cloud resource management using the G Cloud SDK. And so today, I'm going to show you uh, how, to do, uh, how, to, how to do the nuts and bolts of Cloud IoT Core uh, just using the Cloud SDK as opposed to using the, the console or the command line or some API calls that I've hacked together in some sort of sample app. So I'll just unlock my machine. And we'll switch to computer. All right, can everyone see that? Good? Bigger, smaller, good? OK. OK, awesome. All right, so if you remember, the entry point into Cloud IoT Core is Google Cloud PubSub. And so um, before, we can, before we can receive messages and transmit, and before we can transmit messages and then process those messages from PubSub, we have to create a Google Cloud PubSub topic. So I'm going to create a, a Google Cloud PubSub topic. I'm super nervous, so I type really bad. OK. I owe 201 is a top. OK, so I, I just typed in G Cloud Pub Sub Topics Create. I owe 2018 top for topic. And so now I do G Cloud Pub Sub Subscriptions. So the subscriptions uh, will, of course, my sub. And I forget the. Help. All right. So when you create the subscription, you have to associate that subscription with a topic. And then I have to add create. And if you see me struggling up here and know how to fix what I'm doing, don't hesitate to yell out something. All right. All right, here we go. Dash, dash, topic. All right, so now I have created a Google Cloud PubSub subscription that is associated with the, with the Google Cloud PubSub topic. So now whenever I publish messages into that topic, then they get queued up in the subscription. And I can pull those, those messages from the subscription. So now I'm going to create a Google Cloud IoT Core registry. And I'm not the best typer and talker. Um, and so associated with this registry is going to be an event notification configuration. And so what that just means is when messages are sent, telemetry messages, which could be something like sensor data from a device, when those messages come in, then this is, this is, where, this is the topic where those, where those notifications can go to. And so you can also set, you can also set this so that like, you can have event notifications going to other types of things. And we, in the future, may offer other, other ways of connecting with cloud. So now I've created a registry. And after, now that it's, now that, so the, the registry will contain devices that represent the identity of, of these, of your, of your smart devices or IoT, con internet connected devices. And uh, so now I'm ready to add a device. And so the device connects using an asynchronous, or an asynchronous uh, encrypted credential. So you encrypt, you, you give us your public key. And then you encrypt your data with your private key when you authorize, uh, and, it's, and you get a uh, JSON web token. And so um, what this is going to do is invoke a couple of, I, I can never type those OpenSSL commands correctly. So um, really what this, all this is doing is calling this OpenSSL command, which will generate a public private key, care, key pair with, um, with JWT compatible algorithms. And so now that I have my device keys, I can, um, I can register a new device. And I'm going to call it E2E because that's the device that I recommend using for the end-to-end -end example. And if you want to follow, if you want to follow on your own through a, uh, through a step by step example, uh, you can find this in the documentation at cloud.google.com forward slash IOT. And so when I create this, when I create this device, um, I'm going to have. I'm going to use the. I'm going to use the uh, the EC key that was created with OpenSSL, and then I give it the ES256 string representing the type because that is uh, just the the signing type that's um, that's correctly named for uh, for JWT. 
And after this comes back, then we're ready to connect to Google Cloud IoT Core. And so this is going to use, I'm just, for this example, I'm just going to use the HTTP example, which is the most basic uh, connected, way of connecting to Google Cloud IoT Core. So uh, this is just a Python sample. And so there's the, con there's the project ID that's the, 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 you know, the cloud resource associated that with the device registry and the, and the pub subtopic and so forth. And then the registry ID, which is the container for these devices, and the, the device ID and everything else that you saw me put in in the previous message. And now Docker is going to ask me to update. Okay, I'll do that later. <laughs> yeah. OK, so all right, so, when the, so here's the jot that is calculated from the device. And because it's a brand new device, you'll see that its configuration is empty. And it's also, a shish, yeah, that's nice. Nice stack trace. Um, but here's the, so here's the configuration for the device. And you can see that I've published, it, uh, published a couple of telemetry messages that, will, that are events um, representing something that this device is transmitting to the cloud. And so now if I use gcloud again, pub sub, and I can do subscriptions pull. All right, I'm going to forget the name again. Description is IO2018 sub. And when I do this, I should see the messages, I should see those telemetry messages that were transmitted by the virtual device um, to the cloud. And this is always the scary part. There it is. So sorry for my, sorry for how this looks kind of funky in here, but you can see the, um, you can see attributes, which is like metadata for the device that connected, the time that, and, and, the, um, and anything else that you want to push into your topic um, inside of this data field. All right, so if you've seen any of the talks before on Cloud IoT Core, you see me do this a lot of different ways. It's kind of boring. Um, but these devices are really, this, but this is it. You've seen, the entire, you've seen the entire capabilities of the cloud. Once those messages are in PubSub, then you can process those with all the cloud resources that Google provides. And so this could, be, this could mean processing image data and then returning labels or, or reacting to some sort of condition inside of that image. Or this could mean warehousing massive fan-in of data and then being able to do analytics in real time with it. And so that's fun. But um, we're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, and I want to show, show you this working on hardware. And so I have brought with me a, um, an Arduino device. And uh, this has sort of been a 20% project of mine. It's an experimental library. And for those who don't know, Arduino is a, a physical computing platform that's very popular in education and with makers. And it allows you to do things like blink lights, actuate door, or you know, actuate electro, uh, like electronic things, uh, which kind of harks back to what Gabe was speaking about with uh, modern electronics. So modern electronics can easily be controlled and actuated um, from the uh, from Arduino devices. And so I'm going to do something so that virtual devices are really good for things like load testing and estimating and like learning about, learning about the product. And then um, the, the, our experimental library with Arduino, which I cannot recommend that you go, with, go to production yet. Um, as, as it says on my GitHub account, uh, look out, it's my code. And it's also Alvaro's. So thank you, Alvaro, for all your contributions. And, and anyone who's interested in um, contributing to our Arduino project is welcome to. And so now I'm going to go from that virtual device, which is you know, something that you can, is useful for loading, to a physical real-world device um, that we can then use, for, that we can then use um, for prototyping and other things to get an idea about like, when, um, when you have your actual device uh, built on you know, one of, the, one of the, the, the more robust solutions that our partners off offer. But, so in order to work with Arduino, uh, you can just install the library using the library manager. And then um, after that library is installed, inside of the examples will appear Google Cloud IoT Core Jot. And inside of here, um, each of these there is, is a sketch an Arduino sketch is just a way of, like, you know, a way of specifying a source file. And then it's, the, and it's what is open inside of the IDE. And so inside of this sketch is this, is this header file, CITC config. And then inside of here are all of your, um, your configuration that we just did in the virtual device, except as specified with this physical device. And 
I'm just going to connect to a, a Wi-Fi. And is everything else? And this is the same configuration that I just that I just used from before. Did I sorry? Oh. This. Yes. That? Sorry. <laughs> oh, the project ID. Oh yes, yes. So the the project ID is um ah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. This could have saved you a lot of frustration in a minute. But yeah, so the project ID is the, yeah, the, the, the cloud resource that's associated with, your, uh, with all the, the things that you've created atop it. And then, there's, um, and then I'm going to do a transform on the private key, which I'm going to use as for creating the connection credential. And this is a, an open SSL command that I can never remember. But maybe for, yeah, there it is. OK. So uh, now I'm, I've taken that private key, and I've turned it into this string that looks a lot like this string. And then I'm just going to replace this string with that string. And very soon. Now, when I click the run, oh, thank you. We're doing a good job, guys. <laughs> okay. And I make sure I have the right board, the right port. Okay. And this is uh, we we recently I added this support for the Genuino boards. These are kind of like the Arduino style boards. They uh, they have a feel to them that's kind of that's kind of nice. Um, anyway, so now that I have, uh, now this, de this device has connected, let's see. Let me look at my logs here. Oh no. Something is wrong. That's going seven. Let's see. Oh, the private key is wrong. Oh, did I do the public one? Thank you. You're the best. And this should be EC. Let's try this again. Try it. Oh, I need to save the sketch. Sorry. Try this again. I'm missing. Sorry, say that again. Oh yeah, actually this no, this is uh, so Arduino strings do support this. So this is this is working as expected. Let's see here though. Sometimes the time server doesn't return the right time, and that can get me. Oops. And so if this, there we go. OK, so now it's working. Yeah, so this is an experimental library, everybody. And I'm, <laughs> yeah, so heed my advice. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that's why you don't, shouldn't use it in production yet. But maybe someday. Um, so now, so this, in this sample, like if the configuration message is set to something other than the value 1, um, only one light will be on on the board. And then if I set the configuration message to, one, so the configuration for this device is set to one instead of zero or hello, um, then that then two lights on the board should turn on. And let's see. We'll set it to one. And then everybody watch on that screen. It's the, the light that comes on is on the left side of the board, I think. And so we just updated the device configuration and then through my blazing fast internet connection. There it is. Yeah. All right. OK. And so this is nice. Um, devices are fun. And being able to prototype stuff with Arduino is fantastic, actually, because um, it's a you're able to do stuff really quickly. And you're able to, um, in just a short period of time and inexpensively, get to, uh, to have an understanding of um, whether or not something will actually work.
So the mic, oop, my mic is on. Do I need to get close to you? Can we use, can we use this mic? Oh, it's so attached. That's going to end poorly. <laughs> Do I just need to get really close to you, Gus? Here. It's going to be a great game of telephone. Okay. So three weeks ago. So three weeks ago, uh, Gus needed to do a demo. <laughs> needed to do a demo to this conference. Yeah. yeah. And I had nothing. He had nothing. So he went to the sound guy who's getting him a new battery pack. And uh, I had lights, actually. He had some lights. He had some projects he was working with with LEDs. And the, oh, we're back. Okay. Yeah. Let's hear it for the sound guy. All right. And so, yeah, I had lights. And, um, and I, thought, I thought you all would be much more excited if I showed you robots. And, uh, and so I had this toy. It's a toy like this. And I want to show you it under here. So it's this toy. And this little toy has, uh, remember Gabe was talking about digital systems, on and offs. Well, this toy has something, I, I saw this on this toy. It's got an infrared receiver. And, um, and it has this little remote associated with it, which I have smudged off any thing that will hint at what it actually is. But um, this, little, this, little, this little toy responds to a blinking light on here. And I just showed you a blinking light. So what if instead of that little light, these signals, these, con these configuration messages that are transmitted to the devices are then instead interpreted into the motion commands for this little toy. And I thought that was cool. And so I, tried, I, I started prototyping and, um, on the boards very similar to that other one I showed you. And I came up with this. My friend added some flair and some character to this little guy. And so what happens is when the device comes online, the, it should wiggle a little bit. And um, that way I will know it's connected to the Wi-Fi. So there's a little blinking light that indicates um, the various stages of the boot. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a Flask app. All right, there it is. So when it just nods, it nodded its little head there. Um, what was going on was um, it's, it's now connected to it's now connected to Wi-Fi. Oh. You do your thing. Okay. It's now connected to Wi-Fi, and this is not the device. And now I can go into my device registry here again, and I can send configuration messages and then control this. And what's, inter what's, what's interesting is that no longer is it something that's like a device that's locally here. This device could be anywhere. And it doesn't really, it's, and, like the, and there could be millions of these devices, and you can do things like coordinate across those devices. Um, anyway, so let's send a configuration message to the device that will cause the device to turn its head. And so when the device responds to the command, it should just, Nudge a little bit there. There it is. OK. And so you'll also notice that on the front of this device, I have added a, a sonar sensor. And that sonar sensor will pretty accurately measure distance up to about 30 meters away. And so let's just do, let's like, I wanted to do something that shows, like, you know, getting data from your devices, putting that data into the cloud, and then processing that data. So we uh, very similar to what we do in the code lab. And so I created that little Flask app. And then this little Flask app has this UI that only a developer could love. But when I click that button, it sends a configuration, a configuration message to this device. If I'm lucky, if it's not cached, let's see. And, um, and that configuration message will trigger this device to start moving in this sort of sonar pattern. And I mean, these are toys, so I mean, it's not going to turn exactly the same amount of degrees every time, but it's close enough that we can kind of get a general idea for the surroundings around this robot. And then on the blazing fast internet to my computer, it should render, oh, that's nice, OK. Still good, still good. All right. And so then we render, it's all right, you can clap. <laughs> uh, so then we render so, uh, a graph kind of of the surroundings of this device. And so um, 
adding, so adding the internet capabilities to this toy was as easy as adding, just adding a hat on top of it. And um, also, the, 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 because of, because of the, the low requirements for the hardware for, for Cloud IoT Core, um, I'm able to build these hats at a cost of you know, maybe just $5. And so you can, imagine that, you can imagine in your factory or in your store or in your office or wherever, the, like, where you, wherever you have these, uh, these modern electronic systems that you can communicate with with internet-connected devices, then you can add internet capabilities to those devices. And because they're, because they're so inexpensive, we actually no longer have to show my laptop. Um, the, it's actually possible to produce a large number of these devices in a relatively short period of time and then kind of have some fun with them. So um, after the, sometime after this conference, I'm going to try to open source this software. So if you all want to make your own little internet-connected toys and kind of get an idea for how these kinds of things work, you can check it out. And uh, for now, um, I'm going to do the thing that everyone wants me to do whenever I show them the robots, and that is make them move as a swarm army. Okay. And it's at, it's at times like this that I really appreciate how little data the Cloud IoT Core product sips, because I'm totally not using my phone for connecting these devices. Totally is. <laughs> yeah. All right. We should have a bunch of them online. There we go. OK. And it's just about time for them to march. Oops. All right. And we'll go back to. And thank you, Gabe, for wrangling all these robots. <laughs> all right, let's send some. Uh oh. Look out. Go, robots, go. It's the Wi-Fi. It's probably the Wi-Fi. But I mean. They're blinking really pretty, though. They are blinking really pretty. <laughs> I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> there they go. Yeah. So there it is. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We have a jumper. Uh-oh, uh-oh. All right. All right, they've already become sentient. This one's trying to break free. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I also wanted to do this just to make, <laughs> just to make Gabe have to dance around on stage. Um, all right, so let's go back to the slides, and we'll just wrap up. OK. So, uh, so, so going back to so going back to other uh, other approaches to uh, to adding smart and intelligent capabilities to your devices, um, we would be you know we, I want to again say you know like there's other ways of doing this than just complete delegation to the cloud. Um, you can use edge border routing to to use uh, to extend the capabilities of nearby devices to other devices. You can use on device smarts with things like Android things. So that if you have all the capabilities without the cloud. Um, or some capabilities shared with the cloud. Uh, Android Things is a really great way to do this. And um, also, there's a, we have stack, as, as Gabe mentioned at the very beginning, we have stack driver logging. And, um, and stack driver logging, for some people, can get them a lot of information about things like security audits and uh, other, like, and that combined with the metadata of devices may be enough for a lot of what people's IoT needs are. And because, uh, because we went a little bit over, <laughs> I'll try to wrap up quickly, and I'll let uh, Gabe close this out. So uh, we want to hear from you how you thought about the, the, this talk. So please go here and enter in our talk, the Cloud IoT Overview. Thank you for coming. Uh, if you want to, oh. thank you.
Hey there everybody, Todd Kerpelman here at the accessibility section of the Sandbox and I am joined by Patrick Clary who is a product manager here at Google. Hi Patrick. Hi, how's it going? It's going pretty well. So um, tell us what's going on here at the accessibility Sandbox. Yeah, so in the Sandbox we're doing various things. Um, we're showing demos of liftware, we're showing off some of our wheelchair accessible transit directions we have in Google Maps. We're showing off our automated captioning for YouTube. We're doing accessibility design reviews over here. And we're also showing a brand new product which we announced yesterday called Lookout. Oh, and, and what is Lookout? Tell me more about that. So Lookout is a product for users who are blind and low vision. And the goal is to help them become aware of physical objects and the space around them. For example, people that might be present, uh, text in their environment, and also physical objects or products. Can we, can we see a demo of Lookout? Uh, telling us what's in our environment? Yeah, let's, let's do that. So I have the app here, and I'll go ahead and select the icon. And then for this, I'll, expect, I'll select an experimental mode, because that's kind of fun, right? And we'll see what it shows. Drink with text and B18NOND. ISVO, I'm on. So it detected some text on that, and it read it out. As you can see, it said Murphy, which is the brand of wine we have here. Let me point it at this glass and see what it does. wine glass at 12 o'clock. So what else can you do with Lookout? Well, one interesting about Lookout is it's designed to basically be worn, so we can put it in a lanyard like this. And this allows the user to be hands-free and just engage in their activity. Um, and there's controls that facilitate this. So for example, if I want to start recognition, I can knock on the device. And then if I want to pause recognition, I can cover the camera. There we go. And uh, if, if I'm interested in trying Lookout, where would I be able to get it? Yeah, so we'll be right, rolling out to trusted testers uh, pretty soon here. And you can go to google.com slash accessibility uh, to sign up for a trusted tester spot. And then later this year, we'll be pushing it to the Play Store. All right, so uh, be on the lookout. Ha! See what I did there? Is it, look, is it, uh, be on the lookout for Lookout coming soon to a Play Store near you. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the tour. Yeah, my pleasure. Welcome to Google I.O.'s Main Street. I'm Timothy. I'm Sorina. I'm still Todd. <laughs> We're going to go have some fun. Fun! So how's your I.O. been? Amazing. What's been the favorite, your favorite thing you've seen so far? Uh, I think that the session on artificial intelligence and creativity. Flow JS, TensorFlow JS, and Node.js, which has been launched today. Awesome stuff. You're a JavaScript programmer, I take it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's correct. <laughs> I actually run and organ, uh, organize a uh, meetup in Bucharest, Bucharest JS. Awesome, that's yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. So that's super exciting for us. What about you? Uh, I think the Future of AI session this morning was uh, very interesting. What's been your favorite session so far? Hi everyone, I hope you've enjoyed the past three days and are ready for just one last talk before we all have to leave Google I.O. this year. My name is Kat, I'm a software engineer on the Firebase team. And I'm Kiana from Firebase Developer Relations. We as developers never have enough time and we're always looking for new tools to help us build faster. So today we're going to take apps that we have built on cross-platform frameworks and add Firebase to them to take them to the next level. So over the past couple of weeks, I've been building this app. I think it's pretty cool. It's a photo scavenger hunt where you have a different category each time, and it gives you a couple options. So for this one, up here on the screen, we have tech gadgets. So maybe we'll get an option between a phone and a laptop to take a picture of. 
And the neat thing about this is it was actually written on Flutter, which is a cross-platform framework that uses Dart, a modern reactive language, and then it compiles down to native interfaces so you can still get featured on either the iOS or Android app stores. And since I come from a web background, I've built the same app using React Native. React Native is another cross-platform framework, but instead of writing in Dart, I can use JavaScript, which I'm more comfortable with. There are a lot of different cross-platform apps. You might have heard cross-platform frameworks. You might have heard of Xamarin or Ionic. Today, we're focused on Flutter and React Native. All of these allow you to develop in one code base, but target multiple platforms. And we can choose the one which we're most familiar with the language and the tooling around it. So long as we don't need down to the metal performance, this can save us lots of time if we develop this way. So before we get too much further, let's check out a demo of the app we have built. So this is the Flutter app that Kiana has been building. We have this nice tutorial, which tells us we'll be taking pictures, and along the way, we'll get some trophies. Here is our progress screen. We can see the different levels we've already completed. And let's go ahead and check out the next level. Here, we'll need to upload a picture of a hat. Nice hat. And this goes to the server, verifies it's actually a hat, and tells our app that we can continue. And here we have won our first trophy. Awesome. So let's go back to our slides. So I think we built a pretty nice app, don't you? Yeah. But unfortunately, this is our user base right now, me, you, and a couple friends from our office. How can we make our user base look like this, with users from all over the world engaged and actively using it? Unfortunately, right now our user base is actually more looking like this. The people who we have gotten to use it don't have a great experience, and they're not even getting to the second level. So how do we increase our user engagement? We've tried adding some ads. I've done some sharing with friends. But what's next? This is where Firebase can help us. Firebase, like the frameworks we've been building in, is also cross-platform. So it's a good fit. Flutter and React Native allow us to build how our app looks and its functionality, effectively acting as our front end code, while Firebase provides tools and services that our apps can connect to, giving us the power we would normally get by running our own back end. To do this, we've used integrations that already exist. To integrate Firebase with Flutter, we're using the Flutter Fire plugin. And to integrate it with React Native, we use the React Native Firebase module. This allows us to add all of the features of Firebase, which can help us understand our users, discover issues, and tweak it so that our users will love our app. So let's go back to the issue that Kiana mentioned. We have lots of people giving up, not a whole lot of usage. People are leaving us bad reviews. It's not great. It turns out 50% of all issues that people leave bad reviews for are due to things like the app crashing or hanging, due to network issues, or heavy resource usage. These are all errors that we as developers can fix and should fix. When I see it in my own app locally, I can debug it easily. But even if I know these issues exist in the wild, sometimes it can be hard to find them because I can't reproduce them locally. Firebase allows us to add observability. Google Analytics for Firebase automatically gives us metrics such as revenue and week-over-week -week retention, which versions of our app are being used by people. But to gain specific insights, we can add custom analytics. And this allows us to track things like what levels are people reaching, which are the easiest options in our scavenger hunt. With performance monitoring, I'll be able to measure latency. Out the door, we get traces for things like app start and network requests. But we can add custom traces to get fine-grained measurements of latency. With Crashlytics, we'll get a report every single time a crash happens in the wild. And this is very useful for finding those issues that people aren't reporting to us. With native apps, we just drop it in, and we'll get the line of code that the crash happened on. With cross-platform apps, we'll have to capture the crashes ourselves, but then we can use the custom logging functionality of Crashlytics to log them to the servers. 
Now, analytics and performance monitoring are both available on Flutter and React Native, while Crashlytics is only available on React Native module right now. However, if you like what you see and you're using Flutter, all of these are open source repositories, so feel free to contribute. <laughs> to streamline our demo, we've already done a little bit of setup. We've created our project, Firehunt, and in our project, we've created apps for each of our iOS and Android versions for React Native and Android. React Native and Flutter. We've then dropped in the modules we'll want to use for Firebase. Here, we're using Firebase Core for analytics, performance for performance monitoring, and Crashlytics needs the Fabric and Crashlytics Cocoa Pods. For Android, we would be doing something similar, but using Gradle. And lastly, we've done a little more setup with Crashlytics, which you can read the documentation for here. OK, so setup all out of the way, let's jump to our actual demo. What do we get as soon as we've set this up? We'll get an overview with analytics for our apps. But it looks like none of our apps have very many users. The numbers aren't going to be so interesting. So let's go take a sneak peek at Bingo Blast, which is an app that's been out in the wild a little bit longer. Here's our analytics dashboard. And as you can see, we have our daily users in green, our weekly users in purple, and our monthly users in blue. And we can scroll down to get other metrics as well, such as how much revenue the app is making and what versions of the app people are using. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we can see where in the world people are using our app from. So in this case, a lot of people are playing Bingo Blast in the US, but also all around the world. We can also take a look at the Events tab. And this shows us the user events that are tracked in our app. We get a bunch of these for free, such as app installs or app removals and session starts. But this is also where we'll be able to add our, where we'll be able to see our custom analytics events, such as when people level up. If we check out our audiences, this is where we can segment our user base and target different Firebase features to different segments later on. Here we've grouped things by purchasers and even purchasers by locality. So we can have features which are targeted specifically to, say, people in Australia. All right, let's actually get a look at what adding a custom analytics event looks like in code. Here we're using React Native. We'll be doing something similar if we were doing this in Flutter. The first thing we'll need to do is import our Firebase module. And here we have the image picker screen. This is the screen which allows you to pick an image and receives the verification from the server. If we have the right image, it will call complete level. And if we have the wrong image, it will call wrong image. So we want to add a custom analytics event when someone completes the level. Let's go ahead and do that. Here, we've given the name of our analytics event to be level the number that this level is reached. And we're calling firebase.analytics.log event in order to actually log that to the server. So let's go ahead and run our app. Skip the tutorial since we know what we're doing. Let's look for a cookie. And we'll use this picture of a cookie that we took before. Submit to that to be verified. And it looks like our verification worked, and we want a trophy. Awesome. So now let's take a look in the console. We can see that these custom analytics events are coming through in the debug view. And this will give us a good idea of how our analytics will be coming in as we add them to our app. So here we can see we have a bunch of screen views, a bunch of clicks with user engagement. And finally, we can also see that level three has, in fact, been reached. All right, so while we're still in the console, let's take a look at what we get from performance monitoring out the gate. I've added no custom code. The only thing I did was add the CocoaPod to my iOS version or my Gradle dependency in my Android app. And here we can already see the sorts of traces we can get. 
I've got no major issues, but I do have a minor issue with App Start. It's taking almost 600 milliseconds. That's probably a slow enough start that unless I give someone a progress screen, it might turn them off from my app. We can also take a look at the network requests. And from this, we can see that all of our requests, our network requests, are in fact successful. But there's this one here which is taking two seconds. That's kind of slow. Let's dig into it. This is the endpoint that verifies our image. And it's probably slow because we have to upload a large image on occasion. It depends on whatever our user provides. So maybe an optimization we can make is making our image smaller or somehow speeding up our machine learning algorithm on the back end. That, however, is a problem for my back end self tomorrow or the day afterwards. OK, so what about Crashlytics? That was a good overview of performance monitoring. Let's go back to the code and see how we can add Crashlytics to pick up the crashes that are happening. If we go see our app and check out the Trophies tab, we'll see that there's a crash. This was reported to me by Kiana, thankfully, a couple hours ago. And we can use this to see how Crashlytics actually works. So again, we're in our trophy screen. The first thing we're going to do is import Firebase. And when we get an error, we'll use the global handler to capture it and log it to Crashlytics. Here, we'll grab the stack trace, log that, and record the error. So now if we run it, we'll be able to capture the crashes. Yep, and that's just not working. So let's go to the console and see what that actually produced. We can go into our first issue here. And our stack trace here looks like a whole bunch of native mumbo jumbo. Not very useful if what I'm actually developing is a React Native app. But we can take a look at the logs. And we can see that this was due to, actually, let's go to the previous stack trace. If you hit the arrow, yeah, that one will give us this nice stack trace, which tells us that in our trophy screen, we've typed in render trophs. Looks like a typo to me, so let's go ahead and fix that. All right, we'll just add two more letters, run our app again. And now we'll actually be able to see the trophies that we have rightfully earned. So now that we've fixed all of the issues in our app, what else can we do? So if we go back to the slides, the next step in what we want to do is try to start experimenting with our user base. By adding cloud messaging and remote config into our app, we can start experimenting with different engagement strategies, run tests with subsets of our users, and then we'll be able to see what's working using that analytics we just added. So the first step is with Firebase Cloud Messaging, which is the easiest way to add push notifications into your app. It works across iOS and Android, just like Flutter and React Native. And once it's set up, we can instantly send a push notification to all our users. Plus, if we add a little bit of extra code, we can actually take that notification, put it into our app, and then run some custom code to do an interaction based off of that. We can even target our messages based off things like locale and people's experience with our app. So how does it work? Well, we either have our Firebase console send a notification up to our server, or you can actually run your own API server that does things programmatically. Then once it's at our cloud messenger, it'll send a notification out to all our users who have registered notification tokens with Firebase. So let's switch back to the code and see how it works. So here we have our Flutter pubspec.yaml, and we're just going to start out by adding our Firebase messaging plugin. Cool. And then we run packages get, and it gets our new values. Then we're going to go ahead, and this is our main content screen, and we're just going to import our new package. And of course, it hit it, because Dart is pretty awesome. 
Then in our content state, we're going to just go ahead and create that variable and then initialize it. So in here, you can see that we request a notification permission. And this is mainly for iOS. It'll pop up a question to our users asking, hey, do you want to enable messaging? And it's just one of those required things that iOS makes you do. But you can also see that we get the token here. And if you save that to your database, you can actually target that specific user for a custom notification later. Then uh, we are going to add some extra configuration code. And this will allow us to handle the notification right in our app. The first two, on launch and on resume, are if our user hits the notification and we're not currently in the app. It'll send that data on to us, and then we'll do things like navigating to the right page. However, if we're already in the app, we want to alert the user of that notification, because the system's not going to handle it automatically. So we go ahead and show the alert, and then handle that code. So the final thing we want to do is go over to our Android manifest. And we're going to register a custom intent handler just so we make sure that Flutter sends that notification right to our app. Cool. Let's run that. And while it's set running, let's go ahead to our console. And we'll go down to our cloud messaging tab. And here we can create a new notification. Let's do something like check out our new levels. And we'll just give it a label and target our Android users for this one. And then we hit Send. And then back in our Android app. Do we want to add advanced options? Oh, yes. And then we have some extra notification stuff just to handle it inside of our app. So we're going to add some custom fields. Uh, the first is just some text for our in-app notification. And then the location we want to go, which is the progress screen. And then our special intent handler for Android. Cool. Now we'll go back and send the app. <laughs> and go over to our Android. And in the notification center there, we should have an app pop up. Yeah, it stopped running. Sorry. Let's just send that again. Let's just resend that notification. Sure, we can and do that. And the cool thing is you can actually just duplicate it and send it right again. Still looks good? Yeah. Cool. And let's go back to the app. I can see it right here on the podium. Cool. And we already clicked it, and it's at the progress screen. Nice. So. Let's switch back to the slides and talk about remote config real quick. So Firebase Remote Config allows us to try out different features inside of our app. It allows us to tweak our experiences for different users and different user groups and change the UI based on things like a new feature flag. How does it work? Well, you have a hard-coded option in your app right now, and it gives the same experience to everyone, but we want to change that. So with Firebase Remote Config, we stick in a new variable, and it fetches from the server the dynamic uh, value for that. And then it updates your UI accordingly. So let's try that out. So back in our pubspec.yaml, we're just going to add the Remote Config plugin. And again, packages.get. Uh, then in our content screen, we're going to import that package once again and create a new variable. And then we'll go ahead and initialize. So this time, we're going to do an asynchronous call. And then using the wait keyword, we're just going to wait for that response back to say, hey, yes, we have a remote config set up. And if we do, we'll go ahead and hit do a configure settings. And this will make sure that we set some default settings. In this case, we're in a debug mode, so we're going to leave the debug flag on. And then we're going to set some sensible defaults that we already have in our app. Next, we're going to fetch the new remote config from the server, and then update the app accordingly. And we call set state here, because that's how Dart knows to update the UI. Finally, we're going to replace the get config function just so our app knows to check remote config first before we use our defaults. 
Cool, let's run that. And if we go over to our find screen, we can see we currently have two options. But we want to change it to three or four and make it a little bit easier for our users. So let's go into the remote config dashboard. And we're going to add our first parameter here, which is going to be find number options. And we'll set it up to four. And then add the parameter. And finally, the last thing is hit publish to send it out to your users. Then in a couple seconds, it'll reach our app. And we'll just restart it to make sure it fetches those new variables. Since in this case, we only wanted to start on startup, because otherwise the experience would change while our users were using the app. And it just takes a moment to load here. While this is loading, let's go and add another thing in our remote config. Sure. So the cool thing is we can actually add parameters specifically for certain versions of our user base and of our app. So if we define a new condition, say, is iOS, then we apply if they're using our iOS app. And we create the condition. Then we can add a specific variable just for those iOS users, say only three, because our iOS users are going to have a little bit harder time finding those items. And then we publish the changes. And then if we go back to our app, let's see what that find screen looks like. Cool, and it got to four. Unfortunately, conference Wi-Fi took a little bit of time to get there, but it came through. And you'll notice it didn't switch to three because it knows this isn't that iOS app. And without any code changes, we were able to update that value dynamically. So those were all manual tasks. But let's switch back to the slide to learn about some automatic ones. So the smarts. Predictions, A-B testing, and A-B testing for cloud messaging all allow us to add some machine magic to automate those tasks we were just doing. By using Firebase predictions, we take Google's Cloud ML and actually integrate it right into our analytics data. It helps predict actions that our user base will take, like will they churn or will they spend money? Or we can even have it predict a custom analytics event, like are they ever going to reach the third level? Then with A-B testing, we can go ahead and automate our tests and interpret the results automatically. So we can run tests with just a sam sample of our users, or we can do it just with a certain audience or one of those prediction events. Then we can see if it made an impact on the metrics we care about, and then roll it out to a larger population if it works. So this is what it might look like. So Half of our user base might get, can you beat our latest challenge? And the other half get new levels just released. But it'll do that all for us, and we won't have to choose which does which. So let's go back and do a demo of this. Cool. So this is our predictions currently. And you'll see we have a pretty high churn number, because our app, again, wasn't very good before. Now that our bugs are fixed, hopefully that number will go up. But currently, it's at 37% are predicted to churn. But that's a high risk tolerance. At a high risk tolerance, we're really saying anyone who could possibly churn, we want to make sure to target them. But if we switch it to a lower risk tolerance, we can do like only the users that we're very sure are going to churn. And maybe we're going to try to ring them for all the money we can get. Or maybe we'll just help them do the app, use the app a little easier. We can also set up down here a level three reached, which is a custom analytics event that we then took and asked Google to predict. And it'll just take a couple days to go and do that prediction. Or we can even run an A-B test on these and target just the users who are predicted to churn. So next up, let's do an A-B test. So it takes a little while to load on conference Wi-Fi. But we'll create an experiment for notifications. And let's do something like giving everyone IO trophies. So we'll do a short message. 
and then we'll target our iOS users. And let's do like 100%. Because we want every one of our users to get this one, we just want to see which one does better. So we'll hit Next and add three variants. Uh, finish a level for the first, uh, limited edition trophy for the next, and then a special trophy for the third, and then next. And our goal here will be session start, because we want people to open up our app and start using it. And that's what we're going to try to optimize for. Then we hit Next and go ahead and see an overview of what our A-B test will look like. And then we start the experiment. Now, this will take a week or so to run, or two weeks if we did a, the experiment with remote config. But we actually started an experiment a week ago that we can show you guys. This one was with Android. And it looks like variant A won out. So that's pretty cool. And if we look down, we can see what variant A was. And we can see some of the stats on it. Uh, we can see the conversion rate was 22%, which is pretty good, and how many people actually did that event. So nice. Well, let's switch back to the slides. So what are some other ways I can use all these cool features we just started working with? That's a good question. One way is we can use predictions to find the users that will churn and give them booster packs, target them. Maybe they're having a hard time with the different levels. So we can use booster packs to help them through those harder levels. We can use this. We can use Firebase features if we want to redesign our app. We can use A-B testing, see if people actually enjoy the new redesign. And it will also tell us if people are experiencing more crashes with the new redesign, in which case, we'll just roll it back. But if we do like it, we can roll it all the way to 100%. We can also use Firebase when producing new content. So I'm sure a lot of you have had that experience where you just want your users to download a new app update so that they can get the new content. Well, we can roll the new content into existing app uploads, app updates, but hide it behind a remote config variable. Then on the day we want to launch the new content, we don't have to wait for people to update their app. We'll just flip our remote config flag and send a push notification to let everyone know that there's new content waiting for them. So we've taken our two apps, React Native and Flutter, and added Firebase features to them. This allows us to observe and analyze using Firebase analytics, crashlytics, and performance monitoring to see what our users are doing and discover issues before they reach everyone. We can make hypotheses as to how we can improve the experience with them using predictions to segment users that might be churning or spending more money. And we can run experiments on them using A-B testing, targeting remote config and messaging. We'll be able to analyze the changes we have made, what users like, and repeat the cycle all over again. Now that we've added Firebase, when people all across the world come to our app, they will have a smooth and enjoyable experience. Firebase can actually go beyond even this and help us develop our next features using products such as Firestore, which have real-time synchronous capabilities, allowing us to build things like team games so that people can work together to build scavenger, to finish scavenger hunts, or using cloud storage so that we can make sure uploads are successful even across spotty networks. But this is the last talk here at I.O. So I encourage you all to go to YouTube, check out the other talks that have happened here these past three days, and explore the deep dives on there as well. We want to hear from you. So please check out the website and leave us some feedback. Again, thank you for coming to our talk, and I hope you've enjoyed I.O. She goes sweet as honey do. You swear that you have seen her face like she's deja vu. She's the image of the fruit you cannot taste.
It's been a fun three days with all of you here at Shoreline Amphitheater for Google I.O. 2018. We've checked out a lot of really cool in-person experiences that you might have missed if you just tuned in for the session videos. If you want to experience all the fun again or for the first time and at your own speed, go to g.co slash io slash guide. To learn more about Google Developer Products, make sure to fill out a form at g.co slash dev slash form. I look forward to seeing you all next year on site and online for Google I.O. 2019. Until then, make good things together. I'm Timothy Jordan. From all of us here at Google, goodbye from I.O. 2018.